Well, hello and welcome to Hearth and Homes OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's compilation is Broadway Is My Beat. It ran on CBS from 1949 until 1954. Tonight's compilation features Larry Thor as Danny Clover. These episodes run from December of 1949 until January of 1950. The show is kind of a part crime procedural, part detective show, and had a bit of a gritty edge to it. All in all, the shows are well written, well acted, so we're in for an enjoyable evening. Now, just before we get into the show, do you want to take a minute and tell you about a couple ways you can help support the channel? First up, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club, starting at just a dollar a month. You can help keep these great shows coming. You've got three ways to join, coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. The links for those are in the description below. And many of you have asked about using PayPal. So if you prefer PayPal, the first option, coffee.com, is a great one for you. And the second way you can help support the channel and get a little something for yourself is to check out our hearth and home shop on Etsy. We've got a great assortment of old-time radio-related merchandise, including the yours truly Johnny Dollar collection. We've got the old-time radio detective mug series. And our newest collection, starting right now, is, is the Harold Apple Knocker collection. The link for the Etsy shop is in the description below. Head on over and check that out. But now, without any further ado, let's get on with our program. It's time to sit back, relax, as we travel back in time to 1940. 1940- in 1950 and enjoy Larry Thor in Broadway Is My Beat. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat. With Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, where the nighttime explodes into the canyon streets like some passion, screaming to be rid of the day. And the night is a backdrop for a million fragments. Neon and roar and melting shapes and shocks and the clots of crowd. It's a fury that sweeps you up and holds you close, then throws you in the gutter of your own choice. It's Broadway, my beat. At two o'clock in the a.m., Broadway is laughing itself to death. It's a time for doing either one of two things. You nod to the bartender for another one, or you buy the papers and go home. Me, I bought the papers, but I didn't go home. Back to headquarters and write out a report on a visiting convention delegate with a wayward buzzer. It had to be done. I owed it to the taxpayers, because the taxpayers had supplied me with a sergeant named Tartaglia. Them convention delegates never give up, do they, Danny? Nope, uh, never do. You know, I never forget what happened three years ago, the time I went to a convention. Uh, Tell me later. Answer the phone. Uh, Yeah, Danny. Sergeant Tartaglia speaking. What? Uh, Wait a minute. I can't understand you, lady. What? What is it? Uh, Some dame on the phone, laughing, crying all at once. I can't make out heads or tails. Well, let me have it. Yeah. Here. Danny Clover speaking. I'll be dead. I'll be dead. Who is this? Dead. Oh, hurry, please. Please, hurry, please. Pull yourself together. I can't understand what you're trying to say. All right, I'm trying. You see, I'm trying. Well, sure you are. Now, talk to me. Tori. Tori Jones, that's my name. Tori Jones, good. Talk slowly. Uh, Yes. Tell me where you live, Miss Jones. In the village. Greenwich Village, 1112 Bank Street. Please. Uh, Don't say it again, Miss Jones. I'll be right there. Let me in, Miss Jones. It's Danny Clover, the police. Police? Why would anyone call the police? Did someone call the police? You did, Miss Jones. What? What did you say? You phoned me and said you were in trouble, remember? Dad, I don't remember doing that. Get out of here! Get out of here! Easy, Miss Jones, easy. All you need to know is that I've come to help you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me, Miss Jones? Why do you do that? I didn't mean to be rough. I... I didn't mean that. I mean, why do you call me Miss Jones? Aren't you Tori Jones? No. No, I'm... I'm... In there. The beautiful Tori Jones. The girl most likely. She's in there. Behind that door. Who <laughs> want her now? <laughs> Her body hung from a tarnished light fixture with all its bulbs blazing down on her golden hair. 
And the thing that held her suspended and moved her like a puppet in a slow waltz-like circle was a scarlet sash of silk wound once, twice, three times about her throat. A draft from an open window somewhere ruffled her dress, and it was a dance you watched, a slow, dignified, stately dance to the rhythm beat of horror. And on her face was the terrifying smirk of the violent dead. She's in there, isn't she? I didn't make it up. I didn't dream it. Tell me she's in there, policeman. When did you find her like that? A minute, a year, a hundred years before you came. I just got home from a date, and he kissed me at the door. I went in and called to Tori. She didn't answer. And I went into the bedroom to see if she was asleep. She wasn't. She was like that. Like, like that, with that horrible smile. You live here, then? I'm her roommate. Tori's roommate. I'm the plain one, Beth Stafford, the plain one. Tori called me about 15 minutes before I got here. Was she with anyone? <laughs> Pull yourself together. Was she with anyone tonight? Can you tell me that? I don't know. Leave me alone. I don't know. I think she had a date. Tori always had dates. Every night of her life was a date. Where's she from? Who are her people? I never asked her. All we knew about each other is what happened to us in this room. The phone calls, the meals, the screaming you hold in. Where did she work? At Sterling Incorporated. She was a dress model there. Sterling Incorporated, huh? Okay. I want you to stay here, Beth. You won't go away. All right. I could send a doctor. Do you want me to do that? I'll be all right. Just get rid of... of that. And I'll be all right. Mr. Culver? Yes? Girls like Tori always end like that. Don't they? Don't they, Mr. Culver? <laughs> You can call it an advantage that a policeman has. He doesn't have to wake up from a nightmare and scream. He nuzzles the pillow and knows that the dream of a lovely girl hanging by silk from a light chandelier is only a projection of his workaday life. Yeah, it's quite an advantage. When he gets up the next morning, he gets dressed, has breakfast, and goes to work trying to find out who made him have a dream like that. And in the morning, the world of Sterling Incorporated, manufacturers of ladies' dresswear was simply sterling efficient. Long lines of cutting tables, sewing machines, and the faces that went with them. Faces that wouldn't get weary until another hour or so. The face of the office force goes with the company's product. It sees your badge, bites its lip, and announces you into the office of Lionel Conrad. He owns the joint. All of it, all of it, Mr. Clover. And just think, 20 years ago, I was peddling elastic bands on Broadway. Yeah, that's... Horatio the... Alger stuff, eh? That's what you were going to say, Horatio Alger. Still read the stuff. Finest literature a man can lay his hands on. Smoke? Cigar? Uh, no, I just... But want... you won't refuse a gumdrop now, will you? Yeah, have one. Been eating them since I first read that Ned, the fun-loving rover boy, all has nibbled it before a big game. Go ahead, have one. No, thanks. I... You wanted to see me about something, Mr. Clover? Yes. About Tory Jones. Tory Jones? Lovely name. Lovely model. Was. The girl was murdered. Read it in the morning papers. Uh, pardon me. Lionel Conrad speaking. Yes, yes, dear. Yes. Yes. But you know you have trouble getting into a size 42. All right, I'll bring it home with me. Goodbye, dear. My wife, Mr. Clover. We were talking about Tori Jones. I don't know anything about her, Mr. Clover, except she modeled our clothes. That's the extent of my information. Our designer sketches the dresses. We make them models like Tori model them. Well, I got my tip line. I'll see you later. A uh, second, Martin. I want you to no, meet... No, time for a salesman. I'm late now. Who was the rapid man? My shop manager, Martin Driscoll. Oh. Only he don't spend a lot of time in the shop. I gotta talk to him about that. It worries me. You got worries? Plenty. Somebody's stealing my designs, Mr. Clover. Somebody's stealing exclusives and peddling them to two-bit mass production dressmakers. Yeah? How could that be done? I wish I knew. Ira makes the sketches. I okay them. They turn up in basement stores at twelve ninety five. Her line. Who's this Ira that sketches? Ira Getz, my designer. Uh-huh. Where do I find him? In the village. That's where his studio is. You'll get the address from the girl at the desk. Uh, will there be anything else, Mr. Clover? Uh, nothing. Thanks a lot. For what? I don't know. Maybe a motive for murder? At the Greenwich Village studio of Ira Getz, a tired Venus in homespun linen, emerald toenail polish, and long chains of Indian silver that jingled, jangled, jingled, lifted a turquoise-studded hand, strangled a yawn, and in pure green burnt, told me Ira was having lunch at the Flamingo Cafeteria, only a pearl's throw away. 
She fell asleep while she was talking, so all I had left was the Flamingo Cafeteria. The Flamingo, 7th Avenue's haughty answer to the left bank. The delicate poets eating chopped herring like it was snails and wine. The girl athletes lobbing Freud and insults across their littered trays. And the fellow who's learning French off a phonograph record. You are looking for someone or something, mon ami? A man named Ira Getz. You know him? Do I know him, the gallant asked. <laughs> of course I know him. Who doesn't know Ira? He's working. Il travaille. Where is he? Over there, mon ami, at that table near the wall, surrounded by his usual coterie of sycophants. Oh, thanks. Il n'y a pas de quoi. Oh, I said it, Stephen, I said it. It's abysmal what Dolly is trying to do. Can you imagine acting like that about Picasso? Oh, that's great. Uh, pardon me, are you Ira Getz? Don't interrupt while I'm talking, eh? Hmm? Dolly, stunning craftsman, but by what right... I'm Danny Clover of the presume... police, Mr. Getz. Maybe you want to talk to me, hmm? Police? <laughs> Fair weather sycophants, sir, Mr. Getz. They needn't have left on my account. Maybe it's because we have nothing in common with the police. Nothing to talk about, hmm? Tori Jones, we could make conversation about her, couldn't we, if we tried? All I know about Tori is that I sketched her in things I created. This creating, it pays well? Well enough. What are you getting at? Your boss tells me your designs are being stolen. Does that bother you? As long as I get paid a living wage, nothing bothers me. Isn't that how it is all over? You could add to your income by selling your drawings twice to a competitor of Sterling Incorporated. Tory could have found out about it and you could have... Murdered her? I don't think so. No. Converse some more, Mr. Clover. Were you ever out with Tory? No. It can be checked, Mr. Clover, was it? Who passes in your drawings at Sterling? Lionel Conrad? No, Martin Driscoll does that. As a matter of fact, I gave him my spring collection only a little while ago. Oh? Where is he now? Mm, Philadelphia, probably. Business trip. Don't look so sad, Mr. Clover. He'll be back in time to dress for the opera tonight. Anything else? No. Tell your coterie to come back, Ira. They'll love it. Now you're a martyr. It became a matter of routine. I grabbed a loose detective named Mugovan and gave him a detailed description of Martin Driscoll, planted him at Penn Station, and had him check all the incoming trains from Philadelphia. Mugovan was conscientious. He called in every 40 minutes with no word. He got sadder all the time. But at 5.40, there was a lilt to his voice. Driscoll was back in New York. In fact, he was in his apartment, and Mugovan was waiting outside. In ten minutes, I was outside, too. Hi, Danny. Hi. Is he still upstairs, Mugovan? No, that's him getting in that cab over there. The guy in the top hat, white gloves and tails. Well, he's a little early for the opera. Mr. Driscoll? Mr. Driscoll? He didn't hear you, Danny. Maybe not. Thanks, Mugovan. Go home. I could have stopped him with my siren. I could have, but I didn't. If Mr. Driscoll were going to the opera, he was going too early. And he was going by way of the third act overture. His cab headed downtown and east toward Greenwich Village. So I followed. It swung into 8th Street. Me too. Then it stopped in front of the studio of one Ira Getz. I passed it, parked a half block further down, and waited. A two-minute wait. Enough time for Driscoll and Getz to have a long handshake. Then I entered the doorway of the apartment house. It was that two-minute wait that ruined everything. The shots came from Getz's apartment. When I got to the door, all I could hear was a lot of pain. I'm hurt. Yeah. Not too bad. Help me. Help me. What happened? I don't know. Ira and I were talking, and someone... See, through that open window. Somebody shot through. Yeah. Where's Ira, Getz? There, at the piano. There. Aren't you going to call an ambulance for me? For Ira? We need help. Not Ira. Not anymore. He's dead. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There's $55,000 waiting in Sing It Again's jackpot this week. The current Phantom's proving a real hard-to-get guy. And $30,000 in wonderful prizes awaits the CBS listener who can identify him. 
Be around listening hard when Sing It Again comes your way again tonight on most of these same CBS stations. Dan Seymour may call you. There's this about Broadway. It wants everything neat and in place. A word misspelled on a spectacular can stop traffic. A girl with a run in her nylons, likewise. The scream of the loudspeakers has to be adjusted, just so. And the deep, anguished weeping in a darkened doorway, not too much. Even death and violence have to meet Broadway standards. Broadway weighed the death by hanging of a golden girl named Tori Jones, balanced it against death by bullets of a designer named Ira Getz, found they measured up and gave it its seal of approval. Artist and model murdered. Grade double A. The wounding of a man named Martin Driscoll. That was okay, too. Broadway waited outside the emergency hospital to see how it came out. I waited inside for the same reason. You're a lucky, lucky man, Mr. Driscoll. It's only a flesh wound. A little more to the left, you'd be a dead duck, as we say in the profession. <laughs> Very amusing, doctor. Now, this may hurt. Just grit your teeth or something. <laughs> Brave fellow. Now we're almost at the finish line. A little washing, some bandages, a few kind words. All right, have I talked to Driscoll while you're doing all that, Dr. Sinsky? Oh, of course. Uh, it's all right with him. It's all right with me. Why did you go back to Getz instead of going to the opera, Mr. Driscoll? I should think you'd be more interested. Interested in who it was tried to murder me. Uh, spunk. That's what Mr. Driscoll has, Danny Spunk. Oh, he'll recover all right. He will. Uh, we all know you've been wounded, Mr. Driscoll, but answer the question anyway, huh? Why did you go back to Getz? Well... Uh, there was something about his drawings that needed correcting. You didn't have the drawings with you. No, but Getz would know what I was talking about. The mutual understanding of co-workers, Mr. Clover. Exactly what happened before the shots? I think I told you that. Tell me again. I rang Ira's bell. He came to the door. We talked about the drawings. I heard a shot, several shots. I had the sudden terrible pain in my side. And then you were standing over me. That's all that happened, Mr. Clover. Why should anyone want to murder you? A man makes enemies, Mr. Clover. Enemies he doesn't realize he's making. Some, I suppose, want to kill you. And Ira Getz. Why should someone want him dead? That I would hardly know, Mr. Clover. Yeah. A doctor? Uh, yeah, Danny? You'll take good care of Mr. Driscoll. Of course. How else would You'll I... you prescribe a good rest at home, wouldn't you, doctor? So a person would know where to find him? Wouldn't you prescribe that, doctor? <laughs> Confusing, huh, Tartaglia? It's a cookie. A what? What I'm holding under your nose, a cookie. Mrs. Tartaglia whipped them up on her mix master. A bag full. Have some, Danny. <laughs> Everybody offers big goodies. Oh, yeah, thanks, Tartaglia. Hmm. Real good. Uh, Danny, now that you have indulged yourself with Mrs. Tartaglia's confections, I myself have something to brighten up your otherwise drab day. You know, another cookie, Tartaglia? Just put the bag on the desk. Uh, yeah, Danny. Uh, it's about the gun. Well, tell me about the gun. The gun which did in one Ira Getz was found in the bed. Mm. Uh, the bed of frozen geraniums, Danny, which was on the ground beneath said Ira Getz studio. Mm, go ahead. The bullet, which also grazed the side of Martin Driscoll and was recovered from the woodwork, also was fired from said gun. Mm -hmm. Conclusion. The hand behind the gun that pulled the trigger that shot Ira Getz was also the hand behind the gun that pulled the trigger that nicked Martin Driscoll. Well, get off the dime, Tataglia. What about prints? No prints. Wiped clean. Okay, okay. Guns registry, tell me about them. Foreign mate. Probably a war souvenir. So? So, if it was war loot, it was registered, we'll trace it. Well, like we're trying to do now. Was that all? That's all, Danny. That's the news for me to you. Well, great, you did a fine job on my otherwise drab day. Give me a squad car to take him. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Can I have my cookies now? Well, didn't you hear me? Give me a squad car. <laughs> you drive slowly back to Greenwich Village. Slowly, because you want to think. But the images of violence dance in your brain and you can't think. You breathe a sharp December wind and it cuts a pain in your lungs and it brings you back. And you know that violence walks the streets of the city. And the shape of violence is weird and grotesque. Stolen designs. A man lying near a piano and the blood flowing out of him. A girl with a scarlet sash deep in the flesh of her throat. And finally you're there to talk to a hysterical girl... And you hope the hysteria is gone because someone, something has to make sense. It's good to have someone to talk to, Mr. Clover. I haven't talked to anyone since... since 
husband, Tori. How are you, Beth? Are you all right? Sure. Sure, I'm all right. I want to ask you some questions, Beth. Try to answer them as simply as you can. Don't I always, Mr. Clover? I even did the night... What questions? You knew Tori may be better than anyone else. That's the way I knew her, Mr. Clover. Who would want to kill her? I can tell you that. I wanted to kill her. Over and over. How many times I've wanted to do that. Over and over. Why, Beth? Look at me, Mr. Clover. Look at me. Isn't it plain? Isn't it... Go on, Beth. Let it spell out all of it. Everything I ever wanted, she had. It's like in the movies, isn't it? The princess and the ugly duckling. Clothes. Present men. Men who called for her, took her out, showed her a good time. What men, Beth? Oh, big men, important men. Like who? Like... I'm not going to keep it back any longer. I don't owe him anything. He never even looked at me. He called for Tori. I might as well have been the rug or the floor. He never even looked at me. Who, Beth? Why, Lionel Conrad, president of Sterling Incorporated. Even the night Tori was... He hardly spoke. Conrad took Tori out the night she was murdered? Yes, yes. It's all right if I tell you that, isn't it, Mr. Clover? I don't owe him anything now, do I? Where's your phone, Beth? Over there, under the doll. What'll they do to him, Mr. Clover? Sergeant Tartaglia speaking. Danny Tartaglia. Get Lionel Conrad. Bring him to my office, quick. Got that? Yeah, Danny. Lionel Conrad, your office, quick. Got it. I want to thank you for bringing me down here, Mr. Clover. You police work just as effectively as we dressmakers. And I want to thank you, Mr. Conrad. You know, this is my opportunity to see you detectives detect at first hand. Nick Carter stuff, huh? Got a shelf full of Nick Carter. Broadens the mind like, like Latin. I want to ask you some questions. Questions, eh? Fine, great. Just fire when you're ready. You're married, aren't you, Mr. Conrad? 22 years. How often did you ever date with a model named Tori Jones? Huh? Answer me. Look here. Answer me. What about Tori Jones? I refuse to answer. I know my rights. I've read enough books to know all about them. Me too. I'm going to book you for suspicion of murder. Mr. Clover, I... Mr. Clover. Yeah? I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Come here. Sit down. Sit down and talk to me. I said talk. Lionel, the fun-loving Conrad boy. Your playing around doesn't concern me. It's who it was with. Suffers. Shows. That's all we did, Tori and me. Go on. I love beautiful things. Tori... I wouldn't know. She wasn't beautiful when I saw her. Tori. Tori dead. Yeah. Who did it? Who did it, Mr. Clover? Did you? Beautiful. Once she kissed me. Why didn't you tell me about Tori before? I couldn't. Don't you see? Nobody likes to get mixed up in a murder, Mr. Conrad. Not even a murderer. My wife, my business. Yeah. No other way to say it, I guess. Your wife, your business. The whole thing. 22 years. A mess. I didn't kill her. Maybe. Sure, I, I can understand why you didn't come to us. As a human being, I can understand that. But I'm a cop. And right now, you're in a lot of trouble. Right now... Yeah, Tartaglia, what is it? Oh, news, Danny. What's on your mind? Come on. We traced the gun. To whom? To this guy right here. To Lionel Conrad. Book him. Well, let me tell you something. Book him for murder. Call the DA. Well, the and... gun was stolen. It was stolen from Get me. Get him out of here, Tartaglia. He's for the DA. Come on, you. But the gun was stolen. I didn't do it. I didn't. Why didn't you tell us about the gun? Because of what you're doing to me now, accusing me of murder. What are you trying to say? I knew it was my gun that killed Ira. The description of it was in the newspaper. Why shouldn't I have kept quiet about it? My fingerprints were on it. I haven't got a chance. Come on, mister. Let's go. Hold it, Tartaglia. What? Bundle Mr. Conrad up and put him in a cab. Send him home, Tartaglia, and charge it to the police department. Now, get out of my way. I made a fast exit past Tartaglia's open mouth. Conrad had confessed that his prints were on the gun. His confession saved him. The gun had been wiped clean. Wiped clean before the murder, because the killer didn't have time to do it after the murder. And that added up to my last call. When I got there, Detective Muggerbun was being part of the street scene. He was heaving snowballs at a snowman. I brought him inside the apartment house where it was warm. Danny, I've been watching him all day like you told me. He just came in a little while ago. Yeah. Open up, Driscoll. He's in, okay. I saw him come in a little while ago. Yeah. Come on, Driscoll, open up. Who is it? Danny Clover, I want to talk to you. You've already talked to me. Go away. Come on, open it up before I break it down. Should I? Wait a minute. What about it, Driscoll? You seem anxious, Mr. Clover. 
Is it about that murder? About exactly that. Just a second. Hey, watch it, Margaret. Yeah, he ain't playing. Me either. Driscoll. Maybe you got him, Danny. Let's go, Margaret. <laughs> He ain't... Hey, the wind is open over there. Yeah, the fire escape. There he goes up to the roof. Come and get me, Clover! Oh, careful, Nuggerman. Watch the snow. It's slippery. There he goes, Danny, near the chimney. I missed him. You can't get away, Driscoll. Come on out with your hands up. Cover me, Muggerman. Yeah. I'm coming after you, Driscoll. Come on! You coming, Driscoll? You coming? Well, Driscoll. Okay, Mr. Clover. Okay. Okay, Driscoll, now we'll talk. Talk away, Mr. Clover, talk away. It isn't finished between you and me. Not finished. Easy, Driscoll, easy. I want you to hear what I talk. Every word, every word. That's good, Driscoll. Let's keep it that way. I'll kill you yet, Phil. Like you killed Tory Jones, like you knocked her out and hung her by the throat. You're dribbling at the mouth, Mr. Clover. You waited for her, didn't you, Driscoll? You saw Conrad leave and you waited. And she saw you and called me. Then you walked in and murdered her. Why would I do that, Mr. Clover? Why? There has to be a motive in murder, doesn't there, Clover? I got that, too. You killed her because you knew. She knew you were stealing the designs and peddling them to Conrad's competitors. That was easy for you, wasn't it, Driscoll? The important man, the loyal employee, the manager. You left that a thing, Clover. Who tried to kill me? Who tried to murder me? The man who shot Ira Getz. That was you. I think you're insane, Clover. You asked someone in the office who I was, so you knew it was a policeman tailing you to Getz's apartment. So you killed Getz because he wanted in on your little larceny. And then you shot yourself and heaved the gun out the window. How do you know that? Because you wore gloves to go to the opera. Only you wore the gloves to hold a gun to kill a man. That's why there were no prints on the gun. None at all. The tricky one, huh, Danny? Yeah. Yeah, that's how it was, Mr. Clover. Exactly. Put the cuffs on him, Muggerman. I don't want to hold him anymore. He makes my hands dirty. Okay, Danny. <laughs> hey, let go of me, Driscoll. Let go. If you try to shoot me, officer, you'll kill your detective, too. Danny, he's right. I can't get out of him. Driscoll. All right. I'll let go. Catch me, Mr. Clover. Catch me. Let's get him, Muggerman. Driscoll, what? <laughs> Danny. Danny, he slipped right over the edge. Snow. Yeah, yeah. Let's get off the roof, huh, Muggerman? Night cold, Broadway is a wasteland. A wasteland that echoes with sounds you hear where there's only darkness, where there's no sun. People pass you and you touch. And you look down and there are fingers of dust on your shoulder. It's phantom, but it's real. It's Broadway. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Michael Ann Barrett, Virginia Gregg, Ed Begley, Elliot Reed, Jay Novello, and Jack Crucian. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
Broadway. It's a tinseled wilderness of steel and of stone, and the foliage of darkness is thick and unyielding. You make circles and pretend you're not lost. You make circles and walk and try to break through. Then you get the message. It can't be done. Because it's a cage, a big cage. The animal cries you heard were your own. It's Broadway, my beat. At 10 o'clock of a bright December morning, Broadway's music shops open their loudspeakers. And Broadway wears a scrub face, a new haircut, and a flashy smile arranged to look appealing and innocent. Because Broadway is on its way to con Santa Claus. Then you get a look at yourself in a mirror decked with holly. And you know you're doing the same thing. So you drop a coin in the pot. Thank you, Danny. It feels good inside. And then at 46th Street, you see Patrolman Meshikoff ad-libbing his way through a crowd. But he's got a tight hand on a little guy with gentle and tired blue eyes. All right, townspeople, all right. The party's over. So make way for me and Santa Claus, huh, townspeople? Me too, Patrolman Meshikoff. Oh, Danny, I didn't notice you in the round of my appointed duties. And your duties? This little guy here, you see him? I see him. Hello. Hello. This little guy, he's crazy, Danny. Lost his marbles, like my sugar. You know what I mean? I'm not crazy. I'm only doing what I have to do. You have to do this? You have to give away $10 bills in the middle of Broadway? This is not only a hindrance to the flow of traffic, it smacks also of holes in the head. You tell me about it, mister. I'll tell you, Danny, even if it breaks my heart. This sweet little character is a potential client for Bellevue. He tells me he's got 50 grand to give away. Let him tell me, huh, Meshikoff? Would you like a hot cup of coffee, mister? Pretty cold out here. I'd like it, thank you. How about the automat, okay? Oh, very nice. Let's go. <laughs> he's a very nice man, that patrolman Meshikoff. He has a kind heart. I tried to give him $10, but he wouldn't take it. Will you take it for him? All right. We'll, we'll put it in the policeman's fund. After you, mister. Thank you. Here, I got a couple of nickels. You want coffee or, or chocolate? Chocolate would be nice. Uh, you think I'm crazy, too? You look like a man who worked hard for all that money. Why are you giving it away? Uh, here's your chocolate. Oh, thank you. I give it away because it's my duty to share it with those who need it. Those people in the street, maybe they're just greedy. Oh, here's a place. We can stand at this counter. Sugar? Uh, thank you. Some people buy yachts with money. I buy little boats in people's hearts. Maybe they'll still be sailing when I'm no longer here to wave them on their way. Uh, you'll be here a long time, Mr... Uh, Henry Baker. No, I won't be here for long because I'm going to be murdered. What? My brother George, he'll murder me because he wants my $50,000. And I want to give it away before he kills me. Uh, what's your name? Well, Danny Clover. Look, I don't quite... Uh, you're a policeman, aren't you? Yes, I... Uh, then you'll protect me until I give all that money away. Uh, you'll do that, won't you, Mr. Clover? Yeah. Y yeah, I'll do that. Oh, you're very kind. The kindness is in your face, Mr. Clover. Well, look, Mr. Baker, you you've done enough for today. Why don't you go home and rest? If there's any trouble, call me right away. Just give your name and they'll put you through to me. I may call you at any time? Any time. All right. Now I'll go home. Thank you for the chocolate, Mr. Clover. It was very kind. Danny, there's uh, Mr. George Baker wants to see you. Oh, well, show him in. Okay, Danny. Thank you. Lieutenant Clover? Yes. What can I do for you? Sit down. Thank you. I just learned you had a little talk with my brother. So? So this. I've come to ask you not to have him put away. You you think he should be put away? Well, he's mad. Oh, I won't quibble with you. I just know that. Mr. Baker, I talked to your brother a long time. I think you can be proud of him. Proud? <laughs> Hardly that. Making a fortune and giving it to drifters. Well, that's his own affair, I suppose. But it's the other thing. Which is? His insane delusion that I want to murder him. Yet you don't want him committed to an institution. Why? Well, I'm sorry for him. He means no harm. I try to help him. How? Well, I arranged that he be taken care of by a doctor. Oh, well, I'm glad you did. What doctor? An expensive one, Dr. Michael Sinclair. Dr. Michael Sinclair. Sinclair. 
Let's see. Oh, pardon me, man. Yeah, surely. Danny Clover speaking. He tried again, Danny. He tried to kill me again. He did, Henry? When was this? Just now. Just this instant. He shot at me, but he didn't get me. Oh, I'm glad to hear it, Henry. Uh, you'll have to do something, Danny. Promise me you'll do something. I promise. Where are you? Uh, 2150 East 20th Street. I'll be right down. Your brother, Mr. Baker. Well, what did he want? You'll have to excuse me. i got to get down there. He says there's been another attempt on his life. <laughs> A gentle knock does it, Mac. Shall we try again? If you've got time to play, you've got nothing important to do here. Point yourself north, kid. Yeah. Now we stop rubbing noses, huh? Now we discuss our problem. You think so? I say we play some more. Copper. Huh? Blush to my shoes while I say it. I'm from the police. Oh, so I can't bang on you, huh? I gotta throw my hands back against the wall and drop my jaw and say, golly. I gotta do that because you're from the police. Do it. It'll make me feel important. Where are you from? From hair. Landlord. I had cards printed once that said Ben Croft, landlord. They got sticky on a hot day and melted, but I ain't changed. You want a crummy room? I want to see Henry Baker. Huh? I got a theory. You want to hear? I'll tell you. A cop puts in eight hours a day with the city ordinances and a gun and phony muscle. That gives him 16 hours left to be a grabber. That's why you want to see Baker. Grabber. You, an off-duty cop. Look, I'm working. I'm between card punching time. So when I say a question, you say an answer. What's your interest in Henry Baker? I like him. Answer. Like why? Because sometimes I talk to him, then I can stand to look in the mirror. Answer. Try this. Why didn't you want to let me in? Because people come here, try to get the little guy's dough from him. Because he's got a crazy idea someone's going to walk in and kill him. Because... Maybe he isn't kidding. Let's go. In here. Kill me. Who? Who was it? George, my brother. I saw him. He shot at me from the alley. Uh-huh. The shot came through the window, but there's no one out here now. He was waiting for me there outside in the alley. Then he took a shot at me. I see. You're sure it was your brother? I know my brother, don't I? Sure you do. What's this sticking out from under the bed? Uh, you mean my suitcase? No. Yeah. Yeah, your suitcase. Uh, Open it, Mr. Clover. Sure. Holy money. Almost $50,000, Mr. Clover. Have a $10 bill. Go ahead. Take some. You're my friend and I want to have some. I didn't tell Henry Baker that what I'd seen sticking out from under his bed was a gun that had just been fired. I didn't tell him that the window glass had fallen into the alley outside. And I didn't tell him that all that meant he had fired the shot himself from inside his room and through the window. He didn't even know his brother couldn't possibly have been there. I couldn't let him know I saw through his child's game of attempted murder. But I could take the gun away with me. And I could call on his doctor. Because a doctor is where you go when someone important to you is sick. Yes, what is it? I'd like to see Dr. Sinclair. Is he in? I'm Dr. Sinclair. Won't you come in? Dr. Michael Sinclair was the least medical-looking girl I ever saw. She wore a dress of some metallic cloth that shimmered in the afternoon light. And in her eyes was a kind of grave, mocking smile. And her mouth... Her mouth... The way you look at me, I wouldn't diagnose as neurotic. Not in the least. I'm sorry, it's only that... Uh... That what? I don't know. You're the doctor. It's that I'm a woman doctor, and women doctors are rare, wasn't that it? Rare? Yeah, that's it. And women have the vote, and give their seats to nice old gentlemen in subways, get their PhDs in psychology at Hunter College in the Bronx. You feel better now? I'm a policeman, doctor, Danny Clover. I want to talk to you about a patient of yours, Henry Baker. What about him? He tells me his brother is trying to kill him. Yes, that's what he told me. When did he first come to you? About two weeks ago. His brother sent him to me. What's your interest in Mr. Baker? Has he committed a crime? No. It's only that he's a friend. I want to help, if I can. Yes, he does have a lot of money, doesn't he, Mr. Clover? And he gives it away. It's good you're a woman. Don't be angry. I find greed universal. I have it myself. I just diagnosed you incorrectly, that's all. Or did I? You keep records of everything Baker tells you? Of everything everyone tells me. I record it on tape. 
New world, new methods. I find it more revealing and more accurate than taking notes. May I hear Baker's recording? Mr. Clover, what he says to me is in the nature of a confessional. I see no need to trespass on Mr. Baker's privacy. That's a law, isn't it? Is it? I'd like to hear the recording, please. I guess there's no harm done. I'll get it since you're a friend. So here it is. You'll find, Mr. Clover, that Henry's case is the usual one of sibling rivalry. More intense, perhaps. More outward going. More bizarre. How, how do you play this thing? <laughs> like this. Why should he keep imagining his brothers trying to kill him? That's my problem, Mr. Clover, and I... Shh, that's me. Everything, just as it comes to you. It began when I sold my truck farm and took all the money and savings and started to give it away. I said to him, George, why do you want to kill me? You want my money. That's why you want to kill me. It's all like that, Mr. Clover. A recurring aberration. You think it's only that, eh? There couldn't be any truth in it. Oh, I strongly doubt it. How often do you treat him? Every day. Uh, as a matter of fact, he should have been here an hour ago. What? I called his rooming house. He wasn't there. I called his brother. Not there. Do you have any idea where he might be? Yeah. Yeah, doctor, I do. Remember your face? Uh, here you are, sir. Will you help? Henry, me? Henry, come here. Oh, hello, Mr. Clover. Oh, you're angry at me for giving away money again, aren't you? No, no, I, I'm not angry, Henry. Uh, shall we have another cup of chocolate? Oh, that would be nice. All right, Henry. Oh, but I, I, I can't. I, I just remembered. I have an appointment with Doctor Sinclair. Uh, would you like to come along? All right, Henry. Oh, she's very pretty. Oh, Mr. Clover. Huh? What's the matter? Mr. Clover. Mr. Oh. His body slumped to the pavement and his face stared up at me. It was a face from which everything had fled. Terror, the waiting, the protest against pain, the slender knife between his ribs, the blood that nudged from the corner of his lips was the shape of his dying. Suddenly the crowd was aware that death had touched them. The confusion welled out from near the dead man. Eddie then broke itself into the fragments of people shopping for a happy Christmas. And with them, inside the sudden spasms of shock and motion and lost, was a person who had just killed a friend of mine. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Did you know it was Buster Keaton playing Sing It Again's phantom voice these last few weeks? Well, now there's a new phantom riding the airwaves on Sing It Again. For identifying him tonight, some CBS listener can win $50,000 in cash prizes, radio's largest jackpot. Phone calls go out from coast to coast. Be ready when Sing It Again comes your way over most of these same CBS stations later tonight. You've got to listen close on Broadway That's the only way you can tell if the sudden sound you just heard was laughter or anguish Not that it makes a lot of difference Broadway reacts to clowns and dead men in pretty nearly the same way and the dead man you saw lying in the blood of his death on a holiday pavement, you tell your family about. How the policeman pushed you back, but you saw anyhow. But you didn't tell how somebody came and swirled a mop over the sidewalk. Because somehow you knew that was his final recognition. The requiem for a man who had just died. But I saw it. I had to stay till the end. Until Henry Baker was shrouded and carried away. Until Henry Baker was made a matter of official concern. But I left. I had to go to a place. Yeah. Oh, it's you, the police fella. Yeah, Croft. Me. Then come on in out of the snow and cold and the dismal elements. 
See, I'm doing the right thing by you. Stick around, I got a bowing and scraping act that'll tug your heartstring to pieces. Henry Baker is dead. Did you hear what I said, Croft? I... I heard him say it once more. Baker, dead. See, it don't pay, it don't pay at all. Good little guy with a good idea, be nice, the world couldn't stomach him. Breaks you up, huh? Yeah, I, I don't show it good, do I? Because I don't know the words, how to talk about it. To a high school graduate like you, I ain't being crushed enough. How did he die? The world slipped a knife in his back, a real one. I don't want to repeat myself this time, Croft. Who would want to kill him? I don't know you for a lifetime, Croft, so I'd say you might. Yeah, you'd have to say that. That's so you can smile when you draw your pay. You're being a keen police fella. Yeah, this keen. How come you got a hat and muffler on? The temperature's fine in here. I've been out. Smell my breath, you'll see. Around Broadway in 46? Uh-uh, nowhere near there. Stick around, Croft. I'm going down to Baker's room. A matter of $50,000 in a suitcase. Where's the light switch? Oh. Better? Under the bed? No suitcase. Maybe he found another hiding place. Oh, not in my closet. Maybe in the bureau. Hey, who turned out the light? Oh. Somewhere I heard it, caught hold of it, and wouldn't let it go. Christmas bells banging an offbeat rhythm to a dream I never had before. I was in the middle of a room which was in the middle of a room which was in the middle of a room, and far away, far, far away was a little man with a blood-red $10 bill tucked in his coat lapel. Then he did a clever thing. He, he did a backflip. When he stood up, it wasn't him at all. Her name was... was it didn't make any difference... She was dressed in metallic cloth, and her mouth... Her mouth said I'd better get up. So I did. I looked for Ben Croft, and he wasn't there. So the thing for me to do was to get back to the office. So I did. There's a Dr. Michael Sinclair to see you, Danny. Huh? Well, show her in, Tartaglia. Okay. Uh, you can go in, uh, miss. Thank you, sir. Thank you for everything. Surprised to see me, Mr. Clover. Should I be? Yes. I'm a very busy doctor, and I know you're a busy, busy man, so I'll come right to the point. I want Henry Baker's money, all that was left of it. Oh? You're his widow? Henry never told me. Neither did you. Nothing quite so cheap as that, Mr. Clover. Henry promised me his money. Every visit to my office, he promised me. He said that when he died, he wanted me to have whatever money was left because I was good and kind and helped sick people. Henry said all that on a tape recording? No. No, that was our own secret. When a man says things like that to a girl, a girl doctor, Mr. Clover, she wouldn't record it as if it were a symptom of a wandering mind... Now, would she? I wouldn't know. And I wouldn't want to keep you from your appointed rounds, Doctor. So many people must be crying out for you. You're saying I don't get the money? I'm saying we haven't got it. I'm saying a girl with a bright, shining mind like yours can make her own way in the world without robbing the dead. I'm saying... Quite enough. And all of it insulting. Ain't it the truth? Thank you, Doctor. Happy neurosis, Doctor. I was glad when she went Anyhow, she ruined the decor of my office I made a note to splatter the place with wax roses Then have her in again Which constituted the mixed-up daydream for the day Right now, there was a man I had to see George Baker, loving brother and sole living heir of a murdered man I wondered how he reacted to the news At his home, I found out I have nothing to say to you, Mr. Clover. You don't understand about policemen, do you, Mr. Baker? When they intrude upon grief, they're intruders. I started to talk about you not understanding policemen. We got a right to make a nuisance of ourselves, Mr. Baker. The public demands it. What do you want to know? You 
thought your brother was mad, didn't you? I told you that. Of course Henry was mad. He gave away money. Money? What money? Money that was in a suitcase under his bed. Do you have the suitcase? But me? You have it. Uh-uh. I don't have it. Then find it. It's mine. I'm his only living relative. Take it easy. Take what easy? I want that money. It's mine. See what I mean, Mr. Baker? What? See what I mean? You want that money so badly, maybe you'd kill for it. Get out of here! You can't say that to the law without nudging me with your elbow and smiling. You know that, Mr. Baker. I'll post a suitable reward. Does that interest you, Mr. Clover? A reward? Wait a minute. I know men like you, Mr. Clover. You're greedy. You're holding out for a price. So I'll give it to you. I'll give you 20%. Baker? 25%! So help me, Baker. I'll... No, no, no. No, don't hit me. No, I wouldn't do that. I'll just throw you away. Ah! Dog! Pig! Filth! Scum! <laughs> You're back, Patrol and Meshikov picked up Kraft. They're in your office. Hey, Danny, Danny, what's the matter? Oh, Danny, I picked up Kraft here at the Eagle Tavern. He was spending money like a drunken sailor. Yeah, get out of here, Meshikov. Okay, Danny. You ran away, Kraft. Tell me, bitter, bitter men like you, you always run away? Sometimes. Things leave a bad taste in your mouth sometimes, like you. You do that to me. Now you know. You slugged me, beat me up. That makes you feel good, huh? It would have, but I didn't have the pleasure. Maybe I can arrange it sometime. Just you and me. A pleasure. First, tell me about the dough. The dough that flowed like wine. It was given to me, given to me by a little guy who had a healthier brain than all of us. That includes you and me. Baker gave you the money? How much? A hundred bucks. Ten crispy saw bucks. That makes a hundred bucks. That made you a big man on Second Avenue. Now you haven't got it right, Mr. Clover. Baker gave me the dough. He made me promise to toast his way to heaven when he died. This I was doing when your bull walked in and snuck it up. You could have followed Baker up to Broadway. You could have stood in the crowd and slipped a knife into him. Then you could have taken his dough and hidden it. Ah, you want to know something, Clover? I'll... Bear my soul to you. None of that what you said could I do. It's a weakness with me how I'm in love with good people. Yeah. Yeah. Baker sometime had callers in his room. Yeah? The callers. Who were they? You. Me. His brother. His brother. His doctor. His... His what? His doctor, a perfume doctor with the body of a girl and the legs of a girl. Like how often? Like practically every day. It was a thing a man could look forward to. Her with a little black case and a smile. It's a... Hey, policeman, where are you going? I ain't finished with my confession. Oh... Mr. Clover, what an exciting surprise. For both of us, Doctor. Professional visit or social? Perhaps we could combine them, you and I. But not out here. Inside, Doctor. You won't mind if the place is a mess. Not at all. You know, Doctor, I've, I have a problem. I miss my old friend. That's my laboratory. I allow no one in here. But, Doctor, how can I get well if you keep secrets from me? Yeah, what are all these little cardboard boxes? <sighs> the recordings of my patients. Hmm. Here's Henry Baker's. Mind if I listen to it on the recorder here? Maybe Henry said something on this tape I didn't hear before. You heard all that was important. Not everything, Doctor. Like how it was you who visited him and not vice versa like you told me. Practicing psychologists do that now? They visit the patient? Oh. I lied, didn't I? Uh-huh. Oh, closet full of test tubes and bottles. Very medical for an unmedical doctor. Are you always nosy like this? Call it an occupational disease. What do you think happened to Henry's money? As a psychologist, your guess might be better than a cop's. Don't go in there. Hmm, pretty bedroom. Planning a trip, doctor? No. That's good, because this suitcase, it's kind of shabby for a career girl like you. Leave it alone, Mr. Clover. And the initials, H.B. What do they stand for, doctor? Michael Sinclair in code? I have bad habits, doctor. I open other people's mail and suitcases marked with the initials of Henry Baker... Hmm. All these $10 bills. They could have made Henry so many friends. He gave it to me. He gave it to me because I cured his fixation. They cure it with murder now? Let's go, doctor. Grab a hat or something and let's go. That must be a patient, Mr. Clover. May I answer it? 
Yeah. I'll wait in your laboratory. Tell your patient you're busy. And doctor. Yes? Remember, nothing fancy. Just tell him to go away. I'm sorry, but... Don't be sorry about anything. Just you can't minute. come in here. Can't I? Can't I now? <laughs> See? I'm in all right. Now give me my brother's money. I don't have it. Give it to me. Give it to me or I'll beat you up just as I did that policeman. He wanted that money for himself like you do. Give it to me. <laughs> it's in there. In that room, my laboratory. Good, good. Very well, good. I sold my truck farm and took all the money and saved What's that? start to give it away. I said to him, George, why do you want to kill me? It's Henry. He He's alive. Money. But I killed him. I killed him. Me. I'll kill him again. Everything I'll kill him over and over again. <laughs> I'll kill him. Baker, Baker. I'll my kill you, Henry. Henry. I'll kill you, Henry. It makes me feel good to give it away to people. I'll kill you, Baker. I'll kill you. I need friends. That way, when you leave this world, you'll be remembered. What more could be a man ask? You should see their faces when I give it to them. Don't look like that, Danny. Happy. They look you so had to kill him. Happy. There was nothing else you could do. Somebody that's important. Yeah. It's just... Okay, doctor. Get your hat. So it was over, done. A little man had given away pieces of his heart in kindness until it was shattered finally by violence. And his murderer, his brother. Two bullets had fixed the mask of greed on his face. Michael Sinclair? She had the money all the time. She cried when we took it away from her. But it didn't do her any good. Not a bit of good. Broadway is sleeping now, and the furious avenue of the night is still. It stretches out in front of you without beginning, without end. Only the sleepwalkers are there, the handful whose lust for a dream or reality is never through, the seekers, the sodden, the huggers close of nothing. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Jerry Hausner, Rolf Sedan, Byron Kane, Lou Merrill, and Joan Banks. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway. On Christmas Eve, Broadway's natives dance their Christmas dance to the music of carols flowing out of tinseled loudspeakers. The kids mash their noses against plate glass, lick it, and watch the mechanical clown, the mechanized tour army, the tin man dancing a jig on a tin box. And their eyes are dark with desire and hunger. They make a wish on a neon star. That's how it is on Christmas Eve on Broadway. My beat. On the morning of the day before Christmas, creatures are stirring at police headquarters. There's the patter of tired feet and the sound of manly giggles as little gifts are hidden in desk drawers or poured into Dixie cups or slipped under the police blotter. And in my office, there's a kid I knew, name of Marty Wednick. Danny, I don't like to disturb you at this unmentionable hour. At Ten o'clock in the morning, unmentionable? You kidding? Sleep has not yet fled from my starry eyes. What makes me bounce my pillow at an hour which is for the squares is a problem. What's your problem, Marty? 
Am I or am I not the child president of your branch of the Police Athletic League? You are. So I promised my constituency of fellow former delinquents a Sandy Claus for Christmas. That's the problem. When are you going to give with a Sandy Claus? <laughs> Don't laugh, Danny. A former delinquent shouldn't be disillusioned. Could make him a neurotic. So I repeat, on behalf of my constituents, where is Sandy Claus? <laughs> oh, he'll be here in a minute, Marty. Sergeant Tartaglia... Oh, here he is. Come on in, Sergeant. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what This fun. guy's a sergeant? Huh? Hey, Tartaglia, this is uh, Marty Wednick. He wants Santa Claus. Oh, he's coming, Danny. He's coming. Come on in, Sandy. Everybody, make way, everybody, oh, for Sandy Claus. Oh, ha, ha, ha. And what's your alias little, uh, uh, name, little boy? Ho, ho, ha. Hey. This guy's a Sandy Claus. Who's the kid? The punk, Danny. Who is he? Marty Wednick, that's who I am. So you're Santa Claus, huh? <laughs> Audition me something. What? Why, you crummy Take little... Take your hands off me, Santa Claus. Is this the Christmas spirit? I'll give it to you in the mouth, fresh kid. You and how many wait, reindeer? Wait a minute, wait a minute, you two. Marty, this is Nick Norman. Nick Norman, the ex-con? How do you like this monster? For 15 years, I've been playing Sandy Claus at Sing Sing with no complaints, mind you. The first day I am a free civilian playing me old part, the squirt gives me the hook. I resign from Sandy Claus. I didn't get treatment like this even from the guards. Well, take it easy, Nick. Marty didn't mean it, did you, Marty? How was I to know that Sandy Claus here was the world-famous light-fingered safecracker? Ex-light-fingered, world-famous safecracker, you. Well, does he meet with your approval, Marty? Well, the costume is sloppy, the beard's moth-eaten, but yeah, he'll do. Don't do me no favors, punk. You want to know something, Nick? What something? I like you. I think you are the best Sandy Claus it has ever been my privilege to present to my constituents of the PAL. This is from the heart, Nick. Oh, that's better. You gotta show respect for Sandy Claus. What time's your party? Eight o'clock tonight. You'll be there? I'll be there. Well, so long, Danny. Sergeant, <laughs> Sandy Claus. See you at the party. Merry Christmas. That's a good kid. Appreciates the finer things. Feels good to be out, huh, Nick? Fifteen years is a long night without sleep, Danny. Yeah, feels good. And thanks for the job of Sandy Claus. I would miss it after all these years. The deal we made. That feels good, too, huh? The de oh, yeah, yeah, the deal. Sure, Danny. I'll keep my promise to you. That's good. You won't forget what happened 15 years ago on Christmas Eve. Well, can I forget? It was like today. I was all dressed up like Sandy Claus. I had a few idle hours, and right in front of me, there just happened to be an idle safe. So I cracked it. So, so I got caught. Uh-huh. And what are you going to do now, between now and 8 o'clock, the time the party starts? Walk the thoroughfares and wish everybody joyous tidings and pat kids on the head. And, and leave their mother's purses alone. Oh, Danny, how can you talk to Sandy Claus that way? I promised you oh, that... I'm sure you did. Hey, Tataglia. Uh, yeah, Danny. Tag along with Santa Claus. Fresh air will do you both good. Oh, gee, thanks, Danny, thanks. You know, the fresh air will do us both good. Yeah, but hold his hand, Tataglia, so he won't get lost. We don't want him to get lost, do we? Oh, no, Danny. No, because what's Christmas without Santa Claus? Have fun, boys. So everybody was happy, and that was good, because it was the season for it. Sergeant Tartaglia was happy because I had not only given him permission to leave the room, I told him to go out and take a walk with Santa Claus. And everyone knows that Santa Claus is always happy, even if once upon a time he had to spread his glad tidings around Sing Sing. I considered it a while, and then I decided to inhale the bloom of Christmas as it filtered through police headquarters. And it made me feel happy, too. It lasted for two inhales. Sign on the door says Lieutenant Danny Clover. I don't believe in signs. What's your name? Uh-uh. What's yours? I came prepared for a question like that. Here's my card. Uh, thanks. Simon Larrabee. Real estate and rentals. You renting something, Mr. Larrabee? Ah, that would give you the upper hand. Two questions to my one. And you haven't answered it yet. Danny Clover, like the sign says. That's my name. You're quite right. I am renting something. Go ahead. Rent away. I like to watch. I'm doing it now. Just looking at you. I'm renting that property known as the warehouse at 2290 East Grand Street. Well, if it makes you happy... Wait a minute. That's our clubhouse. That's where the kids are having our Christmas party. Are you? <laughs> What's the... <laughs> what else can it be? Where's the rent? Rent for what? Rent for that property known as the warehouse at 2290 East Grand Street. You mean it hasn't been paid? 
much is it? It's 62 a month. Oh, that includes utilities. I'll pay it. The club's treasurer will reimburse me. You don't understand, Mr. Clover. When I rent something, I get a year's rent in advance. That comes to $750. And I want it before there's any party there. Are you kidding? Why are those kids going to get money like that? <laughs> well, I'll give you until 8 o'clock to get the money, and I'll just sit right here until then. All right. Grab yourself a police gazette. Never touch the stuff. Suit yourself. Oh, excuse me, Simon. Danny Clover speaking. Danny! Yeah, what is it? I can hardly hear you, Curcio. Yeah, yeah, well, no wonder. Listen what I gotta talk through. Listen, Danny. Hey, you see what I mean? Why the sirens? What's the trouble? Sergeant Tartaglia is up a tree. What? Sergeant Tartaglia is in a tree on the Avenue 8 playground, Danny. He flipped his lid. He's telling anyone that'll listen that there ain't no Santa Claus. Hey, you better come on down, Danny. <laughs> When I got down to the Avenue A playground, it was having the Christmas party of its life. A 30-foot tree complete with tinsel, candy canes, colored popcorn balls, firemen, and a scared sergeant policeman, forlorn and lost, pinned to its top branch. The fire department finally convinced Artaglia that a ladder was a safe invention for getting down out of tall trees. At the bottom rung, he almost believed it. When his feet touched the ground, they gave him a blanket because he was suffering from shock. He was about to tell the newsreel boys his ordeal when I faced him. Oh, Danny, Danny, I, I was about to tell the newsreel boys my ordeal. Well, just tell me first, Attaglia, because I hardly ever get to the movies. I, I, I'll be with you in just a minute, sir. Oh, Danny, it was awful. It was something awful. I only ask this because there's so much about you I don't know, Tartaglia. Why do you climb trees? Oh, I don't, Danny. The height scares me. When I was a child, a tree threw me on the ground. Still, you climb this tree. Why? Well, because I'm a policeman. That makes sense. But how? Well, sure it does, Danny. The kids see me. I am a policeman. They need to put a star on top of their Christmas tree. They ask me because I am a policeman and can do such things. I couldn't let the department down, Danny. So, so you leave Nick Norman alone all by himself because you don't want to let the department down. Oh, I knew you would say that. But I trusted Nick because he is Santa Claus. He told me I could trust him. Sure you can, Tartaglia. But what happened to Santa Claus? He's not around. That's right. There ain't no Santa Claus, like I've been saying. They told me you were saying that. What happened to him, Tartaglia? Well, Danny, whilst I was up in the tree pinning the star, below me I saw a big black bulletproof sedan. What kind? A big black bulletproof sedan. Now I know. Then what happened? Well, this big black bulletproof sedan stopped by Nick, our Santa Claus. Two men got out, talked to him for a minute then took them one by each arm, deposited them in the car, closed the door, and away they sped careening on two wheels. I yelled to them to stop, Danny. Eh, but I guess they didn't hear me on account of the hustle and bustle. Uh, our Santa Claus, to take you. Where is he? Where'd he go? Well, if I was Santa Claus, I know where I'd go. Not that it matters, but where? Well, to my mother. On Christmas Eve, she deserves something like that. I'm sure she does. Well, we have you now, Sergeant Tartaglia. I'll make good in the newsreels, Tartaglia. This may be your big chance. Yeah? Are you Mrs. Norman? Why? I'm Danny Clover. Yeah? May I come in, Mrs. Norman? Why? I want to talk to you. About what? About Nick, about your son. Come in. Thanks. In here, in the parlor. Sit down. Thank you. No, not on that seat, that one. What do you want to talk about, about Nick? Do you know where he is? Oh, you don't tell me no more. One day when he was nine years old, Nick said to me, he said, Ma, don't ask me where I've been no more, cause I'll lie to you. That's what he said. Then you don't know where he is. Don't make me go through that again, Sonny. Say, who are you to ask me questions? I told you I was... Yeah, yeah, you did. You said you was Danny Clover. That don't mean nothing to me. Oh, you must be the guy come about, uh... Aha, uh -huh, I am. That's why I came. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, you tell me what you come here for. For, you know, just as you said. Oh, this I like. This lets me play cagey like in the old days. What are you talking about? You know your son, Nick. You 
got to squirm more than that, kiddo. What about Nick? We want him to be our Santa Claus. Bingo. That's good. Oh, it must be a good feeling, a young man like you. Big, strong, looking for Santa Claus, me. I just sat here in my rocking chair. Mrs. Norman. Thinking about the times we had, me and Big Ed, my husband. The time... I have to go now, Mrs. Norman. Where's your son? Oh, you made me go through it again. One day, when he was nine years old, Nick said to me... Uh, yeah, oh, thanks, Mrs. Norman. Ma, don't ask me where I've been. Hi, Danny. Uh, did you find Santa Claus? No, uh-uh, Tartaglia. What are you doing about it? Me? Nothing. That's good. Anyone to see me? Uh, yeah, in your office. Uh, hey, Danny, Danny, well, what are you angry at me for, huh, Danny? Hey, Danny, what's this I hear about Santa Claus taking a powder? Uh, you'll get your Santa Claus, Marty. You still here, Simon Larrabee? Yes, 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 I'm waiting. Just as I told you, I'm waiting for my 750 rent. Can you imagine this kind of Danny? On Christmas Eve, he wants his rent. This is a Christmas, no Santa Claus, no party. What am I going to tell my constituents? It'll work out, Marty. We'll get the money someplace. By 8 o'clock, Mr. Oh, Hobbit. shut up, Simon. But Danny, no Santa Claus. Hold it. Hold it, everybody. I got the solution. Communications. This is Sergeant Tartagli in Danny Clover's office. An all-points bulletin. Pick-up man. Description as follows. Height, 5 feet 11. Weight, 235. When last seen, was wearing a red suit, a red hat with bells and black boots. Identifying marks. Has a long, snow-white beard. What's his name? Santa Claus! You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. $51,000 in cash and wonderful prizes. Danny Seymour might play Santa Claus to you tonight, and he might fill up your stockings with that fifty-one grand if you can identify the phantom voice. Listen in just a little later tonight to Sing It Again. Broadway brings you Christmas in a lot of ways. You get dribbled around by the opposing teams of last-minute shoppers. You ride backwards on up escalators so you can be in a good position for the down escalators. You get mauled and shoved and picked over. And finally, you get gift-wrapped and sent on your way. My way was out to lunch and back to police headquarters, holding my Christmas stocking in my hand. I had two things, no rent and no Santa Claus. Two nothings which made for an empty holiday. Sergeant Tataglia wasn't enjoying himself either, and he expressed himself with sentiment. Ah, humbug. What did you say, Tataglia? Bah, humbug, Danny. Uh, that's a Christmas expression I picked up to be used when you wished it was the 4th of July instead. Yeah, me too. Uh, you uh, seen the afternoon papers, Danny? Yeah, take a look at it. Uh, you look at it for me. What does it say? Well, first it has got a picture on the front page of a tree. In the tree is me. Mm -hmm. Then it says under it, it says, Officer Gino Tataglia... Yeah, hey, Danny, they spelled it right. Well, Officer Tartagula spent the afternoon cavorting in a tree to the delight and applause of all the little... Well, it runs on like that. Oh, forget it. It wasn't your fault. Then that's what I tried to tell Mrs. Tartaglia. Doesn't she believe you? Danny, she called me on the phone. I said, hello? She said, signal Tarzan. Then she started laughing, hysterical. I can't get her to talk. Every time I pick up my phone, all I hear is Mrs. Tartaglia laughing. <sighs> I got my problems, too. Yeah, this is probably the first time in the history of Santa Claus that he's ever heisted from his appointed rounds. Maybe. Hey, did you get in touch with Nick's mother again, like I told you? Oh, Danny, she ain't nowhere to be found. The old day must have skipped. And the 200 Santa Clauses that the boys investigated, not one of these is Nick Norman under the beard. Oh, I'll get it, Danny. Thanks. Sergeant Tartagli. Huh? Yeah, he's here. It's for you, Danny. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. Danny? You know, Maxine Riddell. Yeah, how are you, Maxie? I'm in lingerie, Danny. Come on down. What? In the lingerie department at Fletcher's department store. Working. I got news for you. News about Nick Norman. You interested, Danny? Yeah, yeah, I am. Hold on to everything, Maxie. I'll be right down. 
to that girl over there. She'll gift wrap it up. Hi, Danny. How am I doing? Great, Maxie. Only great. How long have you been working here? Only for the Christmas season, Danny. But the way I've been operating, I think maybe they'll keep me on. No, no questions about your background? You mean about me being a shoplifter? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's the reason I got the job. The way I was lifting things, I told them it'd be cheaper for them if they put me on the sales force. So they did. So for 22 bucks a week, I'm an honest mouse. Anyway, it's steady. Keep it that way, huh, Maxie? Anything you say, Danny. Well, now that we've had our tea, I guess you want to know about Nick. Yeah. Breaks my heart to be a stoolie. You know how it is, Danny. Me with my former alliances. But it's different now. Yeah, different. I want it to be different for Tussie, too. You remember how it was between me and Tussie? How was it? It was gorgeous. That's why I'm being a pigeon, Danny. If Nick made up his mind to be a kosher citizen, he should stick to it. Not fall back into the arms of a mob like a doll who says mama. Which mob, Maxie? Tussie Cons. Such a name for a gorilla. Tussie. How do you figure a name like that? I don't know him. Where do I find him? Tussie just got back from Chicago. He bought the Domino Club. I happened to be passing there on my lunch hour, and I saw Nick in a Santa Claus suit drinking grape juice with Tussie. Oh, excuse me, Danny, a customer. Yes, madam. Something for yourself. Thanks, Maxie. For what? We have some gorgeous outside girdles, madam, for everyday wear. They're right over here. The Domino Club in the West 50s is a bright and shiny joint plastered with black glass. It stands close to the ground between two peeling brown stones. When you walk into it, you have the feeling you're walking into the mouth of a beetle. Its walls are lined with black mirrors, and its ceiling is draped with folds of scarlet silk. And at six o'clock of a Christmas Eve, the boys, complete with Christmas-wrapped girls, are beginning to gather. You ask a busboy in white tie and tails, where is Tussie Carnes? And he lifts an eyebrow to a guy standing near the bandstand. A guy grinning like an alley cat, while a girl pins a sprig of mistletoe to his lapel. You wait till she kisses Tussie, and Tussie kisses her. But his eyes are open and flicking around the joint, so he sees you and pushes the girl away. Beat it, Blitz, and I got company. Merry Christmas, stranger. You want something from Tussie Boy? Same to you. And I want Nick Norman. Oh, that's a big desire on a holiday. Why you want Nick? Uh, tell Tussie Boy. Maybe I gotta explain. I'm Danny Clover, a cop. I want him. Don't everybody? Come with me, Sonny. Santa's right down at the end of this hallway. Merry Christmas, Melvin. Ain't it, though, Tussie? Merry Christmas, George. Likewise, I'm sure. I brought you a present, boys. Goody. Likewise. Where's Nick Norman? This fella here, he says to Tussie boy, he wants Nick Norman, our Santa Claus. Uh Uh-oh. What big eyes you have, mister. And you know something else that's plain precious, boys? No. Do tell us, Tussie. The fella says he is a cop. Isn't that cute, huh? I could die. Yeah. So show the fella Santa Claus, huh, fellas? Merry Christmas, Danny Clover. Oh, Tussie boy said that, didn't he? Stay away from me. But first we want to wish you on a star. Like that. Are you too crazy? Stay away from me. I think that was not enough stars. I'll give him another package. You know that Tussie is good to us. He gave us the best Christmas present two fellas could ever have. Uh, don't be greedy, Melvin. Leave some for me. <laughs> oh, look at that. It's all gone. <laughs> Come on, Danny, open your eyes. What? Yeah, open your eyes, Danny. It's getting late. Ain't you heard? Christmas is coming. Hey, it's you, Nick Norman. Oh, Danny, call me Sandy Claus. That's the nicest alias I got. Now, look, Nick, I'm going to... Oh, here, I'll help you up, Danny. Uh, Sit on the edge of the sofa there. Yeah. Sandy Claus, Danny. Santa Claus, huh? So help me, Nick, where I'm going to put you. You'll spend the next 94 Christmases in solitary. Take it easy, Danny. 
Come on, let's get out of here. I'll be late for that kid's party. Come on. You mean let's get out of here just like that? I don't have to beat my way out of here? What for? What's all this about, Nick? Uh, Santa Claus? You're adult today, Danny. What's the matter with you? But you were kidnapped. Kidnapped? Me? I would want to do a thing like that to jolly old me. A man in a tree said two guys pushed you into a car. He only had a bird's eye view, but he said kidnapped. You- Oh, you mean Melvin and George. <laughs> I mean Melvin and George. Yeah. Two pals from Chicago, Daddy. They heard I was out and wanted I should be Sandy Claus to a private party they was given. That's all. Harmless guys, pals, buddies. We enjoy each other. Yeah, they enjoyed me, too. Uh, before they left town for this party, they said to tell you... Oh, wait a minute. I wrote it down. Uh, it says... Uh, Dear Danny Clover, sorry we made a mistake and beat up your head. May the bells ring a joyous Noel for you. Signed, XX. That's Melvin and George. A mistake, huh? Sure. They knew some mob or other might try to get me as Santa Claus. They figured you was a mob, so they protected me from you, like, like you was fibbing about being a cop. After they walloped you unconscious, they went through your pockets and saw you was really a cop. So they wrote this note. The running ink you see here on the note, Danny, that, that's tears. You'll forgive him, won't you, Danny? Yeah. How about your mother? Well, that was your error, Danny. You didn't tell Mom you was from the police, so she taught just like Melvin and George. You gave me the double talk. Yeah, huh? that's my mom. A grand old dame. You know you know what I told her once when I was nine years yeah, old? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, my sleigh's outside. I'll give you a ride back to my office. Well, that means the whole thing was an error in identification and motive, as they say, huh, Danny? That's right. Isn't that right, Santa? Sure. I'll tell it to you again if you want. No, never mind. What happened to Simon Larrabee? Oh, he went out for a feast of spud nuts and coffee. Hey, you don't look very happy, Tartaglia. Uh Uh-uh. No, Danny. I ain't happy. Unhappy. Very. What's the matter? We've got Santa Claus? Come on, smile. It's going to be a fine Christmas. I can't, Danny. I just can't. It's Mrs. Tartaglia. Hmm? Yeah, now she ain't laughing anymore. The neighbors are laughing and Mrs. Tartaglia is crying. Why? Well, the later editions of the paper said that, that Santa Claus was heisted. It was because I was in a tree. Yeah, the papers say I, single-handed, messed up Christmas. Bad as that, huh? Mm. Well, I'll tell you, Tartaglia... Hey, what about my Christmas party? Oh, 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 oh. Well, not yet, Santa. Oh. Wait till you get to the party. Say, the press was saying that you were snatched, Sandy. What gives? It said that mobsters grabbed you. Nah, it was just a little misunderstanding. Yeah, that's right, Marty. Nick was grabbed by mobsters. Huh? Yeah, well, then how'd he get away? Sergeant Tartaglia. Yeah? Uh-huh. Sergeant Tartaglia. The kind of policeman who tracks down criminals to the lair. I am, Danny? The kind that single-handed rescued Santa Claus from the jaws of disaster. This guy did that? Yep. I'm just about to call the press boys and tell them about it. Oh, Danny. I mean it, Tartaglia. Don't be so modest. I'm going to do just that. Danny. Put Marty in a cab, Tartaglia. I'll send Santa down the squad car in a little while. Yeah, sure. Well, come on, little tyke. Uh, I mean, uh, Marty. Okay. Merry Christmas, Danny. Whatever you tell the press guys, Danny, I'll swear to it. Sure. Sure you will. Ah, that's a fine Christmas you're giving everybody, Danny. How about yourself? Oh, I'll have fun at the party. I always do. Oh. Where, where, where is it? Where's my money? Oh, look, Mr. Larrabee, it's Christmas. Of course it's Christmas. That's why I want my rent, so I can have a Merry Christmas. Hey, Danny, who is this guy that needs rent to have a Merry Christmas? This is Simon Larrabee. He wants a year's rent in advance for that warehouse where the kids are having their party. Or else, no party. Yes, that's who I am. Oh, like yeah, that, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. So that's how you are, huh, Simon? Yeah, stop breathing in my face, Santa Claus. All them kids wanting to have a party, and a Simon like you wants to louse it up. I'll put him down, yeah, Nick. Yeah, I ain't doing nothing, Danny. Just holding Simon up so I can breathe in his face. Oh, please. I want please. you to think about something, Simon. Think about all those kids that are looking forward to that Christmas party, yeah. which ain't going to happen on account of you. Think about it. All right, I'm, th- I'm thinking, yes. I'm Maybe you could th- think better with a pen in your hand, Simon. Yes, a pen that will write out a receipt for a year's rent in advance, huh, Simon? Well, of course, of course, of course. Oh, Christmas spirit and all that. Yes, I'll get my receipt book. Uh. <laughs> ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I haven't felt so good in years. Ah, yes, here you are, Mr. Glover. A receipt for a year's rent in advance. And tell the darlings, Merry Christmas with you, yeah. Yeah, I will. Ain't he a nice fella, Danny? 
Come on, nice fella. I'll take you to a party. Merry Christmas, Danny. It's a merry, merry, merry Christmas, Danny. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. On Christmas Eve, Broadway is almost like any other place in the world. The bells ring out, the horns blow, there's laughter. The Mazdas on the Translux spell out slowly, word by word, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And you read it, you believe it. Because on Christmas Eve, you believe a miracle. Then a whirl of confetti is in your eyes and you're pushed along with a crowd and you never see the next news bulletin. You don't try to look back. It's Broadway. The merriest. The shiniest. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Gil Stratton Jr., Howard McNear, Hal March, Bert Holland, Shep Menken, Estelle Dodge, and Peggy Weber. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a time and a place and a state of mind where you bang your head against a wall so the lights will be brighter, the noise is louder, thereby furnishing proof that you're enjoying yourself. And at holiday season, you bang your head harder and conjure up visions, the new year, the new promises, the golden girl who will smile to you from the crowd and beckon. It could happen. It's Broadway, my beat. <laughs> There's a place on Broadway, it nudges onto Columbus Circle and calls itself the Dover Hotel, then retires into its own faded respectability. At 8 o'clock of a cold weekday morning, Broadway walks past it on its way to work. So was I when a man darted out of its doorway, saw me, darted some more, and tugged at my sleeve. He said he knew me, knew I was a policeman, and that's what he needed. So then we were in an elevator, and he said his name was... What did you say your name was? Box, Louis Box. Well, just what seems to be your trouble, Mr. Box. I said to myself, I said, Mr. Box, there's trouble in room 812. Big trouble. Oh, very big, Mr. Clover. He won't answer. He won't let Mr. Box in. He won't. Who won't? Who won't, Mr. Box? The guest in 812, right this way, Mr. Clover, right down the hall. Every time I open my door, he throws a bottle at Mr. Box's head. Has he hit Mr. Box? Three times, here and here and here. This is his room. Mr. Box will unlock the door for you. Now. Now you'll go back to your desk and Mr. Clover will go in. Very well, but just be careful of those bottles. He, he always aims at Mr. Box's head. Yeah, don't worry. All right, you. Hey, what are you... <laughs> put down that bottle. I said put it down. It's better. Now tell me it's so funny. <laughs> it's funny, mister. It's the funniest thing. Look, it's all here in this paper. Go ahead, mister. Read it for yourself. Yeah. Hey, this paper's two days old. Sure, sure it is. On account, I got it two days ago. Go ahead, read that obituary right where I'm pointing. <laughs> John Lomax, victim of hit-and-run accident, was buried today at the Queen Cemetery. He was survived by his wife, Martha Lomax. Martha Lomax of 36 Darcy Place. Place. I called for a drink. Oh, you're <laughs> 
I'm Lomax, mister. I'm John Lomax. Huh? Sure, sure. And Martha's my wife. Look, I'll tell you about it. I'm looking. Tell me. Four nights ago, yeah, it was four nights ago when whoever was supposed to be me was hit and run. I went to a Turkish bath, you know. So you had a bath, so? So they stole my overcoat and they stole my wallet, rolled me. But I was too smart for them. Yeah, you sure were. How were you too smart for them? I had some money rolled up in my shirt sleeves. Trick I learned in the Navy. Enough to pay for booze in this crummy room. I called for another drink. <gasps> How long have you been here? <laughs> since then, I saw the papers. I've been laughing ever since. Why don't you go home? I'll tell you why. Tell me. Mm. I think my wife is happy I'm dead. Yeah. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Mr. Lomax. Hey. Hey, Mr. Lomax. mask of foolish delight and motley bliss arranged itself on the face of John Lomax. And having so arranged itself, Mr. Lomax proceeded to fall flat on same. John Lomax had been hilarious because another man died bearing his name and identity. So much happiness over the dead makes me curious. So I went out to the home of John Lomax in Queens. It was like every other home on the block. Even the cracks in the stucco were identically placed. But what made the Lomax home different was it had a different number over its doorbell. Yes? Mrs. Lomax? This is John Lomax? Yes. I'm Danny Clover of the police, Mrs. Lomax. Police? Now, don't be frightened, Mrs. Lomax. Well, uh, uh, come in, Mr. Clover. Please come in. Thank you. Oh, I pick up these things... A woman's pajamas look so lost, just lying on a chair. Here, uh, sit, sit here, Mr. Clover. Thanks. It's about your husband, Mrs. Lomax. What? When did you see him last? Well, forgive me, Mr. Clover, but I don't quite understand what you're driving at. My husband is dead. We buried him two days ago. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Lomax. I'm sorry, it's just that... Well, how are you sure it was your husband who died? What? Oh, you mean because he was so badly smashed up in the accident. I knew him because it was his wallet they found on the dead man. And John's overcoat. Maybe that wasn't enough. Maybe it was someone else. It wasn't. I know because there was a card in the coat advertising the Baghdad baths. <laughs> John always went there for days on end instead of home. What did your husband look like, Mrs. Lomax? Do you have a picture of him I could see? I'm afraid not. After the funeral, I tore up every picture of John and of John and me that was in the house. John was dead. And it was done. Can you understand that? Will you describe him to me? I mean a physical description. Coloring, weight. John was 5'11". He had a punch... I mean, he weighed about 180 pounds. He was overweight. He had thin, sandy hair and kind of faded blue eyes. And a kind of funny, loose oh, face. Fits. Fits. What? Mrs. Lomax, there's something I... Oh, Hi, Martha. I got the papers. You miss me, doll? Oh, who... Paul. Paul. This is Mr. Danny Clover of the police department. He was asking about John. What do you want to know about John Lomax and why? Mrs. Lomax, you haven't introduced me to your friend. Oh, how silly of me. I was so flustered when Paul just walked in without knocking or anything. You gave me the key so I could run out for the papers, remember, Doc? Oh, of course. I thought it would be simpler that way. This is Paul Rand, Mr. Clover. A very talented pianist. A sort of protege of John and me. Of you, doll. I'm sorry I haven't the mood to play something for you, Mr. Clover. So you'll tell me instead what there is about John Lomax you're bothering Martha about. Hey, I'll tell you, protege. There's a drunk in the Dover Hotel who says he's John Lomax. And he says John Lomax is not dead, never did die. You think maybe he's lying? Of course he's lying. My husband is dead. Isn't he, Paul? Yeah, sure, doll. Dead. What are you building, policeman? Who are you going to believe, a drunk or a widow? Get out of here. Leave her alone. 
The look on their faces was like a motion picture or watch where suddenly the action is frozen and still. A boy, maybe 24, with an animal's hard grace, the lips drawn tight away from his teeth, the eyes wary and stagnant. And the woman, more mature, gentler, almost pretty. But in her eyes, nothing. Nothing she wants you to see. A telephone directory gives you the address of the Baghdad Bath. So you go there because you have to sweat out some questions on a man who says he's John Lomax and not deceased. You walk up three flights of a dank building on 9th Avenue. There's a dank card that says Baghdad Baths, Ephraim Sable, proprietor, Waldo Toklas, proprietor. You walk in, ask for Ephraim or Waldo, a receptionist who's beating her eyelashes, and she winks you back to the steam room. Hey, Ephraim. Hey, Waldo. In here. Whoever it is wants to see me have to come in here. Maybe you better come out. It's the police, Ephraim. Or is it Waldo? It's Ephraim and the cat come out. I'm naked. Put on a towel and come out. You off-duty, policeman? Well, you come to the right place. Nothing like Baghdad baths to draw out of a man what's bothering him. Yeah, I bet. Ephraim, you know a man named John Lomax? Know him well. John Lomax used to come here every weekend. Like for his pores to feel good. Hasn't been here lately, though. Maybe because you rolled him. Stole his overcoat and wallet. You from the police, you say? That's what I said. Yeah, we rolled him. Stole those things. But then Waldo stole him from me. Your partner? Where is he? Disappeared. Walked out of here with Mr. Lomax's belongings, which belonged to me by squatter's rights. And he disappeared. How long has he been gone? Four or five days. For all I care, he could have dropped dead because he sinned against me. I got news for you, Ephraim. He may have done just that. Waldo? Drop dead? When? Four or five days ago, maybe. Hit and run, maybe. You mean Waldo was in an accident? Maybe. Why didn't I know about it? I'm all he's got. Because he sinned and stole another man's overcoat and wallet. So he was buried under an assumed name, maybe. John Lomax, maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe you ain't sure. Maybe I ain't. But I'm sure of one thing. You sin, too. Ephraim? Uh Uh-huh. Change that towel for something more formal. We're going for a ride. Danny, you're coming in late this morning. It's 11.30 in the a.m. All right, come in here, Tataglia. Uh, yeah, Danny. Shut the door. Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, what's up, Danny? A riddle is up. A guy is killed in a hit-and-run accident, identified as John Lomax, buried as John Lomax. Now I'm not sure he's John Lomax. Hey, that's a good riddle. Yeah, it gets better. There's a guy sleeping it off at the Dover Hotel who says he's John Lomax. He does? Who? Who does, Danny? Tataglia, you know what I'd do if I were a sergeant? Oh, yeah, Danny, sure. If you were a sergeant... You would send an order for the exhumation of the body of the first mentioned Lomax. Uh, the dead Lomax. Yeah, that's exactly what I'd do. Do it. Yeah, sure, Danny, sure. Uh, what are you going to do on account of you're a lieutenant? I'm going to dig up a live man who calls himself Lomax. I want to introduce him to a woman who calls herself his widow. So I said to myself, I said, Mr. Box, this man has indeed some pride left after all. Yeah, what made Mr. Box say that? Because the guest in 812 took a shower a few minutes ago. That's a good sign on New Year's Eve. Mr. Box is happy for him. I'll take the elevator back down, Mr. Box. I'll find my way to 812 myself. Mr. Lomax. Come on, Lomax. Open the door. Lomax. Break it down. Break down the door. Yeah. I can't. I've got a key. Come on, come on. Come on. You caught Mr. Box? Give me your pass key. You what? Give me the key. Of course, here you are. Oh, wait for Mr. Box. Lomax. Lomax, it's Danny Clover. Did he do it, Mr. Clover? Did he turn over a new leaf? Did... My goodness, what's that far escape window doing open? Letting in that cold Window. Air. Mr. Bucks, now you can say to yourself, you can say, a murderer threw a man out of a window in my hotel. 
Listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Fifty-three thousand dollars in cold hard cash and wonderful prizes. What a wonderful ending that would be to the old year. Well, Sing It Again is coming along with all that in the jackpot tonight, and some smart CBS listener can knock it off by solving the Phantom Voice riddle. Sing It Again is heard on most of these same CBS stations. So a fifty-three thousand dollar Happy New Year, maybe. Happy New Year anyway, for Sing It Again is heard every Saturday night. On the happy holidays, Broadway wears the happy clothes, complete with happy masks. The wooden barriers are up in the shop windows, and Broadway's herd stampedes down the long alley. The dust it raises is confetti. Whirlwinds of confetti, bursts of confetti that explode and play like marvelous fountains. The jewels of light they reflect is the light of neon and Mazdas. There's a Mazda at police headquarters, too. It casts a veil of yellow light and it hangs in the long concrete hallway that leads to the morgue. When the sergeant speaks, it makes a cold echo. Uh, now, Danny. Okay, Tartaglia. Ephraim. My, my, that's neat. Could use something like that down at Baghdad Baths. Slide them in, then slide them out when they're done. <laughs> eh, shouldn't make no quips in here, should I? Who is this man, Ephraim? It's a little hard to tell. Could be John Lomax. Same who used to habitually my sweat baths. Same me and Waldo stole from. The same John Lomax who'd drink more so he could perspire more. Could be. Hey, you fellas come up with Waldo yet? Take Ephraim out of here, Tataglia, and send Mrs. Lomax in. Yeah, Danny, sure. Come on, Ephraim. Hey, look, uh, you, you say that these baths are really good for the system? Ain't nothing like them, kiddo. Why, why did you have me brought here, Mr. Clover? I want you to identify a man. A man who was murdered. A man who once told me you were his wife. Is that... Is that the man? You tell me, Mrs. Lomax. I never saw him before in my life. There is a kind of resemblance, but... I never saw him. I don't... I don't understand why you want to torture me, Mr. Clover. You say this man is not your husband. No, no! Please, Mr. Clover. Please take me out of here. All right. Mrs. Lomax, did your husband carry insurance? Is that going to help you find out who ran down my husband? Maybe. I don't know. My lawyer is handling all that. Harold Quillen in the craft building. He is a lawyer. He answers rude questions. Why don't you ask them of him? Yeah, I'll do that, Mrs. Lomax. You can go home now. It didn't wear well, her casual way of considering the insurance, for example. Things like insurance need worrying about. How else can a helpless widow buy her daily needs, whatever were her daily needs? That's why I'm a policeman. I can't get my mind off details like that. They tweak me, and I need to know answers. So I went to the lawyer named Harold Quillen and asked for some cooperation. Why don't you stop bothering that poor woman, Mr. Clover? Well, I'm not bothering her, Mr. Quillen. It's you. As far as I can see, we're just chatting. Isn't that what we're doing? Well, isn't that what we're doing? Answer me. Oh, does my rocking in this swivel chair annoy you? I find it restful. Rhythmic. Restful. When was the last time you were disbarred for non-cooperation, Quillen? Come now. Look, friend. I know it's your job to protect your client. That's my job, too. To protect Mrs. John Lomax, and she needs protecting. For my nasty little mind that makes me think sometimes that everybody's a potential murderer. You, me, everybody... But I don't and see... since Mrs. John Lomax is pretty close to what's a murder, my mass nasty little mind makes her pretty close to being a murderer. How much insurance did her husband carry? Fifty thousand dollars. For accidental death? I was just coming to that. Double indemnity for accidental death. 
As a corpse, Mr. Lomax is worth exactly $100,000. A man who was not loved gets killed, and it pays double who has loved one. And $100,000 can buy a lot of things. Can buy back the lost years. A woman can buy them back by getting herself a protege, a boy who can do things with a piano. A boy who can make a woman remember she was once a girl. What all that money bought me was a trip back to Queens, to a house like all other houses on the block, even to not having a mourning wreath on its door. But from this particular house came the sound of big music. Oh, it's the police again. You know, I can't get it out of my mind you're a door-to-door salesman. Ever in that line of work, Mr. Clover? Mrs. Lomax, I want to talk to her. What about? You can tell me. I'm her friend. I get her the morning papers, remember? So talk to me. Mrs. Lomax. Go away like the rain. Come again some other day. Mrs. Lomax. Mrs. Lomax is not in, Mr. Clover. Sorry, Mr. Clover. Uh Uh-oh. I changed my mind. I'll talk to you, Paul. I came all the way out here, so I might as well talk to somebody. Come in. Come in, Mr. Cloak. Thanks. You sure you were never a salesman? That foot in the door gimmick, very professional. Yeah, I studied. I told you she's not home. But you don't have to believe that if you don't want to, like you're not believing it now. Look in this closet, policeman. Maybe I'm lying. Maybe she's in here, huh? No, not in here. Tell me about Martha and you, Paul. Gladly. Can I tell you the music? I feel better with music. It makes me polite. Yeah, if it makes you polite. The romance of Paul and Martha. That's music, like this. The big musical romance. When did it begin? Someplace in time, someplace in space. I'm a square, Paul. I don't understand big talk like that. What month, what year? That's what I understand. The month? May. What else? Merry, merry month. The year, 1949. Hey, is it still 1949, police? But her husband. When did she tell you about him? This husband fellow? Martha told me he existed, but I never had the pleasure of making his acquaintance. Charming setup, huh? You never met your patron? No. Oh, pity. I was going to be so brave and noble and 100% fellow when I met him. Yeah, I can tell you're a prince. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> That's what Martha calls me sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, I was going to tell the old John boy, the deluded husband, who it was was deluding him. Yeah, but you never got the chance. No. The dope gets himself killed in an accident before I can release him. Yeah. Thanks, Paul, for the music. For just being you. You know the way out, huh? What'd you find out? Uh, maybe a motive. Just maybe. See. Hey, wait, wait. Wait hmm? a minute, Danny. Don't you want the report on the exhumation? Yeah, tell it to me. Well, the prints check with those that are on file on an application for a permit for the Baghdad Bats. Made out to one Waldo Tuckless. Yeah, the drunk was right. Yeah. Oh, uh, Danny, you got a visitor in your office. Oh, who? Mrs. Lomax. Well, ain't you surprised, Danny? Uh-uh. I'm not surprised at all. Hello, Mr. Clover. Mrs. Lomax. You know, Mrs. Lomax, I was just telling Sergeant Tataglia. I was just telling him I'm not surprised at all. About what? Your being here. If you're here to tell me you killed your husband, that'll make two coincidences all at once. Mr. Clover, you didn't mean what you just said. That's cruel. That's one of the words they use about violent death. I can even attend it to the death of Waldo Toklas. Who? Waldo Toklas, a petty thief who also ran a Turkish bath. It goes like this, Mrs. Lomax. Waldo stole your husband's coat and wallet. In the dark, he was run down by a hit-and-run driver, by someone who thought it was your husband, someone who wanted your husband dead. No. No, it wasn't like that. Not like that. That's why I came here to tell you. I'm frightened, Mr. Clover. Frightened. Your upper lip didn't even quiver down there in the morning. (laughs) Why didn't you tell me then? That was your husband, wasn't it? The dead man downstairs. (laughs) Why didn't you tell me then? I'm frightened. Don't you see? 
sick with fright. Of who? Me, Sergeant Tataglia, your conscience, the <laughs> pianist, Paul Rand? <laughs> Which? Paul. I just looked around the room. He's not here. Tell me all about Paul Rand. Paul killed Waldo Duclan. Ran over him. From the way Douglas was dressed, he thought it was my husband. Did he say pardon me after he killed him? Stop it! Stop it! He didn't know! Not until you told him my husband was alive at that hotel. So Paul went there and killed my husband. You sound glad. Cold. But if you're unemotional about a man's dying, you're glad he's dead. My husband was a heel. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. I thought it really was an accident until Paul told me what he'd done. Oh, Paul. Paul! Start with Paul and go on from there. Paul, yes, he's a killer. He enjoys killing. I'm frightened. Don't you understand? He enjoys it. If he knew I were here, he'd... Maybe he would. I think we'll go ask him. Where have you been, Martha? Paul. You tilt your head backward, Paul, you'll notice company. Me. Oh, it's you again, Clover. Yeah, don't bite your lip. You're dreaming this whole thing. Paul, I... Oh, Paul. Come on, doll. What are you trying to say? This. She's made an honest effort to say you're a killer. That's what, huh? Yeah. I'm piecing it all together, and I come up with this. You killed Waldo Tuklas. Mistake. You killed John Lomax. No mistake. Reason, a widow with a hundred grand. Reason for you to be a killer. Right, as the saying goes, as rain. Martha probably said I didn't mind it either, huh? Something like that. That's why I can get dreamy about pointing this gun at you. You don't have to. I'm not finished talking. You're finished. Unless your next sentence starts with a prayer, you're just about done. I'd point that gun at Martha to be smarter. Rush me, Clover. That way you can die in action. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. Ah! Ah! Crazy woman, you... Crazy. That's good. Paul's dead. That's good. He needed to be dead. Yeah, give me that gun, Mrs. Lomax. Oh, here. Take it. I'm afraid of it. I don't know where I got the courage to pull the trigger. Emotions, Mrs. Lomax. Sometimes they get the better of us and they make us pull the trigger one way or another. You want to thank me, I know, but don't. All right, I won't. I wasn't going to. You weren't? For saving your life? Did you do that? If you did, that's what you were thinking about when you had emotions. Thanks. But I shot him because... Because... Why? Don't you see? Of course you do. I shot him because he was going to kill you. That's your version. I've got one. (laughs) Don't you have to call your office, uh, report this or something? Paul's dead, you know. He'll stay that way. Don't be frightened. Not of Paul. Of me. Of you? Because you gave it all away. Gave away what? What are you saying? About Paul, the promises you must have made to him for killing your husband. Whatever kind of love you promised him. Whatever share of $100,000, things like that. You knew all the time. Just recently, when I found out the man you identified as your husband was Waldo Torkless. When Paul told me he never met your husband. But he didn't. Of course he didn't. So you had to tell him how your husband was dressed so he could kill him with a car. That would include the coat he was wearing. It was like that, Mrs. Lomax. Yes. Look. Hey, get away from that door. Don't worry, I'm not going to run away. It's the new year, Mr. Clover. It's a time for wishing good things. Some people do. You want to know my wish, Mr. Clover? It won't come true if you tell me. I know it won't anyhow. But it's this. I wish there was some way... Some way, Mr. Clover, it would make my new year a happy one. If there was some way I could kill you. knocking itself to pieces. The celebrants with the funny hats lean out of the windows of the Aster and drop paper cups on the celebrants with the tin horns. There's laughter and crowd and holiday and swirl. The fine thing, the glance and the words. 
a happy new year and means it. The avenue means it with its heart. It happens once a year on Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was arranged by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and our pianist was Sam Furman. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Jeanette Nolan, Jay Novello, Leo Penn, Fred Howard, Bob Bruce, and Barton Yarborough. Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat. With Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a memory and a want that makes a bitter flame inside you. You poke through the ashes and you can't find what it is that was remembered or wanted. So you keep looking. But the blaze of the neon and the spectaculars blinds you. And the roar of steel moving above and beneath the earth makes you deaf. And finally, you know there's no need to search anymore. Because whatever it was, you'll never find it. It's Broadway, my feet. You use the morning hours at police headquarters to tidy up, to dust off the old reports and polish up the new ones. You watch a derelict fly store up a few rays of sun against the time of its winter dying. And then someone opens your door. They told me I could talk. The woman is about 40. Her perfume is expensive. Her furs are expensive. And the black lizard purse with a jeweled clasp that sleeps under her arm looks fat and happy. But in her face and eyes, something frayed, something pinched. May I sit down? I think I don't feel well. Of course. Here. Thank you. Now, don't look so worried, Mr. Clover. I won't faint or anything like that. Not me. You're sure you're all right? You're quite pale, Miss... Don't... Don't ask me who I am yet. I want to save that. I've heard a lot about you, Mr. Clover. Oh? Yes, a lot. They say people can come to you. People like me, if they've got something to say to you. Maybe it would help if you told me who you were. Not now. Later. When I've said you my say. A woman can wait only so long, Mr. Clover. You know how it is. Oh, I don't understand. Only just so long for a man she promised to wait for. Then the years keep stretching out like a piece of old elastic, like anything that if you stretch it out too long, it'll snap. It'll break and sting your face. You know how it is. Will you get me some water, please? My mouth is dry. It's really dry, my... Oh, sure. Here. Here's your water. Hey, what's wrong? Are you all right? No, you're not all right, are you? Hi, Danny. You don't mind my busting in? Of course you don't mind. Get out of here, Jimmy. I got nothing for you. The hands out in the press room are very stale, very one-day-old, Danny. From you, I want something fresh, something a shock, something a headline. Like, uh, why don't you introduce me to the charming lady? I told you to get out, Jimmy. Get on your hind legs and beg for news from somebody else. Lady, Danny. Maybe the lady will be kinder. How do you do, lady? I'm Jimmy Ames, a reporter for... Well, the lady's dead, isn't she, Danny? Yeah. Well, you got your news, reporter. Go report it. Well, how about it, Dr. Sinsky? Danny Clover, welcome to the precincts of the autopsy room. We have here... Don't sell me, and then give me the report on the woman who died in my office. What killed her? Poison killed her. What poison? The pharmacological name would bore you. Delayed action type poison, taken internally, kills in four hours. She probably didn't even know she was dying. No more than any of us realize we always are. Hi, Doc. Danny. No. 
You know, I always feel good that I can walk in here under my own power. All right, Tartaglia. What do you got? Identification on Miss Jane Doe over there. What name? Mary Murdoch. Late wife of one hoodlum known as Pick Murdoch. Pick Murdoch, Danny. That means something to you? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tartaglia. It means a lot to me. It did. It meant a 20-year flashback to a different era, a different world. To a time of Tommy guns and violin cases and massacres. Speed boats and limousines and booze watered and bonded in ratty cellars. A jazzy era where gang wars had preferred position in the headlines. A world that gawked at a butchered man in a gutter, then rolled its stockings, pinched its spit curl and chorused, do 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 through a megaphone. It was before my time on the force. But it was that kind of a world when Dick Murdoch performed. Then Dick killed a man and society wagged its finger, put him in a room and locked the door. Now Dick was out. Now Dick was circulating. I had to find out where. Hey, you bring it. You bring it. Oh. It's Danny Clover, Benny. Mind if I come in? In this? In this crummy room? You want to come in here? In here, Benny. How do you feel? I could tell you. You wouldn't know what I meant. Sit down. Sit down, Danny. Me, I... I better, I better lay down. You got coffee on that hot plate, Benny. You need some. That don't jolt. But read it to me. Sure. Here. Why are you here, Danny? Dick Murdoch, Benny. Danny. Danny, you couldn't go away, come back. Someone's come. Not here yet. Talk to me about Dick. It's only good for him. Stole him. Some guys' lives wind up that way. Stole him. The guys get the big priest and policemen. Uh, drink, Benny. Uh, Dick, you say? Uh-huh. He's out. Come down from Sing Sing to the sea. I know that. I seen him, too. He ain't changed. Some guys live 20 years between seeing them. And they change. Get old. Something happens to their faces. Not big. He's scary. Not big. Where'd you see him? He went to a place. To a place in the alley. To a hole in the alley wall. Where? On First Avenue. Near East 49th. The first alley. The first hole you come to on your right. Thanks. Let's go to my place of business, Benny. I've been there. It, it don't do no good. Let's go, Benny. We'll try again. It took maybe an hour to bundle up Benny in his army surplus overcoat, to turn him over to the healers on Welfare Island, to leave him with the unshaped terror and the gray hunger in his eyes. Then to the first alley, the first hole on the right. <laughs> And I peeped out at you from a peephole. Splintered voice asked you who sent you. You told them, and a door was opened onto a world you thought was dead. The puppet-like women were dressed in the shapeless sacks that were fashionable for flappers in the 20s. The men they wore in their arms, pomaded and sleek as their patent leather pointed shoes, their double-breasted fawn color vests. They danced in quick, silent spasms to the music of the 20s. You shook your head because you didn't believe it. Matter, copy. Ain't never saw a speakeasy before? A blind pig you never saw? I don't believe it. What's not to believe, bad boy? Might have asked you a question. Why? You mean why all this is like this? Yeah. Ask Bick. To this, even I, the waiter, don't have an answer. So ask Bick. Excuse me. Some babbit must be looking for a hot, jazzy time. All right, who sent you, babbit? Danny Clover in there. Yeah, he's here. What's that supposed to do to me? Could send shivers up your spine, Gorilla. Open up. Lousy flea. Hey, it's Jimmy Ames. He's a reporter. Let him in. Law says you can crawl in, Crump. Well, Danny, you... Hey, what is this? I haven't seen anything like this since Eddie Robinson and Little Caesar. What are you doing here? Following you? You going to talk to Vic Murdoch? Yeah, but without you. Not a question, waiter. Hmm? Where's Vic? In the office, down the end of the hallway. I'll go first so I can ask him, does he want to see you? I'm a big boy now. I'll ask him myself. No, wait. Don't buzz him. I want to surprise him. Danny, I'll go with you. Vic will remember me. I helped cut him to pieces 20 years ago. Leave him alone. Get yourself some hooch, Jimmy. They tell me it's scraped right off the boat. Big story. (laughs) 
Who wants to see Big Murdoch knocks on doors first and ask permission. This I've said many times. You were too many years away from me to hear it, Vic. A copper. I smell it from here. Not too close, Papa Vittorio. Maybe you heard, copper, how I don't like aces from the police. Especially when I'm getting my hair cut. Private barber's chair. Farewell gift from the boys at Sing Sing, Vic. Aces with a loose mouth, especially I don't like. Papa Vittorio, I told you once. We'll use the scissors. You can clip a happy. The waiter told me I should ask you a question, Vic. That Roaring Twenties movie out there. Why? The waiter told you to ask, so I'll answer you. Because 20 years ago, they put me in a cage. This made the world stop going around. What you see out there is how it was the world. I'm going to keep it that way until I catch up to 20 years. The 7,285 days you citizens cut out of me. Tell the waiter I answered your question. I got another one. Your wife's death. The uh, boys told me about it. Shame. Mary was a good wife. They tell me. Your boys, copper. They find the key. Key? Key. Metal gadget that opens things. For 20 years, Mary's always carried it with her. If you found it, maybe it could open your eyes why a good wife like Mary should die. I could make you tell me, Vic. No, you couldn't, copper. Got what I just said. Did I say something, Baba Vittorio? You see, I didn't say anything. You're a nice special, huh, Baba? Well, I sleep. And he did. He slept. The throwbacks were having themselves a snazzy Charleston, so I threw consternation into the house by sugarfooting through them and out the door. A key, the man said. A key that his wife had, the man said. And his lip twitched when he said it. I called headquarters and the only key among the effects of Mary Murdoch fitted the new Nash she'd parked in back of the station. Headquarters gave me her address, too, so I went there to a quiet apartment in the East 60s. Yes? I'm Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Please come in. Uh, Miss... Susie Lane. I'm the maid here. Miss Lane, did they tell you about Mrs. Murdoch? Mrs. Murdoch? No. She wasn't home last night. She's dead. She was a kind woman. I'm sorry. She died in my office this morning. Well, a strange woman, but kind. Strange? This apartment, for instance. She brought no one here. Received no mail here. Men, friends? They said good night downstairs. I'm looking for a key, Miss Lane. A key? What key? I don't know, but I'm looking for it. I'm looking for a key. Pardon me. Hello? Yes? It's for you, Mr. Clover. Thanks. Danny Clover speaking. Don't look for the key no more, Clover. Who is this, Vic? Yeah, I got advice for you. Don't look for the key no more. It could open up a lot of pain. Changed your mind, haven't you? If you haven't found it, don't look for it. If you found it, throw it away. Wait a minute. Guy I want to see just walked into the office. Vic. Hello, Vic. Let's look for that key, Miss Lane. So we looked. Closets and desks and bureaus and cabinets. We looked there. And under mattresses and behind pictures and in jewel boxes. Nothing. No key. It went on for almost an hour. Then it got to be time to go back to the alley and take 20 years off my life. Grand badge, boy. The boss ain't having no more callers today. Don't get conscientious. I'm an expected caller. Boss ain't said a word about you. Show me your warrant. Show you this. Hey. It's a message, waiter friend. Hey, you can't go in there. Hey, the boss ain't gonna like it. He'll like it. Murdoch, I was just telling your waiter. Murdoch. Uh, yeah, boss. This book and busted in. <laughs> hey, the boss is sleeping like a babe in his father's chair. Hey. He ain't sleeping. But he was. Dick was sleeping. The poets would say so. The poets would say something about the long black night and no stars. The black night that is forever. Because death is forever. But they'd have trouble. How do you write a sonnet on a ten-cent ice pick? 
sticking in a man's heart. When it comes to starting off a new year, Broadway is sensible. It makes no promises to itself. It turns over no new leaves. That way it can grin over the current flock of killings and not make excuses for itself. A woman drops dead at police headquarters. That makes for a grade A grin. Her husband is murdered with an ice pick the same day. Broadway grins from ear to collective ear. Double feature, admission free, comedy of death, but sensational. And it goes on. The next morning, Broadway lines the curb, the funeral of Vic Murdoch. An oldie, a revival, but characters within the memory of dear old dad. The procession was maybe a mile long. Low-slung and black convertibles filled with flowers and mourners. And a brass band from Local 802. Maybe Bick enjoyed it. So many other people did. Like the man who tapped my shoulder. A side, huh, Danny? Jimmy Ames. Quite a production, huh? Five stars. Do funerals always make you this happy? This one will get a headline for three editions. The way I write it, maybe even four. You've been stepping on my shadow, Jimmy. Yeah, I know. People die where Danny Clover goes. They... Hey, I haven't seen him since... Seen who? The guy in the pearl gray hat, the one in the procession. I know it's not polite, but point. Well, this car passing, you know who that is, or was he too long ago for you? He doesn't register. Joe Miami. It surprises you. Make me surprised, too. Joe Miami, Danny. Dick Murdoch's pally. What's the pally doing now? Being a brother to men, a fat, respectable citizen. Last year, the word reached the press room that Joe Miami was elected president of the PTA of Public School 62. The boys laughed for a half hour straight. So we realized we'd suddenly aged 20 years. Joe Miami, Jimmy, where do I find him? Uptown, Danny. The Gotham Distributors. You can find him there, Danny. <laughs> Okay, you got four lots, 600 cases. Distribution them. Take off like big wing bird. Joe. Joe Miami. It's me. Who are you? Danny Clover. I'm Don't tell me no more who he is. I know. Quite a business you got here, Joe. They can distribute business and I'm bad. Makes me crummy fortune like old days. But now I pay tax, everything abide. Some place quiet where we can talk, huh, Joe? This some place I got. My business up. Walk with me, Danny Clover. I offer you something. Since Rails, ask for Alice. Thanks, Joe, but first we talk about Vic, then pleasure. This type dying, big die, very tragedy, huh? Very classical. I speak like old golden days. You mean a mob killed him, eh? Why mob? Vic wasn't hurting nobody. All he wanted was a long dream. The old days, like they were. He tried to buy them back. He got ice pick in the heart. You were his number one boy, Joe. Why would anyone want to kill Vic? Maybe somebody remember Big's supposed to have hideaway, a hundred grand, before he go on a long visit to Sing Sing. A hundred grand? Didn't Big get it when he got out? Joe Miami don't think so. If a hundred grand is, maybe Big left it where it was. Where was that, Joe? How would I know? I was only Big's Adam boy, not his wife. You mean his wife Mary knew where it was? You mean maybe she had a key? I don't know what I mean. I don't see Mary for 20 years. Big don't like guys for to see Mary. Big take care of Mary no matter what it is. Even that. You sure they don't want no sarsaparillas? Tell me about Mary. Who's well, a lovely, nice wife. Tell me more. Lovely, nice wife for 18, 19 years. But in 20th year, since Big was away, Mary found maybe new love, a new guy. Who was he? Who was he? Why should I care? But a woman put these things down in little black diaries. Doesn't they? This is very classical also. Yeah. Thanks for everything, abiding Joe. For what? You didn't touch drop size Burrella. I had an idea I was getting someplace now, but my footing wasn't secure. Someplace back down the line, I'd walked too fast, skipped something. The matter of Mary Murdoch's male company who said good night downstairs. Maids might know about that. Headquarters gave the address of Susie Lane, ex-mate of the late Mary Murdoch. 
The address of Susie Lane on 136th Street in Harlem. I went there, and the same man stepped on my shadow again. Don't look worried, Danny. You know you can't lose me. Now, be kind to newspaper guys, I always say. They write such wonderful a bit. Somebody going to die again, Danny? Mm-mm, no, no more. Well, that could be news, too. I'll come along. All right, but keep your hand over your mouth. Sure. In here? In here. Miss Lane. Door is open a little. Let's go in. Take your hand off the door. Miss Lane. Come on, let's go in. Hey, Susie. Hey, I told you not to look. Look at this place, Danny. Like a big wind lived and died here. A mess. Yeah. What have you got? Blood. A pool of it on the rug. Maybe you're batting a thousand after all. How'd you like to get battered right through that wall? Yeah. Trouble, huh? You add it up. You're a big newspaper man. Overturned furniture and a bloody rug. Look in the dinette, big newspaper man. Sure. What am I looking for? I don't know. Just look. Uh, nothing in there, Danny. I'll try the closet. Yeah. Danny, Danny. Oh, no. When I opened the closet door, she was staring at me. She fell. The door must have been holding her up. Poor Susie Lane. She's dead. Huh? No. Huh? Not quite dead. Oh, I'm glad, Danny. I'm starting to worry about you. Danny. Danny, it's me. Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. Hmm? Uh, oh, sorry, Tartaglia. I was just thinking. How's Susie Lane? Well, that's what I came to tell you. Hospital reports, she is still in her coma. They're taking care of her? Everything in their power, Danny, just like you told me. Uh, Dr. Sinsky says she'll pull through, though. What kind of people do things like that to take? Beat up a girl so she's neither dead or alive, just to keep her mouth shut. What kind of people? Well, in our line of business, we meet them all, Danny. Yeah, yeah. To tag you, do you get mail? Huh? Well, sure, sure I get mail, Danny. Bills, the secrets of happy marriage, circulars, postcards and vacations... Hey, why do you ask a question like that at a time like this? Everybody gets mail, huh? Well, sure, Danny, sure. What's the matter? Why didn't Mary Murdoch get mail? She didn't? No. I don't believe it. She didn't, Detective. I've been checking back. And suddenly I remember Susie Lane told me there was never any mail at Mary Murdoch's apartment. Oh, that is indeed strange. A problem. Needs thinking. Tartaglia, if you wanted to get mail and you didn't want Mrs. Tartaglia to know you were getting it... Oh, I wouldn't think of such a thing, Danny. Mrs. Tartaglia would find out anyway. You'd have it sent care of general delivery, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, Danny, I would send the mail to someplace anonymous like general delivery. Oh, you're a genius, Detective. Ah, oh, Danny, you hardly took no effort at all. You can't shake me, Detective. Where are we going now? Jimmy Ames. I've got big news for you. Yeah? Like what? Like maybe the last paragraph of your story? You want it, reporter? You out of your mind? What do you mean, do I want it? Ever peeked in mailboxes, reporter? Let's move, kid. Let's move. <laughs> I do for you, sir. Is there any mail of general for Mrs. Mary Murdoch? Mary Murdoch? You're her husband? He's a policeman. I'm a reporter. You're a policeman, sir? Yes. Here. Oh, of course. Well, just a minute. Here you are, sir. Thanks. Yeah, not about mail, huh? Bill from Zach's. Bond with... Yeah. Something, Danny? Something. We'll open the envelope and see. See? Gee. She must have mailed it to herself. A key to what, then? Says here, kid, on the tag, the Wall Street Bank. Let's take a flyer on Wall Street, huh, reporter? <laughs> Brown, these your credentials are in order, Mr. Clover. I'm to permit you access to Mrs. Murdoch's safety deposit box. Oh, thank Mr. Brown before me. I'll open the gate. Step in, please. I'm sorry. Only one of you can come in. Only Mr. Clover. Wait a minute, Danny. Don't louse me out of my story. Okay, I'll vote for Ames here. He's a reporter. It's his story. Oh, you may go in then. I have the bank key, which we will take here. 
Then I take your key. That is Mrs. Murdoch. We know, Mrs. Murdoch's key. Exactly. I insert it here. And here it is, Mr. Clover. Oh, thanks. You may take it to that private cubicle to examine the contents. When you're through, just call me. Yeah, I'll do that. Come on, Jimmy. I'll close the door. Sure, Danny. All right, Danny. Open the box. What? The gun in your back. Does that surprise you, Danny? Yeah. Frankly, yeah. It shouldn't. A big cop like you with a big brain. Come on, Danny. Open the pretty box and hand me the hundred grand. Maybe you'll have to kill me to get it. You think I won't? I've had practice. First Mary, then Vic. Third time's easier. Susie, we won't count. She didn't die. Clean-cut, true blue fella like you. Yeah, ain't I, though? A reporter has advantages, Danny. I knew all about that hundred grand all the time. Read it in an old newspaper morgue. I figure your wife, Mary Murdoch, must know where it is, so I make love to her. But with all that love, he won't give me a little key. Funny woman. <laughs> so funny you murdered her, huh? Yeah, like that. But then Vic gets on to our innocent little affair. The ice pick, the right way for a man like Vic to die, huh, Danny? It also leaves a hundred thousand all to myself. Open the box, Danny. No? All right, I'll open it myself. How do you think I'll get out of here? Oh, I figured that, Danny. Big man like you will make a big shield. Nah, no tricks, Danny. Just be a good boy and stay there in the corner. You can watch me open the box from there. A hundred thousand dollars. Let me take you out of that nasty old box. <laughs> It was a big noise and a big scream. It got inside of me and wouldn't quit, but it had substance. It hoisted me up in the tr stratosphere and then let me drop a million miles. Simple thing like a nun's cool fingertips brought me to. In a while, the hospital let me have visitors. A quiet talk about the death of Jimmy Ames. And at night, I, I slept my own sleep and dreamed of a fairy story. A Pandora's box. I had reason to. I knew all about a man named Dick Murdoch who planted a hundred thousand dollars with a booby trap. Just in case his wife was unfaithful. Just in case being away from him for twenty years would make her lonely. <laughs> Broadway's rearing on its haunches now, and it's wearing its comedian's face. It'll reach out and tickle you under the chin and make clucking noises. Or it'll bang you across the mouth and get hysterical. Either way, you get hurt. It's Broadway. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. <laughs> It's a bet you make against the dealers at night, on the blood red of neon, on the black of the searching wind, and the circle spins a whirlpool of gleaming laughter and splintered whispers of shrieking steel and the silence of stone. You pray for a win, but it's no good. The red pays off in stained hands, and the black with dust in your mouth. That's how it falls on Broadway. My beat. <laughs> At four o'clock in the morning, Broadway is still. The spectaculars drowse and the neons yawn. The sounds of the city whisper into the darkness. <laughs> and last night's headlines fight a losing battle with the wind. Then... It's a burglar alarm from the flower shop and it's tearing its heart out. Cold, 
winking light of the florist sign found her face, then lost it in the shadows, then found it again. She sat primly in a wicker chair through which garlands of camellias and shining green leaves had been woven. Her hand had been pricked by the thorn of a rose she held. And when the lights found her eyes again, they were mocking and sly. Hey, hey, what's going on here, huh? Oh, hi, Danny. What makes? I heard a burglar alarm. Someone tripped it on their way out the back door. Oh, and left this dame here to heist rose petals? The drone and Meshikov do something for me. Sure, Danny. Want me to book her? Call Homicide. Tell them there's been a murder. Hi, this is incredible, Mr. Clover. Positively incredible. Wait till the Florist Association hears of this. I shall be blackballed. A girl has been murdered, Mr. Cup Lyman, in your shop. Is that all it does to you? Please, Mr. Clover, don't teach me manners. I've been catering to weddings and funerals all my life. Remind me to plant something in your lapel. You say you don't know this girl. No, no. Can't you do something about her, Mr. Clover? Move her or something? Oh, my beautiful blues. You take your filthy hands off those primroses. To me, Mr. Coupleheim. Pay attention to me. The primroses will have to fend for themselves. Ah, this is an outrage. Making a shambles of my garden. All because you can't solve a stinking murder of some burglar of a girl. Don't press me, Coupleheim. I could forget it says in the book I'm a gentleman. I know nothing about this, Mr. Clover. Why, why don't you inquisition my clerk? He closed the shop. He was here all evening. I've never trusted him, never. Nice boss you got, huh, Mr. Austin? The feeling mutual? There is mistrust and fright and kindness in all of us, Mr. Clover. Has it not been written in the book? Yeah. Yeah. What time did you close the shop, Mr. Austin? At 11. I always close it for Mr. Kuppelheim at 11. And this girl, we found her to be a Miss Joan Gale of the Dunhill Apartments. Does that mean anything to you? Nothing, I'm afraid. If she were a customer, I'd know it. I wait on people and deliver, and I have a good memory, Mr. Clover. This lady was never in our shop. Why should someone bring her here to kill her? Oh, uh, that's a wonderful question, Mr. Clover. I wonder you hadn't thought of it before. May I go home now? It hurts me to say this, but no. Your primroses will need you. And so it began. The questions and answers that a cop scribbles into his little black book. Against such a time when he can set up a file at headquarters labeled Joan Gale, Death by Murder. The coroner said she was killed by a bullet in her heart. That made me, all of a sudden, a philosopher. I had to inquire into what set of circumstances put the bullet there, at that time, in that place. The next morning, I went to the Dunhill Apartments because Joan Gale's purse said she lived there. I talked to a man because the yawning young woman at the desk just yawned and shook her head. Then yawned some more and pointed at a potted palm of the man sitting beside it who I should talk to. Good morning. My name's Danny Clover. Oh, that's nice. You got some beef, maybe? See the girl at the desk. I did. She's sleepy. Ah, you're a real quick lad. So? So that makes me an urban cop. A cop, huh? Well, that makes my name Frank Shepard, house man. Let's see your buzzer, friend, so I can have a genuine feeling about you. Yeah, here. Oh. I did something you don't like? Joan Gale. I want to look at her room. Okay, come on. She did something bad? Go ahead, shock me. What'd she do bad? She got murdered. Oh, bad as that, huh? That's sad, real sad. And here. Joint screams at you, don't it? It's too dark to tell. Turn on the lights, Frank. Sure. Better? Oh, blue lights. What do you know? That, uh, that means something? Does she have many friends, Frank? Callers? Tell you the truth about that, Clover. Joan Gale never made me look up from the racing form. Her friends neither. I wouldn't know. So, no gentleman callers. And I thought I was being clear as crystal. I wouldn't know. Who are you? All right, rummy, outside. Do you want to give this policeman a bad impression of Dunhill Apartments? Hey, wait a minute. Who's this guy, Frank? A refugee from 109 down the hall. He greets the gladsome day with a crock. Yesterday, he stumbled into Mrs. Stutman's room while she had her hair in a henna. Didn't you, John? 
Oh, sure, sure, me? <laughs> hey, uh, uh, tell your friend, mister, that today you met good old John. Oh, that makes you come want on. to fix my tie, huh? Come on, come on, good old John oh, boy, baby I pally. Bet. Outside, good, good, good old Frank boy. Good old Frank boy. I watched old Frank Boy push his pally on his face into Pally's home in 109. Then Frank Boy came back and was the model of a house dick with the economy size helping hand. We searched Joan Gale's apartment, found a lot of things. Things that pieced together the life of Joan Gale by night and by day. Things that made Frank Boy all happy inside. But there was nothing that added up to her dying in a bed of cut flowers. Back at headquarters, there were more fragments, more scraps of a woman's life. Sergeant Tataglia offered them to me. Uh, this is Joan Gale, Danny. She had a slight record in Scranton, PA. Hmm? For disturbances of the peace, for questioning, for, uh, you know, Danny. Yeah, the alibis of Kuppelheim and his clerk, Roy Austin. You had them checked? Oh, yeah, Danny, sure. It's just like this Mr. Kuppelheim and Mr. Austin told you. Kuppelheim was in the sack. The clerk, Roy Austin, closed up Kuppelheim's flower shop at 11 o'clock. Went home. To the knowledge of his landlord, did not leave the premises till you rousted him out of bed to question him at said Kuppelheim's flower shop. Hmm. How do you figure, Tataglia? You know, I'm glad you asked me, Danny, because I got a theory. Now, the way I picture this whole crime... Oh, for a is... second. Pardon me. Uh, surely, Danny. Go right ahead. Thank you. Danny Clover speaking. They told me you were handling the Joan Gale murder, Mr. Clover. I believe I can help you with it. Who is this? Mrs. Amelia Ripley. 1219 Smedley Place, in Forest Hills, Mr. Clover. I can expect you immediately? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Clover. Now, as I was saying that, my theory... Well, keep it on is... ice, Tartaglia. I'll come back for it. Yes? What is it? I'm Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Uh, Mrs. Oh, Ripley course. called... Oh, I'm Mrs. Ripley. Please come in. Thank you. You won't mind... Well, that is, I hope you won't mind if we sit in the kitchen and talk. Not at all. This way. You see, it's the maid's day off and I'm cooking. A hollandaise sauce on the stove, batter in the mix, master. Oh, looks about done. It's the sauce that needs attention. Uh, sit here, Mr. Clover. Thanks. You said something about Joan Gale, Mrs. Ripley. I never saw her in my life, Mr. Clover, but I knew her. I don't understand, but... Uh, have a cup of coffee, Mr. Clover. I knew her because my husband knew her. Oh, I see. Of course you don't see. My husband sees her and comes home to me. He comes home and strokes my hair and calls me wonderful names that I thought he'd forgotten. And he kisses me. Uh, Mrs. Ripley... I found out about Joan Gale months ago. I've always known it was a woman, but I just happened to find out her name was Joan Gale. Why are you telling me? Revenge is a funny word to be coming out of a housewife's mouth, isn't it? My husband is mixed up with a woman who's been murdered. I wonder whether I'm going to laugh or cry at what he suffers for it. It's important to me to know which I'll do. Pardon me. Where's your husband now, Mrs. Ripley? He called a few minutes ago. He said he was at his place of business. The Ripley shoe distributing business on East 37. Well, thanks, Mrs. Ripley. I'll talk to him. Well, I'll show you to the door. I I think I'm glad I talked to you, Mr. Clover. Oh, you did the right thing. Is this your husband? This picture on the bookcase? Yes, that's John. Good old John, he likes to call himself. Why, Mr. Clover? Does he drink? Why do you ask? Oh, but no, he doesn't drink. I'll say that for him. He doesn't touch a drop. Mm-hmm. Miss Clover, it looks bad for John, doesn't it? It's possible that he killed the girl, isn't it? It not only was possible, from where I stood, it looked like a sure thing. The picture of the John Ripley on the bookcase was the same good old drunken John who had tried to tie my tie in Joan Gale's apartment. The same drunken John who never drank, his wife said. I had to ask him about a little thing like that. About a lot of little things. Hmm. 
Ripley. Ripley. boxes of the Ripley shoe distributing business lay in a crazy, wanton pattern around the body of John Ripley. On his face was a loose, embarrassed grin, as if he were ashamed of his clumsiness, ashamed of not knowing how to handle shoe boxes, ashamed of his torn coat, his torn body, of the blood that crowded through the bullet hole in his chest. Now there was nothing to ask of good old John. Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> Listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway is a place that can get happy about a lot of things. A wrestler from Argentina who walks on his hands and wrestles with his feet. The honeymoon of Tess Trueheart. And a couple of murders served piping hot for dinner reading. It's the diet Broadway likes. It's a fine way to get fat. My part of it was serving up a few crumbs to the gentlemen in the press room. An arrest is expected momentarily, I told them, and dared them to make six paragraphs out of that. They did, and it came out saying the police had no idea who the killer was. Or, as Sergeant Tataglia phrased it, Danny... I don't have no idea who the killer is. Well, the last time I talked to you, Tartaglia, you said you had a theory about who killed Joan Gale and Mr. Ripley. Oh, uh, Danny, I got a confession to make. Confession, huh? You killed him? Ah, uh, no, Danny. I had a theory, and I put it down on paper and added and subtracted, and the answer comes out that they killed each other. Only they died 12 hours apart. That's interesting. How did you arrive at that? Well, you see, Danny... You got company, Danny. I've got to see you right away, Mr. Fogel. Oh, come in. Uh, Roy Austin, isn't it? Have a chair, Mr. Austin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Danny... Uh, don't go to Taglia. This is Mr. Austin. He's the clerk at Kappelheim's flower shop. Hi, Mr. Austin. How do you do? What can I do for you, Mr. Austin? I want you police to protect me. I... Yes, I demand it. Why, are you afraid of something? You would be, too. Here, read this. It was slipped under my door at my rooming house. Huh? Dear Roy Austin, make no plans, Mr. Austin, because you will die within a day. Who'd want to write you a note like this, you know? Of course I don't. That's your job, Mr. Clover. Doesn't that note tell you something? Not much, except that whoever wrote it tried to disguise his handwriting. That's pretty obvious. Well, that may be, but it doesn't make me any the less frightened. Mr. Austin, the department will give you all the protection you need. How? Uh, one of our men will follow you wherever you go and will... That's see... not enough. I refuse to leave this building until you apprehend whoever wrote that note. Mr. Austin. I refuse to leave this building. Okay. Okay. We'll lock him up, Detective. Uh, sure, Danny. Sure. Hey, Mr. Austin. Uh, you play canasta? Uh-uh. Idiot's delight. Oh, no game, huh? Well, maybe you can teach me. Where are you going, Danny? To the Dunhill Apartments. There's a house detective there i got to see. Maybe he can teach me. <laughs> the idea of busting in, comrade. For this, you can get your face slapped, comrade. Turn around, Frank. I've got a complaint. I said turn your merry-go-round chair around. <laughs> the man with the buzzer. No offense, Clover. It's just I don't like things sneaking up behind my back. Complaint? Yeah, big complaint. You. I'm a cooperative kind of louse, Clover, but not that cooperative. Explain it to me first. First, tell me how Mrs. Shepard's little boy has been naughty. Maybe you ought to stand up when I talk to you, Frank. <laughs> My words won't have so far to go. Sure, sure. Anything you say, Mr. Clover. See, I'm standing. <laughs> you gonna wrap my knuckles with a ruler, did you? That little play you staged to John Ripley. Four star, Frank. I liked it. Yeah, it was real sincere. Good old John. Play acts a fine drunk. On cue, too. You don't say. And all the time I thought good old John was crocked to the ears. 
You wasn't drunk, huh? Why did you throw him the cue, Frank boy? You've been working too hard, detective. Why did you do that, Frank boy? Why did you tell Ripley I was a cop before he needed to know? Why did you tell him to act drunk so it could look like a big, boozy mistake is coming into Joan Gale's apartment? You need a place to lay your head, detective. Answer me, Frank boy. Answer me. An answer? <laughs> you were crowding me. Thanks, Frank boy. I was praying for that. <laughs> That's enough. That's enough. You didn't ask my question, Frank. You saw a chance for blackmail, didn't you? A big, fat blackmail. I told you Joan Gale had been murdered. You knew John Ripley was her boy, so you arranged the act. Did he pay off before he was murdered, Frank, because you were so nice to him? Ripley murdered? News to you, Frank? Cross my heart. Hope to die. I, I didn't know about it. It had nothing to do with it. What you had to do with Frank. Tell me about that. It was like you say. Ripley was slipping me a little gratuity all along because he didn't want nobody to... Know about the Gale thing. When she was killed, the price went up for gratuities. That's all. Did you get it? Yeah, from his wife. He, he didn't have her with him that night you was here. He, he he called his wife. She paid me off, took him home. Don't tease me, Frank, boy. Oh, I swear it. I swear it on a stack. She took him home. The last time I saw Ripley, his wife was scratching his eyes out, and, and he was crying on my honor, Danny. Yeah, get up off the floor, Frank. I want you to look nice for the boys at headquarters. <laughs> Frank didn't look nice for the boys at headquarters. A guy like that could spend three hours with a barber, then dress in custom-tailored clothes, and still he wouldn't look nice. Before I left headquarters, I looked in on the Canasta game between Tataglia and Roy Austin, then took a ride out to the housewife, Mrs. Ripley. I couldn't make up my mind whether to be sorry for her. I wasn't sure whether she had anything to be sorry about. I suppose you expected to see me in tears, Mr. Clover. I wasn't sure. Just how do you feel about your husband's death? Relieved, I think. Clean. If you've got any conscience about lying to policemen, you've got to feel some remorse, too. And you lied. You didn't tell me about paying blackmail and bringing your husband home. I didn't tell you, so I didn't lie. We can group it under the general heading. Maybe this will do something to you, Miss Ripley. You're in a lot of trouble. How? How am I in trouble? You're a murder suspect. Oh, oh. you'd be surprised, Mrs. Ripley. We've had other coffee drinkers murder people. Even a file on murderers who made fine hollandaise sauces. Well, but why should I... Why do murderers kill? You had the motive. Joan Gale, because she got along so well with your husband. Your husband, because he got along so well with Joan Gale. Mr. Clover, listen to me. All right. Mr. Clover, I first suspected my husband when he made an unnecessary trip to Scranton. Scranton, huh? Yes. John's business interested me. I knew all about it. So I knew he didn't have to go to Scranton on business. Go on. When he came back, he suddenly started to send me flowers. Just like that. Flowers. Several times a week. That way I knew exactly when he saw Joan. By the flowers. Flowers, huh? I suddenly make a stab in the dark. Flowers from Kuppelheim. Yes. Yes, that's right. Then, when my husband was in trouble at the hotel, I went there and did what you said I did. Simply because once I married John... You did that, then? I brought him home. He told me everything that happened between Joan Gale and himself. Everything. Uh-huh. Then he left. Then I called you. I called you because there was the matter of my self-respect. You're telling me you didn't shoot either one? I didn't. There's a grocery store on the corner, Mrs. Ripley. You can go that far so you can get your coffee. I'm going where there's flowers. There might be an unfilled order there. Maybe you'll get some. Uh, heavens have brought me in a torment, Mr. Clover. My heart bleeds for you, Kuppelheim. Put those paddles down and talk. Ah, it's no good. You've upset me so. A coming out to size. Just massacred. How long have you had John Ripley for a customer? Uh, John Ripley? The shoebox murder keys? Oh, yeah. See, that is a thrilling thing. How long was he your customer? Well, he began coming in about the time that clerk of mine started working for me. Roy Austin? Yeah. Oh, they got along famously, those two. Always whispering about something or other. Then Mr. Ripley would place a very big order. <laughs> I didn't really mind their whispering behind my back. When did Roy Austin come to work for you? Why, Mr. Clover? Why do you ask? Is he in trouble? 
<laughs> I told you I didn't trust him. Uh, don't drool at the mouth, couple. I'm just answering my question. When did Austin come to work? Uh, uh, it was about three weeks ago. He came to me with a letter of recommendation from some queasy little shop in Scranton. I took the chance anyhow because I needed help so desperately. Scranton. Do you have the letter? Yes. <laughs> yes, of course I have. Wait a minute, I'll find it here. Let's see. Hey. Ah, yes, you did. <laughs> here you are. Hmm. I've seen this handwriting before. Where's your phone, couple? It's right here in the counter. It's a business phone, Mr. Clover. Yeah, all right, I owe you a nickel. Here, here, what? Hmm. All right, all right. Not too long. Sergeant Tartaglia. Danny Clover, keep Austin happy, Tartaglia. I'm coming up to talk to him. Oh, you can't do that, Danny. I'm not here. I finally persuaded him it was safe he should go home. What? Sure, Danny, sure. I talked to him until he should go home. Took a lot of my most clever ruses, but I finally convinced him. Hello, Jules. You call headquarters, Danny. What's up? Maybe a guy who asked protection of the police, Mugovan, just to throw the police off balance. Huh? Maybe a killer. Let's go to this corner house. Hey, Danny, look. I just don't jump off the fire escape. Hey, that's him, Muggerman. Come on. In the alley. I drop him. No, I'll fire over his head. Austin! Austin, stop! Hey, he ain't playing. Here he goes, Danny. Turn him down to that avenue. Yeah. We gotta catch him, Muggerman. We can't shoot in this crowd. Hey, hey, look, Danny. Into the building. He's running in there. I see him. In here. I will mean. I beg your pardon, lady. Did a man just come in here? A man in a gray sweater? In and through that door on the other side of the platform. Thanks. Stay here, Margaret. Don't let him get out this way. Yeah, Daddy, sure. Austin! I'm up here, Mr. Clover. Somewhere here in the darkness. Think you can find me before I kill you? His voice plunged down at me, down through the shadows, down the long flight of stairs. Roy was in darkness. That was the advantage he had. Every other step I took was lit up by the screaming light of a big electric sign flashing revival tonight. It shouted through the window. Revival tonight. Still alive, Mr. Clover? I'm still alive. Only one piece, Mr. Clover. For how long, Roy? <laughs> What's the matter, Mr. Clover? Out of bullet. Not a trick, is it? Because it'll do you no good. Come down, Roy. My gun's empty. Come to me. Mr. Clover, up these stairs. Come to me. Pray, Mr. Clover. Pray for salvation. Because I'm going to hasten your death with this gun. Because you're a sinner. Joan Gale was a sinner too, wasn't she, Lord? Yes, yes, she was. She was my wife, Stratton. Did you know that? No. Yes, she was. She was good. Until Satan came for her. That would be John Ripley. Satan? He took her away from me. And then he came back. And he told me where she was. Because he knew I would kill her. Because I am just. And the wages of sin are death. Then you killed Ripley. Satan. And now you, Mr. Clover. But you must accept death with innocence. Like the lamb. Throw your gun on the floor, Mr. Clover. Yeah. I'll do that, Roy. Here. Roy! When I got to him, he was dead. His body lay crumpled and broken at the bottom of the stairwell. On his face, the last drop of ecstasy. The ecstasy he'd reserved for his own dying. When they came for him, 
It was still there. But frozen now, different now. Like some leering mask of evil. <laughs> The night slips over Broadway like a black silk stocking splashed with sequins. And Broadway is as flashy as a showgirl on an after-theater date. But it'll be daytime in a few hours, and Broadway will wear a sleazy house dress and stand on street corners, screaming. Day or night, it wears any face you look for. It's Broadway. My beat. My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Irene Tedrow, Jerry Hausner, Howard McNear, Edgar Barrier, Herb Vigran, and Jack Crucian. The FBI in Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS three weeks from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a journey some people have to make. A journey that ends in a screaming, blinding furnace of light, or ends in darkness, cool and still. You walk it with a quick puppet strut of slapstick, or you walk it slow. Slow, like the last walk you'll ever take. Whatever way it is, it's my beat. Broadway is full of people that are like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. One of them, if you put them together right, will turn out to be Jed Stacy, scandal reporter for a rag that reports scandals. If it's a hot August evening and he's wearing his Hollywood shirt and yellow silk mohair pants, $90 the outfit, he'll buy you a free meal for a price. Jack. Bring us prosciutto with melon, vichyssoise, shrimp roulette, and a decent white wine. You got that? We shall stick to you. Uh, okay, Jed. Why the banquet? Ah, uh, you know me, don't you, Danny? I don't give nothing for nothing. I don't get nothing for nothing. Yeah, it's life, like Jock says. Yeah. Look, Danny, I got a note in the mail today, a typewritten note. I want to read it to you. Something you wrote? No, this has class. <laughs> here's what it says. Dear columnist, if you need a prophecy, here's a prophecy. A girl, Jane Darnell, will be found murdered tonight. That's a prophecy. Now, just checking, Danny. You got a corpse named Jane Darnell? No. Give me that note. Give it to me. Sure, sure. Here, Danny, I'm through with it. It'll be in my column tomorrow anyway. It's all set up. Why didn't you give me this before? Ah, uh, you know, it's scribes, Danny. We clutch things to our bosom. Besides, what good would it do you? If Jane Darnell is going to be killed, how would you stop it? You'd play nursemaid to a murder for a beat, wouldn't you, Jed? You're getting too large, kid. Too large. Take it easy, Danny. First, you got to find the little lady. It's a tough thing to do. Even for a guy like you, it's a tough thing. There's a telephone call for you, Monsieur Stacy. No, thanks, Jack. Plug it in here, will you? Yeah, uh, we, oui, Monsieur. Excuse me, Danny. Yeah? Yeah, this is Stacy. Where? Okay. Yeah, you get a fin. Yeah, the same to you. Come on, Danny. We're going someplace? Yeah, to the room of a Jane Dowell. She's asleep in it, Danny. Dead asleep. Just like I prophesy in tomorrow's column. In here, Lieutenant. Right over there on the bed. Yeah, Sergeant, I see. Strangled, huh? With a silk stocking. I'm not a guy who knows about a thing like this, Danny, but it looks like the murder weapon is a pretty inferior piece of merchandise. Buck 98 will get you three pairs. Take your hands off that stocking, Judd. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, Danny. Police methods. Uh, I should have known better. Okay, Sergeant, give me the rundown. 
Uh, call from the landlady at 8.10 p.m. Yeah. Landlady's story is follows. She returned here at 5 after 8, and then she... Where'd she return from? Corner bar. She spent the afternoon there singing Ghost Riders in the Sky and nursing the 10-cent beer for six hours. And they threw her out at 8 sharp. Here we check. Go on. Well, the landlady knocked at the door of Jane Darnell, the deceased. Upon receiving no answer, she walked in and found the deceased thus. I mean, like so. Uh, I mean, oh, okay, okay. Where's the landlady now? I peeked across the hall when we came in, Danny. Yeah. There's a little old lady sitting in a rocker with a compress on a little wrinkled forehead and a little wrinkled nose on top of a big, big bottle. Landlady, huh? Yeah. Right in here, lady. Come on, right in this room. <laughs> Take your oh, hands oh. off of me. I've been walking a long time without your help. Who's this, officer? Yeah. A man who says he lives here. A man who My says name his name is... Mac Taylor. What's going on here? Okay, officer, that's all. What's your business here, Mr. Taylor? I live here. Now answer a question for me. What's this all about? Did you know Jane Darnell? Oh, my Shirley. She takes two hours every Saturday night in the bathroom. And she is the... Oh, that's her over on the bed. What's the matter with her? She's dead. Murdered. <laughs> Murdered? But who did it? Now, Mr. Taylor, there's millions of people in New York. A little while ago, one of those millions of people came into this room and wrapped a silk stocking around Jane Darnell's neck. The person who did that was the person who murdered her. Do you know who it was, Mr. Taylor? <laughs> Mr. Taylor didn't. She was just the other rent here in the boarding house as far as he was concerned. She never even smiled at him, he said. Man, you'd have to be mighty strange to kill a girl for that, he assured me. I assured him he'd better stick around. Then I went home and had indigestion all night from the meal Judge Stacy ordered that I never ate. The next morning, I spent the first two hours mulling over what I had in the murder of Jane Donnell. It came to two things. All I had was a girl in the morgue and a typewritten note saying she'd be there. Or, as Sergeant Tartaglia put it... All we got, Danny, is a girl in the morgue and a typewritten note saying she'd be there. Tartaglia, would you mind repeating that? Oh, sure, Danny. I said all we got oh, is never a... Never mind. Anything on that typewritten note, Jed Stacy gave me? Kind of typewriter, stationery? Well, typed on a Corona Portable, a new model. Cheap, great, of stationery, the five and ten cent store stuff. Uh, routine check, turn up anything? No, well, not yet. I can't find a thing on this, Jane Darnell. No friends, no relatives, nothing, Danny. Well, it looks like this will be a tough one for us to crack. It'll take time, Zartaglia, but it'll crack. <laughs> Danny Clover speaking. What? Who is this? Zartaglia. Trace this call. Yeah. yeah. Who is this speaking? I, I can't hear you. Speak louder, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I got that. When? Who is this speaking? Hello? Hello? Oh. What? What? Oh, look, operator. I was talking to someone and we were cut off. Huh? I see. Well, thank you, operator. Battaglia! Calm and efficient service. You trace the call? Oh, sure. Well? Well, what? You traced it to a phone booth in Grand Central Station. Oh, fine. That call was important? Tartaglia, I was just speaking to a murderer. Yeah? Well, why did he have this... Uh, a murderer? Yeah, a murderer who was disguising his voice. He had to say just this. He had to say he did quite a job on Jane Darnell, and tonight he was going to do a better one on a friend of hers. A friend named Mary Smith. Mary Smith? Hey, I know a Mary Smith. Which Mary Smith, Danny? Which Mary Smith? <laughs> Taglia was right. In a city of eight million, what chance do you have of finding a Mary Smith? If it's the Mary Smith who's going to be struck down by a murderer, the odds are precisely one in eight million. You come up with Mary Smith, all right. You trace one of them to Sing Sing, where she was doing 20 years for dynamiting a bank. Another Mary Smith left her husband's bed and board in Poughkeepsie. And you talk to a Mary Smith who says... Oh, uh, Mr. Smith, my name's Mary Smith, and I know a secret. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had So you try again. Oh, forgive me, sir, for have kept you waiting. It wasn't my hour for meditation. Uh, are you Mary Smith? Yes. Of course I am Mary Smith. In China, my name is Lesu. But since I am in America, I have adopted a name that is 100% American. Uh, Mary Smith. Uh, and do you know a Jane Darnell? No... No, I am sure I do not. Jane Darnell. Oh, Americans I have such a strange name. Yeah. Danny! Hey, Danny, hop in. 
I want to take you someplace where maybe you ought to be. Move your hearse out of the way, Jed. I might scrape the polish with my shabby squad car. Oh, now, Danny, you don't like me anymore. That hurt. I like you. Now, will you move your car? They told me at headquarters you'd be here. Now, look, if you check with me, I could have saved your wear and tear, Danny. I'll make a note. Always check with Jed Stacy. You'll save your wear and tear. Or maybe I can buy it tomorrow for a nickel. You're fighting me, boy. You're fighting me. Get out of my way. You got nothing to say to me. Nothing I want to hear. You want to hear this, Danny? The Mary Smith you're looking for, I know where she is. Where? But we're still friends, I'll tell you where. Cut it down to a number in a street. Ten, we're 16, Danny. A sorted walk-up, a scabrous... How do you know so much, paper boy? Anonymous phone call, Danny. Anonymous voice. Voice gives me address and particulars. Particulars? Anonymous girl named Mary Smith. Now we're friends again, huh, Danny? Huh? <laughs> Miss Smith. Miss Smith. Open up, Miss Smith. It's the police. Maybe you should open it yourself, Clover. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Smith. The girl named Mary Smith was home. She wasn't anonymous anymore. The scrawl of blood on her clean cotton dress gave her an identity. And the ice pick thrust deep into her throat was like an ugly pin that held her in one place in one time. And death hadn't yet washed away the torture and the strain and the horror that was frozen in the carved lines of her body. The draft from the door I had crashed open moved her hair in gentle whirls away from her face. Then I saw her hand holding something tight, like a claw it held onto it tight. It was a typewritten note. It said, What girl next, police? What girl next? I give you a riddle. There were two that will be three. Who will it be? Who will it be? You are listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Those two outstanding adventure shows, Escape and Crime Photographer, will bring you new thrills, new chills, just a little later tonight. Casey, Crime Photographer, will encounter a wealthy stamp collector, his two sons, and a strange murder in Death of a Stranger. Escape will present another Thursday thriller in Red Wine by Lawrence Blockman. This Thursday, every Thursday, here Escape and Crime Photographer on most of these same CBS network stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. Broadway all depends on the mood you're in. You can be part of the mob and perform for the sightseers, or you can write notes about murdering women and go about your business of murdering. In the latter case, Broadway dangles from strings. Broadway performs for a madman. It puts on a mask of horror and talks in whispers. Two people had died violently, and the clues I had for their dying were about as valuable as a pinch of dust. Correction, I had a thing of value. Another note. What girl next, the note said. It would be valuable if I knew what girl next. The only ray of sunshine at headquarters next morning was a police sergeant named Tartaglia, who did all sorts of remarkable things with details and file cards and pencil sharpness. Morning, Danny. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Yeah. What have we got, Sir Tegrion? Well, I checked Judge Stacy, like you said. Mm hmm? Yeah, he's got a pretty good alibi. He was with you at the approximate time of both murders. Only approximate. How long does it take to kill a person? Hey, what did you find on that border, Mac Taylor? Oh, he's got an answer for every question we ask him. Right now, we're still checking the answers. So far, Mac Taylor's been telling the truth. Okay, okay. Uh, What's in that envelope? Oh, in this envelope, Danny, intelligence from the FBI. No, but Los Angeles is still operating. It's a wonder they have the time. Let's see it. Yeah, sure, here. You know, on account of we didn't have any data on Jane Darnell and Mary Smith, I wired the prints down to Washington like I... Uh, like you should have. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this data you're holding was wired back. Hey, those boys in Washington sure work. Hey, look at this, Tom Huh? A link. A link between Jane Darnell and Mary Smith. Washington had their prints because they worked in a war plant. That tells you something, Danny? Maybe. Maybe a lot. They both worked for the same outfit, the Westfall Tool Company. 
a manufacturing firm across the river in Jersey. Get my hip boots, Tartaglia. I'm going to take a boat ride. What do you want to see me about, mister? I'm Danny Clover, New York Police Department. Oh, glad to know you. I'm Freddie Nay, Punch Press Department. You've been working in this department long, Mr. Nay? Oh, ten years. Why? Try this in your memory. Jane Darnell and Mary Smith. What does that do to you? Jane Darnell, Mary Smith? Uh, J- oh, yeah, yeah, that does something to me, all right. Yeah, they worked here side by side in my department. Uh-huh. Right through the war and after we converted automobile parts. And what else? Well, they quit about a year ago, within a week of each other. Within a week of each other, huh? How would that figure, Mr. Nay? Oh, they were chummy. Jane Darnell and Mary Smith were in a carpool with another girl. All three of them rode to work in Jane's car. This uh, other girl, who was she? I don't know. She wasn't in my department. Does your personnel department keep records of people who ride together in carpools? No, never did. We got all the paperwork we can handle. Yeah. Where's the phone? Right over there. Thanks. Uh, can I get an outside line on this? Sure. I guess that's about all I can tell you about those two, Mr. Clover. Well, maybe it was enough. Hello? Motor vehicles? Any registration? Anything else, Mr. Clover? No, that'll be all. Uh, registration? This is Danny Clover. Want the make and the model of a car owned by Jane Darnell. Uh, yeah, motor number two. You sure there's nothing else, Mr. Clover? I, uh, I enjoy aiding and abetting the police. I said that's all. You can go now. Yeah? Yeah? DeSoto Sedan, 1947. Motor number 137596. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Get the operator to connect me with Sergeant Tartaglia at headquarters. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh, Tartaglia? Danny Clover, a uh, detail, Tartaglia. A rush job. Fast enough maybe to save a girl's life. Now get this. A DeSoto Sedan, 1947. Motor number 137596. Registered in the name of Jane Darnell. Find it, Tartaglia. Find it fast. Now all there was was to wait. Wait while the life of a girl ticked away. A nameless girl in a nameless place. And the girl without the name watched as she waited, her face veiled in the gauze of terror. And her eyes piercing the veil with hatred because all you could do was wait. There were two that will be free, the note said. And three is a number that can add up to death. And a motor has a number that can add up to... And then suddenly the waiting was over. They traced the number. Traced it to a littered, junk-strewn yard presided over by a frightened little man wearing a beret. I do not know why suddenly I am a matter for the police. I, I have done everything as it was told me to. Oh, well, don't worry about it, Mr. Uh... Uh, Stern, David Stern. Yeah. They tell me here in America that there is dignity in dealing with junk, so I deal in it. But with the police, dignity becomes sour. It'll sweeten up, Mr. Stern. Give us a chance. Oh, I, I, I did not mean that. I, I mean, what I mean is not insult, only an analysis, sir. A philosophical diagnosis. That's too deep for me, Mr. Stern. Some other time. Where's the car? Uh, you mean the one that the policeman in the uniform checked its number on its internal anatomy? I mean the one... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the one I mean. Internal anatomy? <laughs> it's right here to your left. You see? A heap of junk? <laughs> the police are interested perhaps in buying from you, boss. The hubcaps are still nice and the carburetor... When was this brought in, Mr. Stern? Oh, just about a year ago. I, I remember because, you see, I remember the personality of machines. Now, this one is the victim of complete nervous shock. Hmm, it looks like it was in a wreck, a, a bad wreck. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's what brought on this psychosis. But in, in good hands, with good treatment, this could recover. It may be. Uh, yeah, well, thanks, Mr. Stern. Thanks. Maybe I ought to start going to night school. Ah, uh, you said something? Danny, Hi. welcome. 
welcome to police transcripts and records. Your presence is like a shaft of light in a warehouse of darkness. Caswell, will you do something for me and not have it come out an epic? This will take much doing. What's your pleasure, Danny? Open a window. How do you guys breathe in here? Sergeant Down? Yeah, Caswell. Open a window. Danny can't breathe. Ah, that was thrilling how you did that, Sergeant Downs. You may now go back to your typewriter. Anything else, Danny? I could fan you with this fan, courtesy Huxley's mortuary. Oh, thanks. A little closer, Coswell. Uh, fine. Mm. Now get me everything you've got on an automobile accident. This car, about a year ago. Sergeant Downs? Uh, you get it, Coswell. I'll hold the fan. Your command is like a caress, Danny. Never mind, Downs. I shall get it. Oh, by the way, Danny, there's a gentleman sitting over there. been waiting for you. Gentleman by the name of Jed Stacy, shall I present you? Get the dope on the accident now, as in right now. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Sir. What do you want, Jed? Oh, it's not what I want, Danny. It's what my syndicate wants. You know, columnists, no life of their own. Is that why you're always around when people die? So you can gloat? I didn't hear you say that, Danny. I'll make like I didn't hear it. Now, Danny, my syndicate is curious whether you found out who the number three girl's going to be. I bleed for you and your syndicate. You told me about the other two, Jen. How come you don't have a private line on this one? Danny, I got it all by myself. I Read it for me, Coslow. Just the words without the hand. How else? Accidents involving this car, May 10th, 1948, crashed into by Mrs. Mildred Quimby. Mrs. Quimby was killed. Who was in the DeSoto when it happened? Three girls, Jane Darnell, Mary Smith, and Sally Webb. So you got an address on this Sally Webb? Most assuredly. 417 West 55th. We also got pictures of the whole mess. You may have them if you want them, Danny, without signing. Take back your fan, Coslo. You earned it. Sally Webb, eh? That's the girl my syndicate wants. Do they now? Print this, Jed. Print it and I'll tear you apart. So long, Jed. <laughs> I don't believe you, Mr. Clover. I don't believe you. Why should anyone want to murder me? We're dealing with a madman, Miss Webb. A madman who makes his own reasons. But me? Why me? I I never hurt anyone or anything in my life. Maybe Jane Darnell and Mary Smith were like that, but they were killed. I hardly knew them. I just rode with them to work. We had nothing in common outside of that. You had this in common, Miss Webb. You were in an accident in which a woman was killed. Oh, she was killed. Can she rise from the dead to murder me for that? Someone who loved her very much might want to kill you because he holds all of you responsible for her death. Oh, then why don't you catch him, put him in a cage, rip him into shreds, and, well, do something, something. Miss Webb, that, that picture on your bureau, who is it? My boyfriend, why? How long have you known him? Oh, a few months. You expecting someone? No. Let him in. Let them in, Sally. Sally, I found this envelope addressed to you in your mailbox. I brought it up. Is it all right? Give it to me, little girl. Huh? Oh, give it to him, Mary. And, uh, you better go now. All right, Sally. Sorry I haven't time to be polite, Sally. Mind if I see what's in the envelope? Thanks. Here, read it, Sally. And the third is Sally Webb. At 8 o'clock tonight, it's Sally Webb. Spin, Sally. Spin to... Eight o'clock, and it's done. The same cheap paper, the same type, the same pattern. Now do you believe it, Sally? Oh, yes. Yes, help me, Mr. Clover. Please help me. If you'll help me. How? Just tell me how. Sally, I want you to spend the rest of the day as you would spend any other day. One of our men will be with you all the time. You'll never see him. You're not to look for him. But I want you back here before eight o'clock, understand? Before eight o'clock. Oh, I'm frightened, Mr. Clover. I'm frightened. The only way, Sally... You wanted him in a cage? That's where you'll be, just like you said. In a cage. So the trap was set. Sally Webb, the bait. New York Police Department, the hunter. The hunted? Somebody in that jungle city. Somebody crouching now in a dark corner until another time of killing. The man I had tail Sally Webb called in every half hour. From a dress shop, a fruit store, from a laundromat. Places like that. Then about seven o'clock, the trap began to shape itself. A police cordon thrown around the block on West 55th Street where Sally lived. And a few minutes before 8, I was standing in a doorway next to the address. And the trap was ready to be sprung. Hmm. How about those, Lieutenant? How about north and south of 55th Street? They covered? Yes, sir. No one gets through in 8th or 9th. Except the girl. Except the girl, Sergeant. And whoever might be following her. 
Uh, how about our boy, the one you assigned to Taylor? He's got orders to drop out of the corner of 9th and 55th. Oh. Now get this, Sergeant. I want your men in uniform to stay out of sight. Plain clothes, as inconspicuous as possible. No noise. Yes, sir. That's what I told the men. But who's that? What chowderhead was stupid enough to use his siren? That's probably the problem for you, sir. He's siren hat. Well, I hope he's going to be happy pounding the cement and flushing. Hey, Lieutenant, that girl who just came out of the subway entrance. That's her, Sally Webb. The plan's just to just about eight. She's walking off the scene. She's scared. Scared. She's inside. See? The lights just went on. Let's go, Sergeant. Miss no, no. Webb, it's Danny Clo. Oh. Danny Cloak. Lieutenant. Yeah. She's dead. She's dead, Sergeant. Close your eyes and try real hard to believe it. She's dead. But I don't understand. How could you... Coroner will call it a long, sharp weapon. The coroner's jury can blame me for it. What are you talking about, Lieutenant? The subway. The one place I forgot about. The one place where she'd be with a thousand people and still be alone. She was stabbed on the subway. She had just enough strength to get inside her door. What are you doing, Sergeant? Oh, well, this stuff must have spilled out of her purse when she came over. Just junk, though. Lipstick, cigarettes. What's that? The piece of paper you're holding? Nothing, I guess. Just a piece of paper. Oh, wait. Something's typed on it. Huh? Read it. Uh, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of his country. I love you, I love you, I love you. Let's see that. Hmm? The letterhead says Ridley's Department Store... Furnishings for your every need. Get me a squad car, Sergeant. I got a feeling Ridley's is going to furnish my every need. Interested in a typewriter, Mister? Oh, I didn't know you worked here, Mac. Mac Taylor, isn't it? The indignant boarder who lived across the hall from Jane Donnell? Uh, yes, this is my place of business. The typewriter department. Yeah. I've got a time card, employee's number, everything. I sell them. You want to buy one? Uh, some other time. Which corona did you type those murder notes on? Huh? Hey, what, what do you mean? Sally Webb really loved you, didn't she, Mac? I got proof positive of that. She put your picture on her bureau, and she hung around here and wrote love notes in your demonstrated typewriter. So? Tell me something, Mac. Why did you change your name from Quimby to Taylor? We've got a doctor in this department store, Clover. Uh, maybe you need to see him. I have a picture of Mildred Quimby, my wife. What do you know about Mildred Quimby? I said I have her picture, Mac. Here. Oh, she was killed in an automobile accident. Look at it, Mac. Go on, look at it. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Like they killed my wife. Like I killed all of them. I'll kill you. Mac, put away that gun. This place is filled with people. What do I care about people? My wife is dead. Watch out. Hey, dead man's got a gun. Get out. Get out. Get out. That man's a killer! Come on, get me, Clover! Yeah. There's only one way to get you, Mac. Clover, you can't miss. A madman lying in the butt of his death isn't much different from any man who dies in violence. There was a kind of furious serenity on the face of Mac Taylor or Quimby, as though all at the same time he rejected and embraced the peace that a tearing bullet had offered his brain. They took him away, then someone swirled a mop over the blood-stained tile of the floor. And that was the requiem for a madman. Broadway is a street of sounds. The hissing sound of the neon, the sweet sound of a girl's laugh, the harsh, rasping sound of the light deep inside the earth, and the other sound, the sigh, the painful sigh no one hears. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my feet. Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station for 
Broadway's My Beat. The launching of a promising career as a singer, a bunch of yellow roses from an admirer, a single sniff of their aroma, and sudden death. These are the events that launch Mr. Keene, himself a promising career man, as sleuth in one of his most fascinating cases tonight. Mr. Keene's latest adventure, The Yellow Rose Murder Case, follows immediately over most of these same faces. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The FBI in peace and war, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS two weeks from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat. With Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, where you can take a bus ride into the summer evening and make believe it's a dreamboat. Then, Broadway's as innocent and nostalgic as carousel music. But if you walk, you can get hit in the face by a guy fishing for nickels under a grating. Then you can't make believe anymore. But either way, it's Broadway. My feet. to Silk Bergen. Him, the heat couldn't box. There wasn't enough of it. Silk was a jockey, about five hands high, with a wet saddle he might have scaled one ten. He waved to me from the doorway of a haberdashery store. In here, Dad. In the store. Yeah, Silk. Sure. I've been waiting. <coughs> I said I've uh, been waiting for you to pass by, Danny. What's the matter with your voice, Silk? You're down to a whisper. Laryngitis had it for a week. Hey, uh, Danny, I want that you should meet a friend of mine. Joe Murdoch. Yes. Say some hello to Danny Clover, Joe. Hello, Mr. Clover. Joe. Joe, six foot six and speaks like a tenor. <laughs> you should know about things like that, Danny. Is it possible? I, Joe, uh, huh? go buy me a shade over there. I gotta talk to Danny. Sure, Silk. And uh, the lavender and the polka dot. The dot, Joe, the dot. <laughs> Can you hear me good, Danny? My voice has got so far to go from down here from me to up there to you. I'll listen close. What's in your mind? I want you to... I, I said, I said, do me a favor, huh? About the key. Why didn't I think of it myself, about the key? What key, Silk? Well, I'm riding a race down to Maryland tomorrow. You see, I don't know how long I'll be gone. Now, you understand? Oh, that key. What key, Silk? The key for the locket. At the LaGuardia plane terminal. Oh, now I know. That key for that locker. Huh? I got a parcel check there. I ain't got time to run down for it now. It's against the dawn, Phil. Yeah, it sure. So if I ain't back tomorrow night, how about having one of your boys who's on duty down there pick it up, huh? Yes. And you hold it for me. Yeah. That'll save me rental, and it'll make us even for them riding lessons. I'll give you an incentive prize. <laughs> okay, so You're the key. Uh, thanks, Danny. Now, uh, don't lose. Now, uh, don't worry about it. I'll put it right here on my ring. By the way, what's in the parcel? <laughs> Just some of my riding silk, Danny. <laughs> what else does a jockey own? I patted silk from the head, did him a fond yikes, and mushed back into the tropical heat of Broadway. Tropical was an illusion that wasn't hard to believe. The crushed pineapple and papaya stands, the coconut milk and real whiskered coconuts, the sly grinning beat of the native drums heard through wilting loudspeakers, the girls, the luminous girls in their grass sandals and 14th Street sarongs. Then one whose lips looked as if they'd been painted with wild strawberries stopped me and kept me from my appointed rounds. I didn't mind. I'm so honest. I don't have a price of a dream and I'm honest. Here. You dropped this. What? This hundred dollar bill. 
You dropped it. Take it before it burns through my hand. A uh, hundred dollars. Wasn't I the careless one? Must have been in that cracker jack box they just threw away. Never throw anything away, Mr. Clover. There can be a prize in each and every package. That's a hard thing to remember. Will you help me try to remember, Mr. Ames? Bell Ames. Oh. Do you have any help, Mr. Clover? You're in for Bell Ames. That's cute. Very cute. Now, maybe I can do something for you, Bell. I had to give you back all this money you said I dropped. <laughs> all right. So I lied. All you have to do is believe you dropped that money and listen. See how easy it is? A hundred dollars and no pain. For a hundred, you can throw in a little pain. Who do I listen to? It's written on the bill. Marty wants to see you. Oh? Marty says it's easier to talk to people who have money. He likes people with money. He says they listen better that way. I'm a fool for psychology, Bell. Let's go listen to Marty. Not me, Mr. Clover. You. It's you he wants to listen. Hey, come back here. Bell, Bell, come back here. <laughs> The heat melted her into the crowd and then into a cab. And I was left standing there with the after scent of a perfume I'd never smelled before and a hundred dollar bill I'd never held before. I inhaled both of them. They added up to the acrid odor of a bride. I had to find out why. 42nd Street, the address on the bill said. And decided to walk. Somewhere between Broadway and the number I was looking for, the honky tonk started. And at the corner where women's high heels slack more slowly and the handouts become more frequent, I took a right turn into limbo. Two blocks down was what I was looking for. The last paddock hotel. Room 16. Come in. Right in. Your name, Marty? Yeah. Yeah, that's my name. And these are my boys, Tinker and Dolly. Say a greeting to the police boys. Police? Gee, police. Golly day. Yeah, boys are from out of town police like me. The word don't impress us. You gonna give me some more money, Marty? Maybe. Maybe money, maybe trouble. Guy has a hard time figuring which is which these days. What you trying to buy, Marty? Talk. I'm buying words like I'm an editor. <laughs> <laughs> Marty's a kid, can't he think of it? You're like a comedian. Your floor show stinks. Well, they ain't really working, police. So let's stop playing footy, how we got business, me and you. Mm. About an hour ago, police, a little guy hails you into a haberdashery shop. He's got a message for you. What kind of message did he have? You should have heard. All you need, Marty, is a long, thin ear. Hey, hey, the police is a kick, too, Dolly. A jolly boy, real jolly. What did Silksburg and tell you, police? Who? Now, look, I got time. Time, patience. Let's do it again. Silks Bergen, what did he tell you? You're looking for a tip on the horses? I got a tip. You're it. Funny, you look sad for a win. You look like hardly anything at all. Show him the gun, will you, Dolly? Yeah. Look, Mr. Police. This is a gun. Golly, you did. Let me have it, Dolly. Yeah. Here, Marty. Now, what did Silks Bergen tell you, police? Marty, you go to movies to see how guns will act in this kind of situation? Yeah. Yeah, in a movie. Now, how did you know? Dolly. Yeah? Show the police the second reel. Yeah, pleasure. A great big pleasure. You know the language better than that, police. You might say something. Your two muscles in your gun make me bashful. Stage fright, huh? <laughs> Dolly. Yeah. Hey, Tinker. This is fun. Yes, sir. You can play too, Tinker. Yeah. Such a jolly guy. <laughs> Playing movies with a jolly guy! <laughs> a jolly, jolly guy! <laughs> Somewhere a light going on and off made a big noise and a bigger hurt just in back of my eyeballs. It screamed at me from across the street and through a window hung with three stained drapes. I knew I was still in Marty's hotel room. I knew that hours had been thrown out of my light and thrown away. Then the light screamed again, and this time there were words. Big thousand watt words that said, Pearl Club, Delicious Dancing Girl. First one, then the other. And in between there was the creaking sound of a rocking chair. Then the rocking chair made words too. Don't hurry. It's rather pleasant here, sitting rocking in the dark, with that brazen sign throwing its naked, intermittent light. This gun gives me the right to introduce myself. I'm Gil Sherry. Oh. 
Shall I know you? Perhaps. I believe I'm in the classbook of one of our more venerated colleges. That's my identity. A piece of some Gil Sherry would make your reading for the boys of the old school tie, don't you think? I wouldn't know. Read me a chapter. I'm delighted. Chapter one begins. Early in life, I learned to love money. It was a symbol of the sordid life into which I'd fallen. Now, sitting in a bleak, villainous hotel room, my comrade, a detective, and a corpse. The corpse and the detective. Is that all me? <laughs> Not quite. You're the detective, true, and the corpse is the true corpse lying in the corner. Huh? And I believe he's a friend of yours, Mr. Clover. Silks. Silks. Yeah, rather fancifully named, don't you think? Silks Bergen. Proud, colorful name. But pride and color seem to have drained out of him. And he's ashamed of wearing bullet holes for his polka dots ought to be. He was a neat little guy. So? And he'd be pleased with death. Death is so precise. Closes your mouth, too. That wasn't smart of Marty. Marty realizes that. That's why I'm to keep watch over you. Until you open yours and tell us what Silks had to tell you, huh? Oh, by the way, here are your meager belongings. Yeah. Your wallet, a key ring, your badge, and a hundred dollar bill. Marty's orders. Huh? That's good of him. It's all there? Yeah, yeah. He said a hundred dollars like the words that hurt you. As I suggested, money is beautiful, Mr. Clover. Money buys money. Money is an ecstasy of an exquisite pain. Oh. Uh, Gil, I dropped the bill. Huh? If you pick it up for me, I'll let you hold it for as long as you want. Run. Touch it, Gil. Feel it. Oh, oh God, Gil. Yeah, Gil. And get there. <laughs> I'm not going to send my boys to college. The nose is break too. Took 15 minutes for the riot squad to clean up room 16. I booked Gil Sherry as an accomplice to murder. And the morgue booked Silk Bergen. The thing I had to do now was break a promise to a dead man. I couldn't wait until tomorrow to use Silk's key. The key that Marty didn't even notice. A half hour later, I was in the big waiting room at LaGuardia Field. American Airlines, DC-6, leaving at gate 5 to Chicago and Los Angeles. Loading at gate 4. Hiya, Lieutenant Clover. What brings you down here? You're an officer. Had any trouble? A uh, lot of thieves? No, only trouble was a three-year-old kid in a $400 cowboy suit screaming because he lost his nurse and chauffeur at the same time. Where's locker 147? 147? Uh, right over here, sir. Let's go. Now, let's try this key. Yeah, suitcase, Lieutenant. Yeah, pretty heavy. Nothing you're looking for? Hold on a second. Did I get this open? Holy! All that dough! Tens and fifties and hundreds. Yeah. What could be bought with that? It's been bought, officer. A lot of blood. Bought and paid for. <laughs> Listening to Broadway's My Beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Practically all of Casey, crime photographer's adventures are summed up in the title of tonight's show, Big Danger. If you haven't met this ace newspaper cameraman, his pretty assistant, and Ethelbert, the merry bartender, if you're looking for a top-rating thrill show, be sure to hear this latest of crime photographers' adventures. Along with Escape, which tonight will present Irvin S. Cobb's Snake Doctor, crime photographer is heard on most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. <laughs> Broadway is an animal that feeds on hot tips, a tip on a horse or a chopped liver sandwich. There are even parts to a hockey with scratch sheet giving odds on Broadway's being wiped off the face of the earth. And sometimes the tips pay off, like the one not to put your two bucks on jockey Stokes Bergen because Silks was dead and his handicap was a chest full of bullets. Or maybe his handicap was a heavy hundred thousand dollars left in a pasteboard suitcase in a public locker. It didn't make sense for Silks to have that kind of money. 
Even to same sensible, sensitive Sergeant Tartaglia, it didn't make sense. It don't make sense, Danny. Just with a hundred grand left kicking around. Ah, uh, that's not like him. Yeah. Uh, got a cigarette, Tartaglia? I put a carton in this desk drawer a week ago, and I haven't been able to open it since. Oh, here, let me try, Danny. It's stuck, Tartaglia. Just give me a cigarette. Danny, my wife, Mrs. Tartaglia, says I am the best opener of stuck drawers she ever saw. Give me a cigarette. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, here, Danny. Hey, how about some circus peanuts to munch while we're thinking? When do you have time to go to circus, Mr. Sergeant? Well, not me, not me, Danny. It wasn't me, it was my kid. Yeah, there was a street carnival on Mulberry Street, so it was my kid. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you know, for a minute there, Danny, I thought you were munching me out. All right. Playtime's over, Sergeant. We had any reports that anyone is shy a hundred grand? No, Danny. The money has been reported and either lost. Stolen or strayed. Did you check whether Silk made any bets or would have got him that kind of money? Yeah, Danny. The word from our school is that no bookies is out that kind of dope. Not out the Silks, anyway. The word also is that Silks didn't have a wrinkle deuce to bet on his own name. Yeah. Uh, what do we got on the man they call Marty? Well, not a thing. Aside from his autographed hundred dollar bill. Well, we can't find him, Danny. We can't place him from no place to no place. Hmm? Uh, Danny... You feel all right from that beating? I've had it better. Uh, Sergeant, what's on Bell Ames? Ah, uh, likewise. It's an empty day with a hole in it, isn't it, Chuck? Thank you. Yeah. Huh? If you want me, I'll be in Gil Sherry's cell. There must be somebody who can tell me something. Anything. <laughs> There's no need to humiliate me further, Mr. Clover. Being forced to talk to you is humiliation enough. Murder doesn't bother you, huh? As long as it's not mine. Dying can come to a man a lot of ways, Sherry. You could die as an accessory for Silk's murder. And there are so many things to prove, though, before I die, aren't there, Detective Clover? If you told us some secrets, you could maybe keep on living. That's as good as money sometimes. So, so that's why I keep my mouth shut. I'll breathe longer that way. You mean Marty will kill you if you talk to us? I'm not brilliant like you, Sherry, but it seems to me you lose either way. Man has few choices, but the destiny of Gil Sherry will spin itself out as Gil Sherry chooses. That's what my classbook said about me. Yeah, real profit, your classmate. Real profit. Here's the envelope of Sherry's belongings you asked for, Danny. No, thanks. I return your meager possession, Sherry. Your cigarette. Empty wallet, the fraternity pin, and... Hmm. This is interesting. Roll of tickets to Pelagus Shooting Gallery. You know Pelagus, Sherry? Pelagus, the ex-bookie? You shoot at his shooting gallery? Yeah, that's what I thought. Happy destiny, Sherry. Happy destiny. <laughs> Pelagus, keeping in trim? Follow me, Daddy. You're in my way. Oh, uh, sorry. Nice shot. You angry at somebody? What's on your mind? Guy named Marty. Yeah. You like that shot? Makes me quiver with excitement. You think I hit that duck twice before it sinks? I doubt it. <laughs> See what I mean? You're still booking races, Pelagus? I got caught once. You still booking? Uh-uh. You're in my way again. Try getting used to it, Pelagus. Try this. Where would Silks Bergen get a hundred grand? Yeah. Where? From you? Oh, just from me. From Pelagus. I give people a hundred grand, eh? Yeah? That's why I'm running this thing from shooting gallery, right? because I give such big price. You hit that duck, Lieutenant, I give you a hundred grand price. Is that what you mean? Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, I'll tell you, Oh, Joe Murdoch. Joe Murdoch. Silk's his friend, the big guy with Silk's in the haberdashery. Well, I guess what's he saying about Joe Murdoch? It's hard to explain. Hard, huh? Like this. <laughs> Joe Murdoch. Oh, he's part of the Easter. Murdoch. That is it, Thomas. A good thing. Don't spare me that last either. What did you say? May he rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> See you around, Pelagus. You have seen a thought. Danny Clover. That is the classic question. It was a thought I had to think. 
that pal Joey Murdoch was dead for the same reason that Silks was. I checked headquarters, found out that Murdoch's last known address was the last Paddock Hotel. He shared a room there with Silks. The environment made its own possibilities. The lobby of the last Paddock had a new embellishment. Above the clerk's desk was an embroidered wreath. To Silks, it said, you finally beat the bookie. The clerk didn't sound funereal at all. Sorry, mister, you gotta come recommend it. The last paddock don't rent rooms to just any pink that ass. I didn't mention room. The sign under your chin says information. I'll take that. Uh, you don't look like you carry that much dough. I got it thrown under my lapel. Here, take a look. A cop. A shaman. A real friendly policeman, mister. Come on, the information. Now, look, I'm a new boy here. You ring that bell, I give you the register. You sign it, you got a room. That's how it works. That's all I know. Yeah. Say, that's a pretty big safe over there. Why such a big safe for such a small flea bag? New, too. Yeah, new. How come? How come such a big new safe? Look, like I said, I'm a new boy. Look, friendly, we got laws about new boys to get close to new murders. Put her out to lunch plan on the counter. We're going uptown. No, 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 wait a minute. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, about that new safe. See, we had an old one. What happened to it? Well, yesterday the boys opened the old safe and... All it gave back was an empty stare. The boys did. What boys? The boys, the guys that live here, the bookies. Oh, they kept their money in a safe, huh? Sure, it's much safer than a bank. No peeping key men that way, eh? That way the bookies don't pay income tax. That way if their money gets stolen, they can't run to the police. Yeah, yeah. And that's all I know. You can take me uptown and that's still all I know. Yeah. Don't go away, friendly. Maybe soon you'll be able to tell your story to an audience. Clover. Well, Marty. Good to see you, Marty. I've been looking all over for you. Get in the car, Clover. Dolly's looking at you with a gun pointed to where your badge might be, and I just get in the car. Hey, Tinker. Hey. It's the police again. Maybe we'll get to play some more movies. After I take a gun. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Golly, say. boys. Wait out here. Oh, Marty. Wait. This way, police. In that house. Two murders, eh, Marty? How does a guy feel when he's murdered two men? A good feeling. I like it. Open the door. Yeah. There's someone I want you to meet again, Clover. In here. Mr. Clover. Mr. Danny Clover. You mind if I blush with joy? You can still think of a reason to blush, Bell. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! That's a pretty word for a man who's nearly dead. You got one chance, Clover. The dough. The hundred grand. Where is it? First, I'm going to tell you something about Marty, Bell. He had that money and he didn't know it. What? What's he saying, Marty? You tell us, Clover. Bell, when Marty had me worked over, he should have taken a look at my key ring. One of the keys was for a locker. Marker, money. Marty, how could you be so stupid? Answer the policeman, Marty. Oh, so I made a mistake, Bell. Don't worry, we got the police, we'll get the dough. Hundred thousand dollars, Marty, like that, right under your nose. Oh, Bell, you picked yourself a dull playmate. You can't afford a playmate who makes mistakes, Bell. Marty, you fool. You stupid fool. I've got to ask you, too, Bell. How does it feel to kill a man? Where's the money, Mr. Clover? At police headquarters, in my office. Get on that phone, Mr. Clover. Get on that phone and have one of your flunkies bring it over. No tricks, Mr. Clover. Just tell them. What's the kill from up close, huh, Bell? Oh, my God. It's me. Polegos, the Polegos student gallery. You see, Clover, how well they learn from Polegos? You always teach them with a gun in your hand? Yeah, one needs something to wrap one's pupil across the knuckles when he is back. No, Bell? Bell deserves it, Polegos. She tried to double-cross you. That makes two, Bell and Marty. Didn't know you were so much alike, Bell. You and Marty. <laughs> Don't listen to the policeman, Polegos. Now it's just, it's just you and me. Nobody else. It's you and me and a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, sounds good. To me, it sounds good. 
Oh, well, there's time for you, Clover. Speaking strictly from a personal point of view, I wouldn't believe it. Uh, from the personal point of view, that is. Uh-huh, but Pelego's point is beautiful. Oh, it's all right, Pelego. It's all right, isn't it? Oh, it, it couldn't be better. Just tell me you mean it. Throw away your gun. Huh? On the floor, Bill. Throw away. Oh, sure, sure. Anything you say. Ah. You're a good girl, Beth. Nice, good girl. Ah! Oh, let go. That was a nice girl. She had nice, good ideas, Clover. How did she say? Get on the phone and have a flunky bring money over. No trick. That's all she said. The flunky comes alone, Clover. I tell you in English, not in Greek, so you understand. He comes alone in 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, that's actually, this is Danny. Silk dough. Yeah, of a hundred grand. Bring it here to me. Yeah, to 8 West 63rd. In my desk drawer, Tartaglia. It's in my lower left-hand drawer. Yeah. Yeah, right away. Come alone, Tartaglia. Alone. You did good, Clover. Nice good. No, we wait. Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes, the man said. Just Pelagus and me. There's no one to play him off against. No Marty, no Bell. Just me. The tall guys I'd set up, Marty and Bell, all gone. It all belongs to Pelagus now. Two new fall guys, Tartaglia and me. A few more minutes, the man said. Mostly, the man watched the clock. Ah, you're lucky, Clover. In two minutes, you could have died. Open the door. Hiya, Danny. Oh, here it is. I broke the door just like you said. Hey, you know, it's good to get away from the office. With a suitcase on the table. Huh? Hey, it's Pelagos. Hey, he's got a gun. Hey, Danny, what Never mind the suitcase, but I guess. Well, whatever you say, Danny. <laughs> ah, Clover. You're a nice, good fool. I get the money, you still die, huh? You and the funky. Huh? Talk to us before we die, Pelagos. I like to talk. What do we talk about? That was your money. Silk stole it from the safe at the last paddock. Thought he could get away with it. He thought you couldn't do anything about it. But you cost it. You had Marty kill him and his friend Murdoch. You talk all by yourself, Clover. You didn't let me say a word. Hmm. Now fold your hands behind your head instead of facing the wall. You both. Good. That's nice, good. Now I want to look once more in my money. Too long since I looked for the money. Yeah, that's my luck. The money. Something wrong, Pelagos? This money. It's what, Pelagos? It's something but petty. Lousy sort of ships are very nuts. That's for nothing but... Hit the floor, that's idea. I'll take it. Oh. My good, huh, Pelagos? Ah. Yeah. Nice, good. <laughs> First, I kissed Tartaglia on the top of his bald head, because today that's where his brain was. My lower left-hand desk drawer had been stuck for a week, and he'd gotten the cue. Dolly and Tinker, they were sitting outside, just like Marty told them, right in the middle of a police net, just like Tartaglia had arranged. So I kissed him again. So he invited me to a spaghetti dinner. Midnight's a happy time on Broadway. It's crowd and it's laughter, and it's a trumpet that screams. It's a place strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley, and there heat there, the bright eyed kid, the voice that whispers from the doorway, the poet, the dregs. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for Broadway's My Beat. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The FBI and Peace and War, ordinarily heard at this time throughout the year, is taking its usual summer vacation and will return to CBS one week from tonight on September 1st. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway, it's a swamp that'll drag you breath by breath into its shadowed pools, or it's a meadow shining with golden light. It's a place and a time and a loneliness that reaches out for you, then beckons you into an airless room and locks the door. You get out or you don't. Either way, it's Broadway, My Beat. A man dies in silence and in dark, and the city sets up a shrieking clamor, and you're part of it. You ride a scream through the crowded, heat-heavy streets, and then you hit a dead end. And it's a building, and a room at the top of the building, and it's a man lying in the center of the room while other men take notes on the history of his dying. All right, Joe, get one from this angle, huh? Yeah, hold on while I focus, will you? Hiya, Danny. Okay, that's good. Got it. Now get a shot of all that food. Oh, what a banquet this guy Danny, is. Danny, come over here. This will interest you. It never interests me, Doc. What have you got? Al Dane, the novelist. Ever read any of his stuff? No. Neither do I. The wife does, though, says so she's mad about it. But she went mad over Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. Well, let's have tea some other time, huh, Doc? Tell me about Dane. Yeah, well... Hey, first tell him about me, huh, Doc? Tell him about me. Oh, uh, yeah. Danny, this is Clem, Clem Picasso. Yeah, that's who I am. Picasso. Picasso. Haven't I heard your name someplace? Sure you have. Clem Picasso, the painter. I paint flagpoles. Yeah, that's where it was. You were painting a portrait of a flagpole for Dana, is that it? No, you don't understand. I'm the real article. Let me tell you about me. Yeah. If it wasn't for me, you guys wouldn't even know Dane was dead. Tell me more about yourself. Well, I was painting the flagpole on top of this building, see? All of a sudden came a gust of wind. I grab hold of the pole, drop my tail of paint right through that skylight there, see? I look for spill paint, I find a dead man. That is the experience that happened today to Clem Picasso, flagpole painter. Unforgettable. Uh, it'll live in my memory, too. Uh, you got anything to add to that, Doc? <laughs> Only this, Danny. This room is a fortress. Dane must have built it on top of his penthouse for a retreat. It's ventilated by an air conditioning system. The only source of outside light is that skylight, and that's at least 30 feet from the floor. Mm -hmm. There's no phone, and the room was locked and bolted from the outside. Dane couldn't get out. This place is bare. No writing materials, nothing. Yeah, like a tomb. Maybe he needed this kind of atmosphere to think. Maybe. All the boys found when they broke in here was Dane and that table, loaded with food, all jarred. Fruits, chicken, all sorts of good things to eat. What's the matter, Doc? You hungry? Just tell me how Dane died. He died of starvation, Danny. Huh? Yeah, all that food, and he died of starvation. Curious man, this Val Dane. Huh, Danny? <laughs> I could have dropped it right there. Val Dane, I told myself, had committed suicide by starving himself to death, thereby obtaining new material for his next novel. That's what I told myself. That's how much sense it made. And that's why I couldn't drop it. In New York, hardly anybody dies in a vacuum. A man as famous as Val Dane never does. There has to be a close friend or relative to break the news to, and in a case like this, to question. It wasn't tough to find out that Val Dane had a wife, now divorced. And the city directory said she lived on West 79th Street, the department 105. As simple as that. Yes, what is it? You're Mrs. Dane? Well, only approximately. Mr. Dane and I are divorced. I've kept his name for my son's sake. Uh, you're... Uh, Danny Clover. I'm from the police. Oh, how interesting. We've never had a caller here from the police. Won't you come in? Thank you. I do hope you'll stay until Jimmy comes home. Jimmy is my son, Mr. Clover. I'm sure he'd love to hear the experiences you'd have to tell him. Uh, in here, the living room. Yeah, that's quite a collection of glass toys there on the floor. Clowns, building sets, animals, and all in glass. Jimmy must be an unusual boy. Oh, yes, he is. That's all I have left in life, Mr. Clover. To make him happy. 
Uh, there's something I have to tell you that might make you quite sad. About Jimmy? No, it's about your former husband, Val Dane. He's dead. Oh, I'm so happy. Well, I mean, I'm relieved. I was afraid with Jimmy being on the street. Then it might... doesn't affect you, Mr. Dane's death? I think I should be more sad if I read in the papers that a man I never met had died at the age of 93. I see. No, you don't, really. How could I feel sorrow for Val Dane? He was a miserable ten years thrust into my life. Why do you say that? Because he was a talented egoist. He cared nothing for Jimmy. He cared even less for me. We lived for him. He lived for Val Dane. Uh, when did you see him last? Two years ago. In that horrible cabin in the Adirondacks. He, he forced us to go there so we could write. And one more thing, Mr. Clover. Yeah? When you write your report about me, put this down. Put down Joanne Dane. Val Dane's ex-wife. She's glad he's dead. I didn't bother to tell Joanne Dane that her former husband had starved to death. I had a feeling she would have enjoyed that too much. And death doesn't need laughing at. But when I hit Broadway again, death was screaming at me in big black letters. Val Dane had become public property for a nickel a copy. You got the funny papers, too. I called headquarters and asked Sergeant Tartaglia if anything new had turned up. Something you have. Get back to your office right away, the sergeant said. There's a guy who wants to see you. He's hysterical. The sergeant wasn't kidding. <laughs> Something in my office makes you laugh like that? The pollen, maybe? I can't help it. It's, rich. it's the richest one I've ever heard. Okay, okay, come out of it. Who are you? Uh, my name's my name's Brooks, Lyle Brooks. <laughs> Lyle Brooks, huh? Tell me gently, what's so rich? Oh, I think of it again, Lieutenant. I shall roll in your floor in continued convulsions of hilarity. And think of something real sad, like a right to the jaw, and tell me what's in your mind. Why, why, Val Dane starved to death. Don't you think it's funny? No? Well, I think it's funny. What tickles you about a man's death, Brooks? About Val's death? He was such a pig, and he starved to death. Well, that lieutenant is humor. Category, ironic humor. What's your interest in Val Dane's death? I'm his ghost. Ghost, huh? Pataglia! Yes, yeah, Daddy! Now, what do you want? Book this guy for impersonating a human. Hey, that's a serious... Right huh? now, Pataglia, book him. Well, sure, for impersonating a human, huh? Come on, you... Policemen have a sense of jest, too, I see. Come on, you... So I'll explain. I am Val Dane's ghost. You're doing it again, Brooks. His ghost writer. I did much of the writing which is credited to our so literary Mr. Dane. That's why I came to give myself up. To give yourself up, huh? Did you have anything to do with this dying? Assuredly uh, not. But you might think so. I hated him. Val Dane cheated me time and again. But this time was the biggest cheat of all. Uh, what's he talking about, Danny? I'm talking about the great fake. Val Dane's latest book. I wrote at least half of it, you know. Got no credit. Val said I would get credit. What are you trying to tell us? Just this. If Val Dane met with foul play in any way, I should head your list of suspects. Me and Cynthia, of course. We mustn't forget Cynthia. Oh, we can't forget her. Cynthia who? Cynthia Troy. Why, everybody knows she's the woman in the great fake. Edmund, do you mean to say you haven't read the book, Mr. Clover? Mr. Clover hadn't, but Mr. Clover did. The Great Fake, new novel by Val Dane, available at your favorite bookstore, $3 the copy. I bought it, noted it carefully on my expense account, and went home and curled up with $3 worth of vitriol. Because that's what the novel was. A book of hate, a sneering book, a book without humor. There wasn't a person in it, only caricatures dipped in acid. And the leading woman of the novel had been dipped deepest of all. It tweaked me. The next morning, I just had to see her. I've been expecting a call from the police, Mr. Clover. Think? Uh, no, thanks, Miss Joy. Then you won't mind if I do. I uh, know. I realize it's before noon, but then I haven't had my breakfast yet. You sure you won't have a drink? Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, just why had you been expecting a call from the police, Miss Joy? <laughs> because I have no doubt about your intelligence. One thing you must know in my business is never to underestimate anybody. You mind if I ask what your business is? The same as in Val's novel. I give parties, Mr. Clover. I arrange that the unfortunate rich be impressed by their leisure and their wealth. By opulent and clever parties, Mr. Clover. For an opulent price, Mr. Clover. Now the question, Miss Troy. Why was Why I... Why were you expected, Mr. Clover? Hmm. The answer is a question. 
How do you get a man to starve to death? I've been asking myself that. You think somebody got Val Dane to starve? Undoubtedly. Val Dane was a man whose only love was Val Dane. He was too jealous of his love to kill himself. He would never commit suicide. Then you think he was murdered? I uh, believe I implied that, don't you? Did you kill him? <laughs> the idea titillates me. Yes, it's a rare thought. <laughs> Ask me that again, Mr. Clover. Look, Miss Choi, the social graces aren't one of my uh, social graces. <laughs> In your circle, how do you tell a lady to quit stalling? By telling her. Then let's quit stalling, huh? Very well. You've uh, read Val's novel, yes? It made a fool of me, didn't it? Is that why you killed him? Locked him in that room and starved him to death? I should like to have done that, Mr. Clover. The idea... Yeah, I know. It titillates you. Uh, you've started a train of thought, Mr. Clover. I should like to have locked him in that room and spent days of ecstatic joy watching Val Dane star. <laughs> I went back to the clean, almost domestic air of the police laboratory and waited while the lab boys checked and rechecked the coroner's report. No matter how you shook it, it came out that Val Dane had died of starvation. Then it caught up with me what Cynthia Troy had said. It would have given her days of ecstatic joy to watch Dane starve. There was only one place anyone could have done that. That was from the roof and through the skylight of Dane's death room. I took a uniformed officer with me because maybe that kind of ecstasy leaves a clue. Danny, I've been over every inch of this roof. There ain't a particle of it that ain't intimate and familiar to me. I'm also sick of the sight of it under my nose. Uh, okay, officer, you can get up off your hands and knees now. Uh, thanks, Danny. You know, Danny, maybe it'd help if you told me what it is we're looking for. I don't know. Thread of cloth, a cigarette butt, the smell of hate. The smell of... Huh? Hey, Danny, you dizzy from the altitude or something? <laughs> no, no. You can go now, officer. I won't need you anymore. Okay. Hey, you know, it's kind of pretty up here. Huh? All the lights of the city. See, that reminds me, I think I'll take my wife to the top of the Empire State Building. It'll be like a second honeymoon. Well, so long, Danny. Don't stay too long in the night air. Yeah. It has to be something. Something. Hmm. Didn't make sense what I saw. A piece of scotch tape stuck to one of the panes of the skylight. I leaned down to examine it. And then there was something that did make sense. The sound of someone moving toward me. And then I... I whipped out my gun and ducked behind the jet of the skylight. And then it found me. When I woke, a sickly dawn spread itself over the roof and over me. I took inventory and found I was missing two items. A valuable hunk of skin from my right temple. And a piece of scotch tape. Just that. Scotch tape. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. With Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. A thrill a minute. High tension suspense from the word go. Dramatic excitement that builds and builds until it explodes in a smashing climax. That's Inner Sanctum, the great mystery show that's another of CBS top-notch Monday night programs. You'll find Inner Sanctum one of the most entertaining spots on your Monday night listening schedule. And remember, Lux Radio Theater returns next Monday, August 29th, for its 15th year of great dramatic presentations. Inner Sanctum... Lux Radio Theater, every Monday night over most of these same CBS stations. Now back to Broadway's My Beat. Morning on Broadway is like any other August morning on a thousand other main drags. People are caught up in a salary to be earned, baseball scores, and the heat. You keep moving and do the best you can. The best I could do was to try to push my way through a brick wall. Progress was practically at a standstill. But by now, one thing was obvious. I had a murder on my hands. Val Dane had been found starved to death in a locked room with a banquet spread before him. 
That in itself was something to nick the curiosity. But when I got too curious, somebody had taken a shot at me. Draw a line and add that up and you get a six-letter word meaning foul play. At headquarters, after I had my head bandaged, Sergeant Tartaglia was terse and intelligent about the whole thing. I can't figure it, Danny. Now, don't try it, Tartaglia. If you could figure it, you'd become invaluable to the department. You'd never get your pension. Did you get what I told you? Yeah, one piece of frosted glass, just like you said. Thanks. Where'd you get it? Now, Danny, where would you get a piece of frosted glass at police headquarters? Out of the men's powder room. You better hurry up with it. Yeah. Now we'll tear off a piece of scotch tape. Now we'll paste it over the glass like this. Uh, what are you doing, Danny? Pasting scotch tape on frosted glass. It's the latest craze. Now we hold it up to the light. Look through it, Tartaglia. Get up close and look through it. Hey, now you can see right through it. The part of the glass with the scotch tape on it, you can see right through. Hey, that's a neat trick, Danny. It's also a clue, Sergeant. The skylight to Val Dane's retreat was frosted glass. Somebody stuck that missing piece of tape on the glass so they could watch Val Dane die. Uh-huh. Uh, Taglia, suppose you were locked in a room loaded with food and you were starving to death. What would you do? I'd eat the food. Unless what, Tartaglia? Unless nothing, Danny. I'd eat the food. Unless what, Tartaglia? Danny, I said I'd eat the food unless it was poor. Unless it was poison, Danny. You're so right. Tartaglia, I want all the food found in Valdane's room transferred to the technical lab right away. I want every piece of it analyzed for poison. I want the analysis on my desk as soon as possible. Right. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. Danny Clover speaking. Main closed Meshikov, sir. Signed the follow Cynthia Troy. No, okay, Meshikov. What do you got? At 9 a.m. this morning, Cynthia Troy entered the Fifth Avenue apartment of one Michael Green. Who? Uh, I mean, Cream. Michael Cream. C R E A M. Cream. You know, like in Cream. So I took a plant in the hall. At 9.15, I heard loud voices, which at 9.20 become a heated argument. Who is this Merkel Cream? Oh, him I checked. He's a yogi. A yogi, huh? Well, that's interesting. These guys go on starvation diets to get next to their souls. Thanks, Major Stick with Cynthia. Hey, Tataglia. Yeah, Danny. Get my bed of nails. I'm calling on a yogi. The yogi with a homogenized name, Merkel Cream, lived in a rich, creamy Fifth Avenue mansion with a high money fat content. The outside stairs were covered with a thick layer of perfumed oriental carpet. When you rang, a girl made of copper with bells on the ankles of her bare feet and a jewel stuck in the middle of her forehead opened the door with a scented arm motioned you into the presence. The presence was a muscular man with the body of a professional football player wearing a plumed turban and an imported English tweed loincloth. He sat in the middle of the floor, bathed in the celestial glow of a baby pink spotlight. And then, the presence spake. You have come. Yeah, Mr. Cream, I... Speak not when I speak. You have come. You said that. You have come to attune yourself to the eternal harmony that lies six fathoms deep in the cosmic sea. You will go into the cleansing room. Huh? You will go into the cleansing room and there cleanse yourself and attire yourself in a loincloth. You will find a suitable array hanging from pegs. The, uh, panther skin for you, I think. Look, Mr. Cream... Have no fear. They are sterilized after each use. Now go, tortured one, go. Look, Cream, I'm not here to cross your palm with How dare you speak to Merkel Cream thus? How dare you, savage? That's me. Look into your crystal ball and tell me why you should scream at a tortured one named Cynthia Troy and vice versa. How did you know? Don't answer. I will answer for you. You are omniscient. Clairvoyant. Like the me that is the true me. Like the me that is Danny Clover, New York police. I got a hunk of protoplasm named Meshikov who floats under windows and soaks up things like a fishwife's brawl between you and Cynthia. But you are clairvoyant. The Cynthia underneath Cynthia is a fishwife. She pays you to tell her that? Cynthia Troy is a disciple. Disciple fall out sometimes, as you know. I've heard. Val Dane, he, he was a disciple too. What did you do to Dane, Yogi? Put him on a starvation diet for his eternal harmony? Then you've read his book. Yeah, he gave you a paragraph. Let's see if I can remember the exact words. The yogi, a vicious parasite, a jeweled vampire, a stinking phony. Did I quote the exact words exactly, yogi cream? Dane died in a way that pleases me. He died in an agony of hunger. What does it matter if his exact words are remembered? To him or to me, what does it matter? Yeah. Get up, Cream. You're coming with me. 
I got a feeling you can give me better answers with your pants on. You believe that I'm a fake? You believe what Dane said of me? To put it bluntly, Cream, yeah. Sorry, but yeah. Maybe Dane killed your lush racket with his bestseller. Maybe you knew it would. Maybe you arranged for him to die. Let's go. Help me up, Mr. Clover. Yeah, cosmic harmony makes you weak. All right. You know I can't afford to go to jail. It would ruin me. Let go. If you move, Mr. Clover, I'll break your back as if it were a stick of wood. Let go of me. A little trick I learned from a man on Amsterdam Avenue. Ten judo lessons for 20 bucks. Worth it, don't you think? Don't you think? I got my lessons for free. Well, send them back. They're no good. Let's find out, shall we? Let's find out. Now, my way, Cream. Let's do it my way. Oh. Well, what do you know? The yogi found cosmic harmony. Has to be a phone in this dump. Yeah. Headquarters, Tartaglia speaking. Hey, Tartaglia, this is Danny. Send a stretcher to pick up yogi. This is Michael Crane? Yeah, he spilled out of his bottle. One stretcher coming up. Hey, Danny, we got a report on that food. Yeah? Give it to me. Oh, I was about to, Danny. You know, it is very interesting. But, David, if you don't talk fast, order a stretcher for yourself, too. What about that food? Well, that's what I'm telling you. So interesting. It was not poison, Danny. Baldane's food was not poison. Until the yogi was in condition to talk to me, I had to talk to myself. What kind of man was Baldane? That is the big question, the important question. Locked in a room long enough to starve to death and he refused to touch the food, the unpoisoned food at his fingertips. Why? What was the mentality of the man? Once, long ago, he had been human enough to marry, to have a family. Maybe that was the clue. Once somebody loved it. Maybe his ex-wife, Joanne Dane, would be calmer now. Maybe she could divorce her memory from ugliness. Yes? Who are you? I'm Danny Clover, a police detective. Who are you? I'm the landlady. What can I do for you? I want to see Joanne Dane. Joanne's not in any trouble. She's a fine girl. What kind of trouble would she be in? Anna, I didn't say she was in any trouble. I just wanted to talk to her. Oh, she ain't in. Where is she? Oh, Joanne's out for a walk. With Jimmy? Jimmy? What are you talking about? Her son, Jimmy. Mister, you got the wrong address. Joanne's got no son. Nobody lives here by the name of Jimmy. Say, what kind of a detective are you anyway? Yeah. What kind, Clover? Let's go find out. Oh, here are the vital statistics you asked for, Danny. Yeah? Hey, when are you going to take me to see South Pacific, Danny? Oh, any day now, doll. I'm just waiting for that inheritance. Oh, Danny, stop pulling my leg. Here. Know the vital statistics, Danny. <laughs> Read it to me, doll, because your voice is like honey. Read it to me. <laughs> Get him. James Dane, age four, son of Val and Joanne Dane. Died June 22nd, 1947. Cause of death, accidental poisoning. Death spasms took four hours. Remoteness of cabin and Adirondacks made it impossible to reach boy in time to help. Find Dr. James Robeson. Hey, hey, Danny, where are you going? I haven't finished. Danny, come back here. I've got some things to settle. I was out when you called before, Mr. Cruz. Yeah, I know. Joanne, your landlady said you'd gone for a walk. With Jimmy. Jimmy loves to walk on a sunny day like this. Where's Jimmy now? Hot oh, plane. Joanne, I asked you before. Now, don't lie. When was the last time you saw Valdane? I won't lie. A few weeks ago, as I told you. A few weeks ago, yeah. Another question. Why did you go to see him? To ask him for money. I, I hated myself for it, but... Jimmy needs clothes. You see, he'll be going to school this fall. And... I see. Joanne, did you take anything with you, anything that you gave to Val? Well, I, I don't think so. I can't remember that I did. Food? Why? Uh, food in jars, chicken, preserves, things like that. Now that you mention it, Mr. Clover, I... yes, I think I... 
Yes, Joanne, you told Val that food was poison, didn't you? Just before you left, just before you closed the door behind you. You told Val it was poison, didn't you, Joanne? What are you talking about? Just before you locked the door and bolted it behind you, you told him that. You pointed a gun at him and told him that. Why should I do that? Joanne. Joanne, listen to me. Jimmy is dead, isn't he? Jimmy dead? <laughs> Jimmy dead? Jimmy died two years ago. You know that, Joanne. No, what? I don't know what you're saying. The Adirondacks, one summer two years ago. Jimmy took some poison by mistake. There was no way to get help soon enough. You and Val had to watch him die. You're making all that up. You blamed it on your husband. You blamed him for bringing you there because it was so remote. No, no, no. It wasn't that way at all. Yes, it was. You left that food with your husband, Joanne. You told him it was poisoned. You knew he'd never have courage to taste that food after seeing the way Jimmy died. Your husband took his chances with starvation rather than suffer the way Jimmy did. Jimmy sucked? Jimmy dead? Yes, Joanne. He's dead. These glass toys are only a lie that you're making yourself Put believe. Put them down. The Jimmy saw it. Your final revenge, Joanne. You had to watch Val die. Yes. You came back each night to look through the skylight. Yes. And finally, when he was dead, you came back to remove that tape. That's when you saw me. Yes. And I want to kill you because I was frightened of you, Mr. Clover. That's the only reason. I didn't hate you then. You've got to believe me. I didn't hate you. Joanne. But I hate you now. And I've got to kill you now, Mr. Clover. I've got Joanne, to... Joanne, put down that gun. I'll kill you. <laughs> you broke Jimmy's toy. You broke them. Oh, Jimmy. Jimmy, all your beautiful toys broke. All your toys. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy. How can you forgive me, son? I'm sorry. Oh, Hello? Give me the police department. Hey, this is Danny Clover. No, I don't want a riot squad. I want an ambulance. The doctor. It took 15 minutes for them to come, and in that time I watched the shadow soak up the remnants of her mind. How do you tell a woman her life is done? How do you fill it in reports? How do you make statistics out of it and file it in a ledger? How do you write sorrow as a number? How? Broadway's really living now. It's got a creamy yogi back in circulation. Cynthia is throwing a marvelous party for Patrolman Mishikev. And the ghost, Lyle Brooks, he's haunting another author. Broadway's jaunty now and it wears a chip on its shoulder. It's flexing its muscles and daring the nighttime. And before it's over, it'll tear itself apart and laugh at its own agony. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my feet. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor, Detective Danny Clover, was directed tonight by Cliff Howell, with script by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin. <laughs> that man is coming back again. Yes, Arthur Godfrey is returning from his vacation. And he'll be helping some promising young performers up the ladder of success when Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts return to the air next Monday night over most of these same CBS network stations. Along with the Talent Scouts, you can hear such great shows as My Friend Irma, Inner Sanctum, The Lux Radio Theater, and The Bob Hawk Show, all on Monday night and all on CBS. Stay tuned now for Mr. Keen, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you hear Lux Radio Theater every Monday, the Columbia Broadcasting System. My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway.
play. It's a neon-lighted revival meeting that screams for the joy and the salvation. And it's a lonely path that sighs down into darkness. It's a fury of voices and stamping feet, or a cry that wanders and waits to be heard. It's happy alley with happy talk, where the hot trumpet plays background music for a panhandler. However you want it, that's how it is. It's Broadway, my feet. The November twilight filtered into my office at police headquarters, and I sat there looking at it, pushing away the time for the filling out of my daily report. There were other diversions. Through the open window, I watched a girl walk down the street. She wore a green silk dress that knew summer was over but didn't care. Then I heard two things, a sigh that came from me and a door opening that came from the door. I have no wish to trespass upon a reverie of delight, Daniel. There was only one man who could talk to me like that. A miniature of a man called Lee Kai. Lee Kai, professor of oriental art at the university. He hadn't changed. The same black military-looking jacket that buttoned high on the throat. The same patent leather shoes with spats slightly pink. And the face still as if it had been engraved on yellow shamsung. Daniel, may I presume upon you? Anything you want, Lee, any time. Then permit me to read you this telegram. Is that all? You could have presumed bigger. I shall, when you have read the telegram. It is addressed to me and it says in three words, Terror follows me. It is signed Mei Ling. Only three words. Is not ten words the usual? Yeah. He's a frugal one, this Mei Ling, huh? Mei Ling is a delicate interweaving of all that is lovely and exquisite in a girl. I do not think she meant to be frugal. I do not think I know what you're talking about. Of course. Therefore, I will explain. You see, Mei Ling, this lovely girl of whom I have told you so much already, hmm? she brings me a statuette of the goddess Kuan Yin, China's goddess of mercy. And among friends, there is no need for circumlocution. Of course. Uh... For what? Circumlocution, of course. Oh. The Kuan Yin was smuggled out of my bleeding China, Daniel. It is worth approximately a hundred thousand dollars. Mei Ling was bringing it to me. And now, in three words, terror follows her. You understand what I need of you? Not yet. I want you to meet Mei Ling's train at 125th Street at 8 tonight. She is in private car 23. You will give her the protection from the terror that follows her, Daniel. Oh, we have uh, other departments for that, Lee. I could But have... uh, you are the friend department, no, Daniel? In the nighttime, the 125th Street station hangs over the edge of a glittering world. Arrival and departure have a special meaning in the dark. There are shadows between everything, and the talk is always whispered. I walked out on the concrete platform toward the light on the bulk of the train, and I saw him, the man in the conductor's cap, holding a lantern and looking down at his watch. I asked him a question. Car 23, next one down through this empty coat. Oh, thanks. Hey, uh, wait a minute. Can't get in 23, private coat. That's all right. I just want to... Nope, can't let you on. Nope. Sorry, but no. Order. Want to see something? Huh? Look at this for a second. Sure, oh, hold it up to the light. Yeah. Police badge, eh? Yep. Yeah. Uh, train pulls out in seven minutes, mister. Oh, Prairie, oh, Prairie, I... Oh, excuse me, mister, I didn't know where... I... Hey, you big enough to come from Texas. Are you from Texas? No, now, if you'll let me through here. Well, you. city fella, huh? You know how I can tell? City fellas always in a hurry. That's how I can tell. Yeah, now, one side, Brad. Now, in Texas, it's different. People are friendly. Just spoke down in Texas. i show you what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. You have a drink. Maybe you didn't understand. I said one side, friend. Hey, you meaner than a shot with a cut mouth. No drink, huh? Well, Texan don't prejudice a man because he ain't no drinker. Let me tell you about Texas. Maybe I gotta prove it to you. Out of the way. Uh, oh, you got the idea. Sure, sure, I got the idea. See if you can get this one through your head. Oh. What are you... Central oh. 
Hey, hey, yo, wake up. <laughs> now, don't ask me where you are. I've been shouting out my lungs where you are. Oh. Come on, come on, get up, get up. Come. There you are. Hey, you're the policeman. Yeah, the finest of the finest. Stumble, huh? Later. First, I was slugged. Feature that. You feature it. I haven't made car 23 yet. Hey, hey, come back here. I was going to write a report. <laughs> I finally did. I finally made it. Car 23. Inside the place was a shambles. Upholstery ripped, baggage opened and tossed across the seat. As if someone had been in a desperate hurry to find something. I noticed her then. She was sitting there. Very lovely. Very delicate. The frown pressed at the corners of her lips. I guessed her name was Mei Ling. But I knew she was dead. The bullet hole between the almond eyes made this common knowledge to anyone who took the time to look. To a policeman, a death scene is a place of business. There was nothing there that looked like a priceless statuary called Kwan Yin. I made some notes, called the station master, then found a phone booth to make the violent death of Mei Ling by person to persons unknown a matter of routine. Sergeant Tartaglia speaking. Danny Clover. Mailing's dead. Send the boys down to Grand Central. Photographers, fingerprints, technical, the whole crew. The coroner, too. I'll wait for them. Okay. Hey, say, Danny, a guy called. Said he wanted to talk to you. Said it was urgent. Who said all that? John Smith. Well, that's what he said his name was. John Smith. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. He said something about a... Uh, a uh, wait a minute. Here, I'll, I'll spell it to you. K-U-A-N-Y-I... Kwan Yin? Uh, yeah, yeah, Danny, that's it. What's John Smith's address? 1212 Mott Street. Got it? Yeah. Goodbye, Tataglia. <laughs> Anyone who wanted to see me about a Kwan Yin was a man I wanted to see. I waited around Grand Central until the crew from headquarters arrived, but I took off my squad car and hit Mott Street in ten minutes. The red brick pagoda that bore the address of one John Smith held all the charm and grace of a 20th century housing project. The only thing oriental about it was a cast iron dragon that snarled at me from the door knocker. I picked up its head and banged it against the door. Ah, you would be Danny Clover, and I would be John Smith. The ecstasy is mutual. Please it, huh? thing that stood in front of me I didn't believe was a mound of flesh wrapped in a scented mandarin's robe. Perched on its shoulder was a small white monkey with enormous eyes that loathed me with an enormous loathe. John Smith looked like a fat crock of Ming pottery, but he talked as if he'd spent a lot of time killing the good earth around Harvard. You admire my monkey, Danny Clover. Rest assured, he admires you. I hate him. Get him out of here. <laughs> you are frank, Danny Clover. We shall get along splendidly. Now, run along to bed, Max. It's way beyond, you know. I'll talk you in later, Max. Now go, go. Revolting beast, isn't he? I say that deliberately. <laughs> it depends on your point of view. Me. I find all the answers to all the mysteries of eternity in Max's eyes. Hmm. You gaze at my house. You like it. Yeah, looks like you've collected all the loot in China. Cozy, though. Spurious loot, Danny Clover. It's all fake. These statuettes, for instance, tourist stuff. Hmm? And all this rubbish, nothing so delicate or so desirable as the Kuan Yin image. An evanescent image. A will of the wisp image. You don't say. Tell me more. I shall. A most intimate source in Hong Kong has revealed to me that the fabulous, the priceless Kuan Yin has vanished. Do you have a theory as to where she might be? Should I have a theory? I thought perhaps the eminent oriental art expert known to both of us as Likai may have helped you formulate one. Your most intimate source operates in New York, too. I have other intimates. Besides Max? Try one from Texas. Texas? What is that? A person, place, or object? You know, I wouldn't know. Exactly. And now, Danny Clover, a word of caution. The Kuan Yin is a legend among my people. A fairy tale. Fairy tales are sometimes bloody. A most discerning observation. On a sensitive and intelligent mind, they can leave a most fatal scar. Sometimes not only on the mind. It's sweet the way you try to scare me. The Kuan Yin 
is a goddess of mercy and compassion. If you know where she is, may she watch over you. If you don't, we have nothing further to discuss. And now I must tuck Max in. Au revoir, Danny Clover. I shook his hand, watched him wince, then bowed out of his fat presence. John Smith was a man who would cheat. Now there was one place I just had to go, to the university, to break the news to Lee Kai. It was at this time in my life that I exploded the myth that the thirst for knowledge never ceases. The door to the Arts and Science building was locked. It took me a half hour to find the night watchman, go through the policeman's badge routine, and, and get ushered to the self-service elevator. Wait a minute. Hey, wait, wait a minute. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel silly saying this, but... Floor, please. The third. Oh, good. Me too. I've never seen you about the building. What are you in, arts or sciences? I never knew which. Uh, I'm Danny Clover, a policeman. Oh? Mm-hmm. And you're in the... Seismology. I'm Professor Higgins. Professor? Oh. Here we are. Third floor. Oh, yeah. You, um, were saying... I was saying professor of seismology with a question mark after it. Now, what is seismology exactly? Exactly. It's that branch of geophysics which has to do with earthquakes and their attendant phenomena. Mm -hmm. Here's my lab. Good night. Oh, before you go, and in non-scientific terms, could you tell me where Professor Lee Kai's office is? Lee Kai? Yeah. How nice. In the Argo, any friend of his is a friend of mine. Now we'll shake hands. I'm glad to know you. I'll show you his office. You've known Lee Kai for a long time. Why, he slapped my... <laughs> he was in attendance when I was born. There were no doctors nearby then. In China, Mr. Clover. In the interior. Oh, and from that moment on, you became interested in earthquakes and their uh, attendant phenomena. Pretty nearly. Understand, Mr. Clover, I enjoy seismology. A girl can always make her way in the world with a good, sound knowledge of seismology, I always say. I always say the same thing. <laughs> it does make for dull conversation, doesn't it? Well, uh... Here. Here's Lee Kai's office. Professor Kai. Professor Kai. Professor Kai! There was only one man who could lie on the floor like that. A miniature of a man called Lee Kai. He had only changed a little bit. The patent leathers were the same and the spats, the crinkled face. But the small change made a big difference. The sharp object sticking in the middle of his black military-looking jacket made him a venerable ancestor to whatever good he'd done in this world. I knelt down beside him. There's a letter opener plunged deep into his back. And on its handle it said, Acme Life Assurance Company, put your life in our hands. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. 50,000 or more, always in the jackpot on Sing It Again. Music by Gene Autry and Vaughn Monroe. Mystery and thrills with gangbusters Philip Marlowe, Johnny Dollar, and Danny Clover, the Broadway cop. That's the one-way ticket to top fun on most of these CBS stations every Saturday night. This fall, when you hear them all on CBS, Saturday night promises top music, top adventure, and a chance at radio's top prize. There's this about Broadway. It savors the exotics while it's taking bites out of a hot dog. The deaths of Mei Ling and Lee Kai were duly reported for the next morning's newsstand. were scanned by the crowd while reaching for the respective mustard jars. Then Broadway went about its business. You can't play in Broadway. It's got too many other things to consider, like tea formations and mass substitutions, the weather, making a buck. But a policeman with a murder in his hands has to make a world outside all that. Mine revolved about a specific Chinese statuette called Quan Yin, an incidentally worth $100,000. It also included paying final respects. I took a ride down to a twisted alley off of Mott Street. The festivities for Lee Kai's funeral had already begun. Venerable Chinese ladies and gentlemen stood on the curb and with great ceremony lighted firecrackers and tossed them serenely into the air. 
As the body of Lee Kai approached, others tossed money into his open coffin to ensure his price of admission into heaven. Walking directly behind was a lady by the name of Higgins. Professor Kate Higgins. She was dressed in a mantle and robe. The tears for the tears some enchanted princess might weep. But there were only two, one under each eye, and each one a jewel. And then across the street through the procession, a face that I had seen once before in a train station brought me back. Pardon me. Sorry. Pardon. Tell me about Texas, kid. I got more time now. Who are you? Why leave a great place like Texas just to strong arm a city fella? Take off, friend. They warned me about talking to strangers. In here, friend, in this alleyway where we can be far from the city's rattle. In here where we can be parts. In here. Take your hands off me. Talk to me, pard. Who told you to slug me on that train? I can do it now without nobody whispering in my ear. Do it. Yell. Yeah. Oh. Oh. It's going to be a well-filled saddle tonight in the old Hooskow. I was looking for Professor Higgins. This is her laboratory, isn't it? Yes. The professor isn't in. I'm John Scarn, her assistant. Danny Clover, police. Uh, social or business? I only ask because Kate has such various callers. Last week it was a gentleman peddling hot Persian prayer rugs. I got quite a size him out of him. Size him? You're not hep, are you? Size him. Earthquake. A big bang. Tell me, uh, what do you do around here when you're not having size him? Well, I'll explain it to you. See, these things here are seismographs. They're connected to another machine embedded in concrete below this building. Oh. If there's an earth tremor, it's picked up by the machine downstairs and recorded on these. I see. Uh, and this needle here writing on this rotating drum records the time of the shock. Precisely. Interesting. You mind if I take a closer look? Well, take it easy, Mr. Clover. We don't need a tembler to disturb the needle, you know. It's very delicately balanced. It'll even record footsteps that come too close to it. What do you do with these recordings after you've got them? File them. Each recording is for a 24-hour period. Unfile yesterday's reports and send them to my office. Well, but... And do you get reports from other stations to do this work? Yes, every day, but... Send yesterday's, all of them, down to police headquarters. Now, see here. Mr. Scarn, you had your size them today? I'll send everything down just as soon as I can get them together. Good. And quietly. No one's to know. Uh, another thing, Mr. Scarn. Who has access to this lamp? Why, just Kate and me, and, uh, yes, the night watchman. Yes, we three. We have the only keys, I believe. Thanks. And Kate, uh, Professor Higgins, where would I find her? Perhaps at her apartment. 125 Morningside Drive, I believe. Thanks again, Mr. Scott. <laughs> Just a moment. I have to put something on. I'll wait. Clover, why is it that everything happens to you while you're on duty? Uh, maybe it's because you're on duty. Oh, it's you. How nice. You caught me just as I stepped out of the shower, so you'll have to take me as I am, robe and all. Come in. I could wait outside until you were... Uh... <laughs> A shy policeman. How charming. You can trust me. Go on in. Thank you, Professor. Over there, but the fire is nice. I always dry myself by the fire, but you interrupted that. Easy, Clover. I'm here. Tell me. I didn't say anything. Oh. Shall I get us something? A drink? Do you object to the phonograph? Some men do, you know. I saw you at Lee Kai's funeral. I saw you, too. You're different now. You're not? That's right. I'm still thirsting for knowledge. So talk to me about things Chinese, Professor. The, um, uh, Kuan Yin, for instance? For instance? A miraculous goddess believed by the Chinese who have only to kiss a wound to make it vanish. A hundred thousand dollars a kiss. It's expensive healing. There are some who would pay more. Two murders, maybe? More, if they have to. Yeah. You told me Lee Kai slapped you into the first breath you ever took. What else did he do for you? Everything. He was my father, my brother, my companion, my teacher. And, uh, Mei Ling? 
I didn't know everyone in China, policeman. Nice policeman. And a man named John Smith? John Doe, yes. John Smith, no. Give up. All right. Invite me to an earthquake sometime, will you? I'll take time out for it. You'll love it. There's nothing quite so exciting when the earth moves. Danny? Yeah? The Guan Yin. You could give her to me. I'm only a professor on a professor's salary, but I could think of some way to pay you for it. Oh? What makes you think I've got the Guan Yin? Because Lee told me he'd gone to you. Because you found mailing. Because it would have been simple for you to steal it from a dead girl. Yeah, it would have been. But you know, I, I didn't think of it. Also, she didn't have it. Now it's your turn again. Lee Kai would want me to have it. No one else. I'll make a note of it, Professor. Now, uh, would you unlock the door, please? I promised Mother I'd be home early. Of course. There's frustration everywhere, isn't there, policeman? Nothing but frustration. I think I remembered to tip my hat. I know I remembered to get back to police headquarters. I hustled Sergeant Tagli off his fat comic book and sat down on my desk to go over the sheaf of seismographs I had Skarn sent down. Not only were they dull reading, but for a long time they didn't make sense. I kept trying. You can talk, Mr. Tiger. Item one, Danny. I've questioned the Texas cowboy in his cell. Mm -hmm. The breath won't talk. Won't open his mouth. Hey, in a Texan, this must be some kind of terrible disease. Okay, physician. Item two. Item two is alibis. Good and indifferent. At the time of Lee Kai's murder, John Smith was giving a dinner party. Assistant Scarn was calling a square dance. Hey, you know, Danny, they're fun. You ever been to one? Well, ask me sometime, Mr. Tiger. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, item two continued. Professor Higgins was to a movie. The night watchman checked into the station the other side of the campus. Item three. San Francisco Customs reports this Mei Ling never had no Quan Yin. Tell me that again. The Quan Yin Mei Ling was supposed to have. She never had it. Danny, this means two people was killed for something they didn't have. Huh? You said something to Tugley? <laughs> San Francisco Customs reported they had no records on the Kuan Yin. Something clicked into place. If the Kuan Yin existed at all, I figured there was only one place where it could exist. So I went there, back to the university in the office of Lee Kai, lecturer and collector of Chinese art, now deceased. Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. We thought perhaps we would meet you here. The place was a mess. Standing in the midst of the debris was the monkey-owning poet, John Smith. And in a corner, with a soft light playing with the amber of her hair, was Kate Higgins. Danny Clover, it's always a delight to be where you are. The policeman is a meddling, stupid fool, Kate. Yeah, you warned me, didn't you? First to the hired thug, then doing a lecture on spurious loot. Mr. Clover, I'm afraid I must dispense with you. Let him talk. I like to watch his mouth. Thanks. So I'll talk. Lee Kai was a wise little man. He had the Kuan Yin all the time. All he wanted was to find out who was trying to get it away from him. He came to me because he knew his enemies would follow him to me. And it backfired, shall we say, in his face. His and Mei Ling, the girl with whom he planned the whole puppet show. You have talked enough, Mr. Clover. Quite enough. <laughs> I've been watching Smith, but where that knife came from, I'll never know. He held it low, slanting upwards for a ripping, and then he lunged at me. I sidestepped and reached back, grabbed one of Lee Kai's arc figures, and threw it at his head. He ducked, and the statue shattered against the wall. Kuan Yin. The Kuan Yin. There it was, an ebony image shining with some inner light. It held us in a kind of suspended trance. Lee Kai had been clever. He'd encrusted the Kuan Yin in a cheap plaster cast and set it alongside the rest of his art. One of the oldest tricks in the world. I came out of the trance faster than John Smith did. He lay there with the rest of the crockery, just as pale, just as broken, just as unconscious. He can no longer harm you, Danny. He was an evil man. Yeah, and tricky. Hiring that hatchet man, McGrath, to kill Mei Ling and slug me on the train. You 
case. Yes, Danny? Maybe I shouldn't ask you this case. But how come you were with Smith? I knew his greed would finally lead him to Kuan Yin, as your curiosity led you to her. And to me. To me, Danny. Kate, do you always repay kindness with murder? What are you talking about? You kill Lee Kai. Danny, you're insane. Why do you talk like that? Because the seismograph in your lab registered a disturbance at 9 o'clock last night, the time of Lee Kai's murder. How do you know it wasn't the recording of a minor shock someplace in the world? Because no other laboratory picked it up. That's when you stabbed him, Kate, at 9 o'clock. You said you were at the movies. Nobody could prove that. Danny. But you weren't, Kate. You weren't at the movies. You were in your lab. You stabbed Lee Kai and dragged his body down the hall to his office. He was a small man. You could have done that. Yes. It's no use. You would deprive me of the Kuan Yin anyhow. Two killings for the goddess of mercy. Doesn't add up. I would kill anyone who would deprive me of the Kuan Yin. Yes, you too. If I could now. Danny. Uh Uh-huh. Let me hold the Kuan Yin, Danny. Kuan Yin? Yeah. Yeah. Kuan Yin. Fabulous. Kuan Yin. I watched her hand slide down the side of her cheek and her body go taut. Her eyes fixed and the Kuan Yin narrowed. I caught her before she fell to the floor. When the boys from headquarters came, it took four of them to heave John Smith onto a stretcher. They started for Kate Higgins. I told them to mark her fragile. Even the professor of earthquakes can break. In the November sun, Broadway shimmers like some frozen city rising out of a frozen lake. It's clear, crystal clear, and its air is fresh and clean. You close your eyes because you know it's a lie. The easy laughter that smiles when your back is turned. The spectaculars that advertise the grave. The welcoming hand that turns to ice in yours. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest smile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway is My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch, and the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Mary Jane Croft, Charles Calvert, William Johnstone, Barton Yarborough, William Conrad, Junius Matthews, and Jerry Hausner. Stay tuned for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. between the Fury and Limbo is a gray stone building. That's police headquarters. That's where I was standing, in front of it, watching the patches of night sky bleed into each other. That was my detail. I was waiting for something. Uh, hi, Danny. Oh, 
Yes, Sergeant Ellis. How are things upstate? Oh, great. You know Officer Quinn, don't you? He drove Tommy and me down. Sure. How are you, Quinn? Now, fine, Lieutenant. Let's you pull up in the parking area over there. We'll meet you in the squadron for coffee a little later. Sure thing. Well, somebody asked me how I am. I served half my sentence. That makes me a semi-approved citizen, does it? You look okay to me, Tommy. Haven't changed since you were 16. <laughs> Danny, I've known you a long time. You lie. Sing Sing doesn't agree with you. Uh, sing Sing, you inhale and exhale. It's the only way you know you're living. So, I make a deal. What kind of a deal, Tommy? I don't know. I'm saving it for the D.A. After we talk the D.A. and me, I got a feeling the state's going to forget all about my manslaughter rap. Now, let me out of Sing Sing for good. Uh-huh. Uh, to you, uh-huh, too. <laughs> look, kid, when I finish spilling... Some of the choicest names in the choicest circles are going to be doing things they never thought they could do before. Like getting sentenced, like like breaking rocks, like making license plates for automobiles. Ah, like can... gosh, you, Tommy. Here, Lieutenant, I'll take off these cuffs between Tommy and me. There you are, Danny. Tommy's your prisoner. That's Danny! That's far! Tommy, don't be a fool! Come back here! Let's get him, Ellis! Ellis! <laughs> Danny! <laughs> Ellis. Oh, no. I just got too far in the car and I heard... What happened? Quinn, go upstairs and put Tommy Manor's description on the wire. I want the whole city dragged for him and I want him found. And I want him brought to me. Do that, Quinn. Sure, but how about... How about what? Sergeant Ellis. He's dead, isn't he, Danny? Dead. <laughs> Death and violence are easy commodities in the city. Easy to buy and easy to sell. A decent man named Gordon Ellis got his free for nothing. And the sudden mob that gathered round his shrunken body got theirs at bargain prices, too. Headlines on the house. Criminal escapes. Cop murdered. And the sick taste was in my mouth. I just stood while the headquarter boys did what needed to be done. Then I went back to my office and locked the door. <laughs> and waited until the sickness was gone. Danny! Danny! Yeah, yeah. What do you want? Oh, just to talk to you. Can't I talk to you, Danny? Yeah, come on in, sir. Uh, It was messy what happened out there, Danny. You selling something, Dottaglia? Uh, don't, Don't talk to me that way, Danny. For you, it hurts. So it hurts, and I bleed for you. Oh, Danny, that's not your mouth that says things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Apologies are also not necessary. What happened could have happened to anyone, not just you. I was clumsy. I was clumsy, and a man's life dropped out of my hands. I tell you, get me the file on Tommy Mann and everything, even the dust it's wrapped in. Okay, Danny, okay, in a minute. You know, the way I think of it, this deal that Tommy Mann wanted to make with the DA, well, maybe it was kosher and maybe it was crummy. Maybe this whole yes, thing... She's still here, Todd Danny, Danny, darling, I've brought you your posy. You can't face the world without a posy. Bend down so I can pin it on you. Janie, how many times I have to tell you it ain't dignified you should sell flowers in police headquarters. And without a license? You're only a Sergeant Tartagler. You will address me as Madam. Oh, stop squirming, Danny. <laughs> All right, Janie. Tell me, doll, they, are you still running competition with the post office? Keep your nose to the smell in the flowers, Danny. It's healthier. The boys on the lamb, do they still send messages to their loved ones through old Janie, the subway lily? Like Tommy Man and me? Danny, doll. I'd rather be called Lily than be planted with one. So I'm not saying one way or the other. Yeah. Pay the lady for the posy, Tartaglia. Outside of headquarters and across the rooftops and down in the roaring avenues, the city had already grown restless for the night time. It was a time of big noise and prowling and secret laughter. And somewhere inside of it and part of it, Tommy Mannon, Hoodlum. Tommy Mannon, Hoodlum. And I was living this piece of my life just for him. So I was prowling, too. And there was a place to go. A white marble house that overlooked the East River. It was on the other side of the world. 
precise pattern of house lights strung like tinsel against the dark. The precise butler who opened the door and tilted his finger at the precise angle toward the waiting room. The decor of opulence that makes its own particular breed. And the precise amount of time that went by before the greeting from mine host. Danny Clover, how nice. Won't you join us? We're in the library. <laughs> Danny, this is a surprise and a pleasant one. Oh, uh, you know Mr. Arnold, don't you? James Arnold, the attorney. Uh, Hello, Danny. What brings you all the way out here, Danny? Thought you'd be expecting me. I didn't know you were having company, Faulkner. I'll leave. To stay a while, Arnold. Thank you, Danny. I was about to suggest the same thing. Now, why have I the honor? Had any other visitor lately, like, like Tommy Manum? Why should he come here? He's a wandering boy. You might be keeping a light in the window for him. Bobby left my employ when he confessed to manslaughter. And really, Faulkner, maybe I'd better leave. You're comfortable, Arnold? The uh, drinks are all right? The uh, order? Fine, but... Then stay a while. Sit. Faulkner, when Tommy was brought back to New York, it was because he was going to turn state's evidence against some of the choicest names, he said. So? You're a choice name. You and... Arnold here, respectively an untouchable high-class hoodlum, the attorney for an untouchable high-class hoodlum, real choice names. Thank the police, Lieutenant Arnold. <laughs> We're choice. He said so. Go ahead, thank him. My... Uh, not that way, attorney mine. Thank him. Thanks. <laughs> That's better. Go ahead, Danny. I think your guns will shot down a policeman and help Tommy escape. But such a tactic would constitute a felony, Danny. I think that Tommy's being brought to town was a dodge. Tommy had powerful friends on the outside who knew when he would be dropped down. So you suggest we arrange this afternoon's fiasco? I'm suggesting it. Oh, throw it away. It ruins a good evening. It lends a, a bilious overtone to the fine conversation Arnold and I were having. Uh, doesn't it, Arnold? Yes, it makes conversation bilious. Exactly. I was explaining to Arnold the uh, seven-move mate that won Konstantinov, the chess championship in 32. Things like that devastate me. Don't they you, Danny? <laughs> men like Faulkner and his toady and you have a feeling you've been playing mumble peg with scalpels. And you take a long walk into a dismal and frayed edge of the city and it's a walk back into memory. The street where you were born is the same. The kids' games are the same. The cruel words on their mouths are not changed. The fly specked electric bulbs that hang in peeling hallways are still there. And the night sounds of a tenement still follow you as you climb the decaying stairs. Then you knock on the door that opens into a room where Tommy Mannon was born. Late. What do you want? Miss Mann. I might be. You're peddling something that's late and you come to the wrong place. Wait, I just want to talk to you. Don't you remember me, Mrs. Mann? I stopped remembering a long time ago. I'm Danny Culver. <laughs> so you are. Face is cleaner than when I saw you last. How old were you, Danny? Ten. It won't take long. Could we step inside? We can talk here. Inside would be better, Miss Now. All right. Go on in. Who? Who is it, Mrs. Manning? Who's your gentleman caller, Mrs. Manning? Hello, Mr. Venom. Huh? Oh, I know you. You're, you're, you're Danny. Danny Clover. You're the cop who let my boy get away. Have a drink, Danny. You've been wonderful to my boy. Come on, Danny, have a drink. No, don't mind him, Danny. Oh, Danny. He means no harm. He's a drunken fop, but he don't mean no harm. Go back to your bottle, Mr. Manning. <laughs> I'll do that thing, dearie. I'll just do that. You want to know if Tommy's been here, don't you? Has he? When you were a kid... Did you ever hear it said Mrs. Mannon was a liar? No. Then you'll believe me when I tell you this. If Tommy so much as put foot in this house, I'd throw him back into the gutter he wallows in. That's no way to talk about Tommy. Tommy's good. Tommy's smart. Smart. I drink to my boy, Tommy. Then maybe you'll get a word to your smart boy, Mr. Mannon. Tell him we want him. Tell him we want him bad enough to hurt him. Good night, Mrs. Manning. 
I went back to Broadway for only one reason. I was hungry. And eating alone is the loneliest time a man can have. On Broadway, there's always people. You can watch them and make up your own stories. Stories that didn't have murder in it. I dawdled over slub nuts and coffee, made up my stories, then hit the street again. Part of it hit back at me, and it had the smell of lavender in the pit of old Irish place. Danny! Danny Clover! Why, Janie, have you been following me? The post office business is blooming, Danny. Here's a posy for you. <laughs> You've already pinned one on me today, remember? Ah, but this is a very special posy. Here, take it. <laughs> Thanks, Janie. I've always wanted a cornflower. I got it from a florist. Who says he's a dear friend of yours. Thank him for me. You thank him, Danny. He doesn't live too far from here. You could get a cab. 2620 West 10th Street. First floor back. Oh? For whom do I ask? Ask for Tommy. Go quickly, Danny, dear. And ask for Tommy Nannan. 10th Street was a quarter of an hour away, and number 2620 was a hole in a block long of piled red bricks. First floor, walk back, and you know when you come to the end of the hall when you can't quite walk through the final shadow. Tommy! Tommy Manon! Open up, Tommy! It's Danny Clover! There was Tommy Manon, all right. But his state had changed. He wasn't running anymore. He was seated in a wooden chair in front of a wooden table, peeping almost slyly over a bowl of waxed fruit. I walked over to him, put my hand on his shoulder. Yeah, it was Tommy Mann, all right. And his status had really changed. He wasn't living anymore. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. At nine o'clock in the morning, Broadway is a five minute stop over for a million people. For these people, it's the five minutes that are important. It gives them time to adjust themselves to the world. It's assuring. Fran Flux assures them that there's been a change in the weather. And the headlines have shown them that the daily murder has taken place. Tabloid yelled cop killing. That was a piece in the item about me, continued on page 23. On page 23 it said that I was standing right there when Officer Ellis was killed. And I didn't know who did it. In my office at headquarters, a police sergeant named Todd Tagley had a word for it. Hmm. Did you mind repeating that, Sir Tagley? Huh? Never mind, uh... You got the date I asked for? Oh, sure, Danny. Okay, brief it to me. Yeah, Danny, yeah. On June 17, 1944, Tommy Manning confessed to beating up and killing one John Westfall. Uh-huh. This was what is known as the aftermath of a drunken brawl. Manning was convicted of manslaughter. End of brief. A real brief, huh? Yeah, it ran about like that. And the other thing, Tartaglia, about the newspapers, you fixed that? Oh, yeah, I fixed it, Danny. Like you said, not a word to the newspapers about finding Tommy Manning dead or alive. Uh, especially dead. Okay. The coroner's report? Yeah, yeah, I briefed that too. Like this. Tommy Manon was dead on arrival. Not a mark on his body. He wasn't poisoned. No heart failure. Mysterious, huh? Tartaglio. Okay, okay. Tommy Manon was drowned. Drowned? So it says on the report. Manon was, and I quote, forcibly held with his head underwater until he was drowned. And I unquote. Yeah, they figured it was in that fruit bowl on the table. Water was still clean to the wax fruit. Twist, huh? Yeah, funny killer. You got that list of character witnesses at Manon's trial? Yeah, yeah, there was one. And the one was one Georgia Webb. Address, the Brighton Hotel for Women. Brighton Hotel for Women, huh? That's uh, quite a show place. Uh, Danny? Uh, uh, this one I'll brief for myself. Brighton Hotel for Women stands at the edge of the park. And from its blood granite threshold, you can watch the old men playing at bowls on the green. And through its plate glass doors, you look in on a pink plush world. A world of plaster cupids and crystal chandeliers with electric candles. And mirrors. The reflection of mirrors. The room clerk is a crone in taffeta and tobacco stained fingers who points you to a satin tufted elevator. And the fifth floor is a hallway lighted with rails of fluorescent lamps. Some doors stood open. Georgia Webb's is closed. Come in, come in, whatever you are. Georgia Webb? 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> there we are. It's nice in here. Today they're good to me. Who? God, whispers, whatever it is that brought you to me. Come here and sit down and pour yourself a drink. Or maybe you don't drink. I'm Danny Clover. You didn't have to tell me that. What's in the name, as they say? I'm Danny Clover, Broadway Special Detail. Oh? Off duty? No, Georgia. I take it all back. Everything I've said, I take it all back. I've been catching up on my reading. Only today I read where you were once Tommy Mannon's girl. Tommy Mannon? Yeah, a punk who ran away. I thought maybe you ran here so you'd refresh your memory, so you'd remember his name. Tommy Mannon. If I knew him, it didn't make an impression. You know, there are men like that. You've testified at his trial. You gave your name, your address, and your testimony in a loud, clear voice. Clear enough and loud enough for me to hear five years later. It's true. Your ears are cute. Maybe you left something out five years ago, Georgia. Something you'd like to tell me now. About Manning? Was it Tommy Manning? Tommy Manning. Why didn't you ask him? When you find him. I found him. That's why I'm asking you. Because Tommy was dead. Oh? How'd he die? Natural causes, or did you shoot him because you're a policeman you can kill people? Someone pushed his head in the bowl of water, and Tommy Manon was drowned. That's how he died. Oh? Uh-huh. We don't like the way he died, because it could happen to other people. Like you, maybe. Could, couldn't it? So maybe now you'll remember some things that Tommy didn't get to tell us. Uh-huh. There are better ways of dying. You know, it's convincing how you talk. Tommy was a jerk, a jerk who made deals. Everything was a deal. Even the manslaughter rat. Explain it to me. Tommy didn't kill that man. He was in Baltimore when it happened. But he confessed to it. For $20,000, he confessed to it. He gave five years of his life for $20,000. <laughs> Tommy the deal maker. The poor crumb. Why doesn't somebody answer that phone? They will. Let's go over it again, Georgia. You're saying a man was killed, that it was all a frame. Who made the deal with Tommy? To you, dearie. All right. I'll be a minute, Danny. Okay. This is Georgia. Yeah. Wait a minute. All right. All right, yes. You can go now, policeman. Your time's up. What? Get out. Everything I told you was a lie. All the talk I made, it was no good. That phone call have anything to do with it? Yes. You ask me and I tell you yes. I told you not to talk anymore. Who told you that? A man who likes it when people are dead. Now you understand why I've got nothing to say to you. You understand nothing you can do or think of can make me talk to you. Yeah. That's how it is, Danny boy. And that's how it was. She really meant it. It was noon when I left the Brighton Hotel for women. I told myself I could think better if I walked. When the walk was over, I might as well have taken a cab. Nothing came, no answers to anything, no progress. Except that I was back at headquarters. In the first floor hallway, there's a bulletin board listing sheriff sales, police details, and used radios at a bargain. There was a man looking at it. He saw me and moved his lips over his teeth. This was supposed to mean he was smiling, which was supposed to mean he was glad to see me. Hello, Lieutenant. Remember me? James Arnold, isn't it? Faulkner's attorney. Yes, Faulkner's my client. You mean you work for him? You're his flunky. Mr. Clover, I work for many people. My association with Faulkner is neither more nor less intimate than my association with my other clients. Understand, I work for... many people. You've been wondering what I'm doing at police headquarters? I'll be frank with you. I haven't given you a thought. I know. That's how I affect people. Can we talk? Aren't we? Of course. I mean in private. This is private. Of course. So talk. Of course. Good things could happen to you, Lieutenant. Every night, Mr. Arnold. Every night, I say. Let good things happen to me. Now you know a secret. Fine things, Lieutenant. Like silks and satin, like me. People are interested in you and want the best for you. People want that. What people? People. Nice people who want to see you get along. Find if I interrupt? Of course, interrupt. It's about Tommy Mannon, isn't it? Of course. Now, go on. It isn't much. The nice people don't know what happened to Tommy. They don't want to know. They want this case closed as if Tommy were... Dead? Dead. They want this case closed. You can arrange it. Then nice things will happen to you. I'll 
try, Mr. Arnold. I really will. Splendid, Lieutenant. The nice people will be happy. You too. Goodbye, Mr. Club. Yeah. Pataglia. Uh, yeah, Danny. Send out a pickup for Georgia Webb. Brighton Hotel for Women. Pick her up and bring her down. Item two? Call the press room and give them the whole story on Tommy Manon. Tell them we found him dead, drowned, everything, the works. Yeah, Danny. Tell them this. Tell them we've got a witness who confessed everything. Name Georgia Webb. She talked her head off. Got that? Yeah. Then do it. Okay, Danny. Uh, where are you going? Home, Tartaglio. Home. I'm going to sleep. When I got home, the landlady had left two things for me. A bowl of matzo ball soup and a manila envelope. They both looked inviting, so I tried the envelope first. Five thousand dollars. The nice thing that Arnold had promised would happen and became so fast to such a nice round sum. What more could a man want out of life? Five thousand dollars in a dish of matzo balls. I ate the soup, kissed the landlady, put the five thousand dollars in an envelope addressed to the DA, pulled a chair over to the window and sat there, watching the city burst into fragments of electric flame. I must have sat there a long time, because when I awoke, the night had a new shadow. The shadow of a man named Falk. I brought you the morning paper, Danny. They got your name all over it, splashed in red ink. Oh, I knew I'd make it someday. Thanks, Faulkner. Here's a nickel for your trouble. Red ink could be blood in the later editions, Danny. Oh, oh a rotten place to sleep. A chair. Like some coffee? You can think better if you have coffee. And light. They tell me you're a man of virtue, Clover. Gratitude's a virtue. So, whoever told me lied. It hurts you whenever people lie to you? It hurts me when a man of virtue is ungrateful. You shouldn't have booked Georgia Webb. You shouldn't have made a talk. You shouldn't have taken my $5,000. I've been naughty, haven't I? I have one question for you, Detective Mine. One little question. Your gun gives me three chances. I'll guess in one. You want to know what Georgia told me? Possibly. Possibly. It doesn't matter. But tell me anyway. You're bluffing, Faulkner. Your act is... Precious, is that the word? But you're bluffing. You're scared to death. So? Tell me why. Explicitly. Because your life depends on Georgia. Only, I've got her tucked away where you can't touch her. Explicit, huh? Put away the artillery, Faulkner. It could be deemed ungracious for guests. Come in. Hello, Danny. Oh, you already have a visitor. It's your counselor, Faulkner. Happy day. Come in, Arnold. But now I don't have to come in. You already know what I came to tell you. Tell me anyway. I only that Faulkner is your man. The man who killed the policeman. The man who killed Tommy Manon. Are you insane, Arnold? Watch him, Danny. He's dangerous. Are you double crossed? I told you he was dangerous, Dan. He would have killed us all. Yeah, you shot him good the first time, Arnold. Why did you waste another bullet? Come on, let's take a walk to headquarters. Is it necessary? Yeah, it's necessary. I want to straighten out the record. Please, no jokes. Okay, no jokes. I'll be real sincere. Tommy Mannon took your rap, Arnold. You were the one who committed the manslaughter. Faulkner supplied a pigeon for you. Pigeon, one of his hoodlums, Tommy Mannon. May I smoke? Sure. Faulkner had to supply a pigeon because you knew all about Faulkner's operations. He was supposed to pay Tommy 20000 for taking the rap. But Faulkner's lying on the floor over there. He's dead. You'll need proof of all this. That's proof enough. You shot Faulkner in cold blood so that he'd never talk. To go on. When Tommy was transferred to New York, Faulkner went gunning for him so Tommy wouldn't talk. Only he missed and shot the wrong man. He killed a cop instead of Tommy. How does all this theorizing concern me? When you boys finally caught up to Tommy, you drowned him in a fruit bowl. Let's go, Arnold. I'm going to book you for the murder of Tommy Manning. You forgot something, Danny. I've still got my gun. <laughs> I hadn't forgotten. It was the chance I took. Arnold had already used two shots on Faulkner. I had to get him to throw away the other four. All the while I'd been talking to him, I'd been edging toward the light switch. Now I flipped it. One. I'll kill you, Silver. I had one advantage. I knew the apartment. Arnold didn't. The blackness, he could only fire at sound. I swapped an ashtray off the table. Two. I picked up a book, heaved it at the window. Three. <laughs> One more. I grabbed a chair and threw. <laughs> Four. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, Arnold, like I said, let's get you booked for murder. <laughs> stars Larry Thor as detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was conducted by Wilbur Hatch and the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Jane Morgan, Peggy Weber, Doris Singleton, Charles Calvert, Joe Kearns, Herb Butterfield, and Sidney Miller. Broadway's My Beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle. The gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. <laughs> Detective Danny Clover. Broadway is a jagged dream of concrete and steel and twisted faces, where the vision of beauty stands in a doorway at the end of the night. You go looking for it, and you're stopped by a guy selling the latest coast car or a sightseeing tour to enjoy it. And you keep looking. And the same guy stops you and lays you off, you'll never make it. You never do. It's Broadway. My feet. A cop doesn't have to go looking for that. They call you in on me. My call was a greasy brownstone building that crouched on maybe half a block where Harlem reaches up for Central Park. Its walls were covered with withered ivy and its windows were barred with iron. Not withered. On a foot-covered sign, you could make out a restful sounding name. Primrose Sanitarium. Rest home for... for what you couldn't make out. And then a door was unlocked. The man stood in front of you in a stark white jacket with his hands folded like ice pongs that hung from his narrow shoulders. It's after visiting hours, chum. I was invited. Danny Clover, Broadway special detail. Oh, we've been waiting for you. Waiting with bated breath, chum. Come on in, chum. You're the friendly type, huh? Oh, yes. All the chums in our little institution find me gentle and friendly. Right down this hall. The chums? Who are they? Sick people. Lost people. You know how it is. Do I? Of course you do. You're a policeman. That settles it. And you? What are you? Male nurse named Horace Vesper. Assistant to physician Ellery. Him and me, we're the administering angels of Primrose Sanitarium. Angels? Mm Mm-hmm, Jim, here we are. Ah, who is it, Horace? One of the patients giving us trouble? No, physician. They're all asleep like suckling babes. This is the detective who answered the call we made. Oh, how do you do, sir? I'm Dr. William Ellery. I can see you're astonished at the... State my laboratory's in, but we've had a disorder here, as you see. Uh, a bourbon, sir? On the phone, you said a man was dead. Where is he? Oh, there on my operating table. Show the detective, Horace. Sure, physician. Over here, chum. See how it is, Mr. Clover? Yeah. Who was he? One of your patients? In a sense. In a sense. You can talk plainer than that. Uh, I don't think I can. You tell him about it, Horace. Sure, physician. It was like this, chum. We found this man on our doorstep. He was... One uh, of the lost people? (laughs) You're quick, chum. No. This one was bleeding from a knife wound, but lots of blood. Stabbed. 
So I lifted him in my arms like he was a foundling babe, and I brought him here to the physician. We gave him a transfusion. Yeah, and just ate. <laughs> Only thing I could do. He'd lost too much blood already. He was dying. Uh, I haven't practiced surgery for many years, Mr. Clover, but I think my old professors would have been proud of me. Who was he? That's your problem, chum. There was no identification on him. Not a thing. This one was uh, one of the anonymous chums. And so the tedious routine of why an anonymous man died began. And it's easy to be anonymous in New York. All you have to do is like cheesecake, chub on subway, stare on windy street corners, and wish you were in Miami. You're one of the crowd worth two dimes a day to the BMP. Nobody bothers about you. But if you want someone to bother about you, there's another way. You can be found dead. Then you're an important guy. New York demands to know who you are, and you become the star attraction the next morning in the morgue. Me? I represent the police department. And I'm your custodian. I exhibit you. I'm afraid to look, Lieutenant. You'll have to, ma'am. Okay, just a second. Uh, yeah, Danny. Well, ma'am? Poor man. Your father? No, he's not my father. Thank you. Would you tell the next lady to come in? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, you know, Danny, a policeman's got to protect life and property, but... This man is property, Tartaglia. Somebody's. Yeah, I know. But they didn't mention this detail when I took my civil service exam. Uh, Danny, 20 years, and I'm not used to it yet. That makes you different. What did you find on Dr. Ellery? Oh, uh, so far, legitimate. License, everything. Oh, another one, Danny. Yeah. This way, ma'am. I'm Mrs. Bullock. This is Eugene Bullock. I just thought... That's right, Yeah. I just thought... Well, he didn't come home. Mr. Bullock didn't for a whole night. And... Uh, he's never done that before. Never. Never. That's right, Leah, water. Uh, Here, Mrs. Bullock. Drink this. Thank you. Today is our 25th anniversary, I thought. Well, I, I knew Mr. Bullock wouldn't want to miss that. This was our first trip to New York, you see. Mr. Bullock hadn't been out of Iowa before. Well, you don't have to tell me now. Yesterday. Yesterday he left the hotel. Mr. Bullock had an appointment at 7. I've always liked pearls, and he was going to get the necklace. Surprise. I didn't let on, but I knew about it. The appointment with whom? He, oh, he had had the money with him, and he was going to see Mr. Branch. Mr. Eben Branch. Eben Branch. Got that, that argument? Yeah. I didn't want to ruin Mr. Bullock's flesh. I knew what it meant to do. There wasn't much more she had to tell us after that. Then she asked to be left alone with her husband. I planted her Taglia in the shadows and got out of there. The New York telephone directory is a jewel, a dream, a work of art. It gave me even Branch's business, Trader. His address, 12 Gramercy Park South. And his telephone number. What I needed, I couldn't get by dialing, so I called on Eben Branch, Trader, 12 Gramercy Park South. From the police, eh? Bail yourself from a bamboo fan, my boy. The rain is taking more humid, I think. The place of Eben Branch was a fragment torn out of a tropical paradise and enclosed in double panel glass. Even to the white cargo type rain pouring down in the space between the glass walls from the contraption bearing the seal of approval of the New York City engineers. Tropical birds played tropical games and sang sad songs in huge cages of gilded bamboo. And sitting in a fan-shaped wicker chair was Eben Branch, wearing yellowed linen, his hands touching the head of a girl, a silent girl in a jade sarong who strummed a tropical-type guitar. 
You'll find it pleasant here, Miss Clover. Far from the terrors of that jungle out there. You'll stay for a bit? I may never leave. Splendid. You're a man of quality, sir. I knew it the moment I saw you. I said as much to the girl here. Didn't I, girl? And uh, now what can I do for you, sir? You could wake me up. Oh, it's no dream, Mr. Clover. All this was bought at a good price. A few souls, a few deaths, and a fantastic hoard of pearls. Oh, the South Seas, a veritable paradise, boy, veritable. Wouldn't it have been simpler to leave paradise where it belonged? I only asked because I wouldn't know. You mean go back? Uh huh? Impossible. No? Of course, impossible. The moment I set foot on that island, Nirvana, I should be gutted by the native I stole the pearls from. <laughs> Didn't you tell you, Mr. Clover, that was 30 years ago, not your domain? What concerns me is a man named Eugene Bullock. Eugene Bullock? Do you know where he is? I asked you first. Well, the Simpleton had an appointment with me last night at midnight. Midnight? His wife said he was to meet you at 7. Men lie to their wives. As I say, Mr. Clover, midnight is the hour at which I find myself most amenable to the conduct of this. Till then, I have uh, other matters. In the phone book, it says you're a trader. Is that a business? Trader? The word I used to make me glamorous and unreal. Hmm? Sir, I insert my advertising matter to attract suckers. I sell pearls, Mr. Clover, for cash. I see. Only cash. Mr. Bullock wanted pearls. I was prepared to sell him $5,000 worth. Did you? That's the tragedy, Mr. Clover. Simpleton never showed up. I need $5,000 desperately. Paradise comes high, Mr. Clover. And so, as the sun sank slowly in the west, I bade a fond farewell to the land of palmettos and jasmine and exiled beach boys. If what Branch had told me was true, the pattern of Mr. Bullock's life needed completing, his last five hours of living. What happened to Mr. Bullock last night between seven and midnight? People had died during those hours, but why Mr. Bullock? And there's an extra added question. What happened to the $5,000 he had on his person? By the time I got back to headquarters, the description of Mr. Eugene Bullock had been circulated all over the area. Hiya, Danny. How's it going? Oh, hello, Marty. Okay. How's the cab business? Uh, as the saying goes, yeah. What do you need? Huh? I think I got something. Look, the little guy that, uh, Eugene Bullock. Yeah? Maybe he was in my cab last night about 7 o'clock. We had some pictures taken downstairs, Marty. Here. Look. That him? Uh, looks calmer, but yeah, that's him. Last night he looked more excited. Like how? Like so. He gets in the cab and he says, close around. I close. Mm-hmm. Through the rear view mirror, I see he's got the same expression like a kid writing with chalk on a wall, you know? So I ask the question, and he says, yeah. Where'd you take him? Oh, place to the village and a spot I know in Chinatown, places like that. Nothing suits this guy, nothing. Then we hit a dime a dance dive up 105th Street. This he goes wild about. He loves it. He pays me and he leaves. Uh, is that what you want, then? <laughs> No, whatever it is, no. If that's how we say no in Spanish. Por favor. Look, who's around here? I can tell I'm from the police. Adios, senor. Adios. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What frightened you about the word police, senorita? Get away. Get away from me. Oh, how it's in English, huh? You learn fast. Let's go, senorita. Let's go where we can talk without background music. Take off, we're chatting. We're having an end of a flight conversation. I am intruding. Sanchez. Intruding's the word. Beat it. We do something about your mouth. You tried, friend. You really did. What do you know? Man gets knocked down in the fight. Nobody pays any attention. This what happened last night, Rosa? This what happened last night? Music happened last night. With maracas, Latin music. When we were interrupted, I was saying, let's go. 
Let's go. Wait. All right. Last night I was dancing with a sailor, a twisty sailor boy from Peru, and then a man was stabbed. The man died. Oh, bad. Somebody sees blood, somebody screams. Everybody runs out. There's even the pretty sailor boy. The wounded man is lying on the floor. Sad, but not dead. Sanchez helped me to lift him to my automobile. I drove him a little way to a sanitarium where the doctor. I left him. Why did you take the trouble? Why didn't you run, too? I felt sorry for the little man lying there. Oh? How about $5,000, officer? The little man had that much with him when he came here. He didn't have it later. Senor, I have never seen $5,000 in my life. Is that the truth, Rosa? Is that the, the truth? But you want me anyhow, don't you? I am arrested, yes? She was arrested, yes. And booked, yes. And Sanchez, her admirer, feet, also. It was simple and it was fast. I had the victim, the motive, and two grade A suspects. I told the boys in the press room the solution of the murder of Eugene Bullock was only a matter of hours. Simple routine, I told them. I've never been so wrong in all my life. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. out there, Danny. Twelve guys who could have been at the dance hall at the time of the stabbing. Thanks, Dr. Eglin. This is what we call a police lineup, Rosa. Rosa? Yes? The lights are so arranged that we can see those twelve men and they can't see us. You can say what you like and the men won't know we're speaking. I see. Yes. Now, I want you to pick out the men you recognize. The men who were in the dance hall night before last. Go ahead. That one, Lieutenant. The tall man on the end. Well, that's Audie Westfall, Danny. Gets his name on the blotter like clockwork. Vagrancy. Commutes between the Bowery and the drunk tank. Two convictions for purse snatching. Never mind, I'll tell you. Let's just run them down. Who else, Rosa? The one in the brown sweater with the eyeglasses. Yeah. Who else? That one. You mean the one holding the cap? Oh, yes, that one too, but I mean the one next to him. Go ahead. That one. And that one. Yes, I'm sure of it. Keep going. The man without hair and with the mustache. You remember him? I danced with him. He wanted to meet me later. Ah, okay, Dr. Tiger. Let him go. All of them. Tell him to go home. Uh, yeah, yeah, Danny, sure. I'll take Rosa back to the matron and lock her up again. Well, senor, what are you doing? I don't understand. Well, I'll explain. You're lying. You're covering up for someone. The last man you pointed out, the baldy who danced with you. He was planted in the lineup. He's a cop. Take her away, Tataglia. Maybe her boyfriend's got a better memory. Uh, thanks, officer. I'll call you when I'm through. Cigarette? Sanchez? No. Not from you. It's a pack. Keep them. They're yours. By what right you hold me here? By what right? A man was murdered. That gives us rights. Him and me. You are crazy insane. I kill no one, police stupid. But you, you're a man of honor, huh, Sanchez? Como? I'll explain. You're a man of honor. You love Rosa. It degrades you if anyone manhandles her. I will kill her. That's what I say. 
You killed Eugene Bullock because he made passes at Rosa. We're doing a wish on the act for lease of this great space. You stabbed him, and then you got a bonus. A $5,000 bonus. And that healed your wounded honor. You are only trying, police. I know guys like that always trying. We have a word for them in Spanish. Be polite, Sanchez. It's easier when you're polite. Okay. I'm polite. That's good. What have you done to Rosa? I wondered how long before you'd ask me that. What have you done to Rosa? We had to. She confessed to the murder of Eugene Bullock. You lie. Your mouth lies. She confessed, Sanchez. She only does it to protect me. I, I stop him. I stop him. Tell me about it. You... What like you say? This, this Bullock, he put hands on Rosa. He stole hands on Rosa's body. This happened many times with Rosa. The hands of an old man. Yeah, yeah. The five thousand dollars. Where is it? Oh, leave me alone, please. Leave me alone. All right, Sanchez. Let's get a stenographer. Uh, did he confess, then? Yeah. What do you want, uh, Taglia? Oh, I, I thought you'd want to know about this, Danny. You got your fish car is out of the lake in Central Park. When? About an hour ago. Hey, Danny, get the Sanchez to confess. That could mean a promotion. To what, Tartaglia? To oblivion? You have it in the palm of your hand, sewn up clean and neat, and it slips away because a man named Horace Vesper was found dead in the lake. That changes it. You shudder at the fatal mistake you almost made. You shudder. By that time, you're pushing your way through a crowd whose eyes are vacant and unblinking. And it's the same crowd you always see in attendance to the public dying. The setting was nice, though. Central Park never looked better. The leaves turning to gold, the sun shimmering on the lake. Trucks, fat and happy. The dashing blue uniform of New York's finest. And the lump of a man lying gray and sodden on the bank. That's him, Danny. Some kid in a rowboat saw him down in the water. That's how we had to... No marks of violence on him. No, no, Danny. This guy must have been one of them health addicts. He goes in the water without no shirt on. I figured the guy goes in for a dip because, like I say, with him, health is a thing. And the shock of the cold water surprises him and stops his heart from beating. That's how you figured it. Yeah. Bad job, don't it? I'm thrilled. Uh, uh, here is the deceased effects, Danny. Uh, driver's license made out the Horace Vesper Criminal Sanitarium. Blue Shield medical card, a wallet with no dough. But plenty of pictures of his Navy buddies. How do you figure buddies? Yeah, this was a bit of detective work, right, Danny. See this watch card? Yeah, but tell me about it anyway. It's a cleverly contrived watch card contrived from one of Horace Vesper's Navy dog tags. That's how I figure the guys in the pictures are his buddy. Let's see it. Sure, Danny, here. Cleverly contrived, huh? With my dog tags, I did something different. Well, Danny, you, you figure it like I figure it? No, I don't figure it like you figure. How you figure? I figure like murder. Huh? Yeah, huh. Only I got like to prove it. <laughs> Danny, come on in. Thanks, Maria. How's the darling of the police laboratory? Everything okay? Need some new Bunsen burners and things? Tell Danny about it. I'll fix it. How about just walking on little cat feet, huh, Danny? <laughs> Am I interrupting something? Well, Dr. Sinsky over there is working on something important. An experiment that can't stand the sudden jolt. Yeah? What is it? It's lunch. Cheese to play. Oh. Well, then just tell me what your brains and equipment turned up on Horace Vesper. And I'll get to out of here. Well, we ran a marsh test uh -huh. in outline, Danny. No signs of poison. A sedative, yes, but a mild one, nothing lethal. Was he drowned? Not that either, Danny. No trace of water in the flora. Sorry, in the lungs. He didn't drown. Oh, I didn't think he did. What else, Maria? Well, there are two punctures, one on each arm, made by a large, tight needle. The uh, type they use for transfusions, I'd say. Yeah. What else? Look in the microscope, Danny. One right there. Yeah. You see what I mean? Well, not exactly. All I see is somebody looking back at me. That's your eyeball, Danny. Adjust it. Here, let me. Now I'm winking at myself. <laughs> I'll tell you about it. And you won't believe it. I'll believe it. Tell me. Horace Vesper's Navy dog tag has made a liar out of science. 
Get off the dime, Maria. What are you trying to say? Well, stop this, what I'm trying to say. Horace's dog tag says he had type A blood. The microscope shows something else. Like what? In the specimen I've examined of his blood, there are too many clots. Both A and B cells are agglutinized. Come on, come on. Mr. Vesper's blood has been tampered with. Now it's both type A and B. Strange, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't answer, Maria, because everybody knows there'll always be a new way, a strange way to kill a man. Instead, I went back to Primrose Sanitarium. Its door stood open, so I walked in. I found the hallway that led to the laboratory and felt my way along it in the darkness. And that's what I got. Darkness. Lieutenant, I, I, I hold myself personally accountable for what happened. Uh, one of the patients somehow uh, got into my office and somehow got into my desk. He somehow got your gun and somehow shot me. Why? Oh, his protest against the world, I suppose, uh, the kind of world he's made for himself. Uh, anyone outside of it is an enemy. Now you're going to keep things locked up, huh? Now I'll see to it. But it's Horace's job. He should know better. Horace. Now, 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 now lie still, Lieutenant. You've lost a lot of blood. You're weak. I am. Looks like a flesh wound to me. Ah, uh, it's worse than that. You'll be better, though. After you had a transfusion and some rest. A whole lot of rest. I'm weak, huh? I can sit up. See, it hurts. I can do it. Oh, don't be a fool, Lieutenant. Lie down. You'll only aggravate your condition. Yeah. You mustn't aggravate conditions. Uh, the transfusion, Lieutenant. It won't hurt a bit. We'll just add your arm with alcohol. Uh, and now, I'll get these things ready. My blood type's A, Doctor. Yes, yes, I know. I ran a test on it while you were asleep. We mustn't make a mistake. Give me a transfusion of type B blood. Because that wouldn't make me well. That would kill me. The way it killed Mr. Bullock. I, I beg your pardon. You didn't give Bullock a transfusion to save his life. You gave him a transfusion to kill him. Ah, oh, poor, poor fellow. Delirious. You killed Horace, too. Instead of it in this bourbon, I figured. Then you gave him a transfusion of B blood while you took A blood out of him. Cute. You wanted all Mr. Bullock's funny yourself. Not this greedy doctor. Now, Lieutenant. Oh, remember your Hippocratic oath, don't you? You need that transfusion, Lieutenant. Put down that needle. You're delirious. You have to be quiet. Put down now. that needle. You have got to be quiet, sir. <laughs> Here's some quieting for you. <laughs> you just rest right there, Doctor. That's the way it ended. The part of it that I knew about. I had to be told the rest. That the police found the doctor in the corner of the laboratory gibbering to a bottle of bourbon. That I fought them all the way to the emergency ward and that nobody in medical history protested the way I did. All they wanted to do, they said, was give me a transfusion. on the house and have another one show. Hey, mister, I can really show you the sight. Frenzy and the big noise. Mostly it's the big noise. Otherwise, you'd hear the heartbreak. Because it's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the most of the smile in the world. Broadway. My feet. 
standing in front of a candelabra of seven candles, the palms of her hands pressed against her face. You wait, then you press the bell. Danny. Danny Clover. Oh, it's good you came tonight, Danny. Good job, Mrs. Brandeis. Thank you, Danny. Please, come in, come in. Danny. You got some news? You, you heard something about my son? Yes, that's why I came, Mrs. Brandeis. I was... In the parlor. There you can sit down. There you can tell me the news of my son. Your husband, Mrs. Brandeis? Yes. Yeah. All right, listen to him, Danny. Already, Mr. Brandeis is paying for our son the prayer for the dead. Please sit down. Thanks. To him, Maurice already dead. He said to me, Danny... 
Mr. Brenda said that no son of his was a murderer. To him, he said such a son is dead. And to him, it, it's not Maury who sits in prison. A stranger. Uh, I don't know how to say this, Mrs. Brandeis. Oh, say it, then. Say it. Mrs. Brandeis, the plea for stay of execution. You see, the board that handles... Oh, what, then? Say it. The execution takes place Monday morning at one o'clock. They're going to kill my son. Execute. That's the word they use for killing my son. What can I say to you? Say this. Tell them no, then. Tell them they can't do this. This execute. Tell them, Danny. Mrs. Brandeis. Tell them this is a notion they've got that my boy is a murderer. This war, these people who think such a thing, what do they know of Maury? There's nothing I can do. Maury didn't kill anyone. You tell them that, Danny. If Maury was innocent, I'd tell them. Oh, Danny, Danny. A mother who has looked into the heart of her son tells you this. Maury didn't do this thing. Her mother tells you this. I'd better go, Mrs. Brandeis. Yeah, then you go. Good night. When I left, the chant of an old man's prayer for his dead son was in my ears. But rising above it was a twisted melody all mixed up with lament and hope and desperation. And that would be Mrs. Brandeis. And that would be all I had to go on. The instant of a man's dying had been written down and sealed and approved. And all I had to do was to tear it all up like it had never happened. And that could be the mission of a fool. So I'm a fool. So I went back to my office headquarters and waited for Sergeant Tartaglia to bring in the file on Maury Brandeis. And when he brought it in, it was 10 o'clock of a Friday night. It's 10 o'clock, Danny. That means something to you? Oh, yeah, Danny. How did you bring me on Maury Brandeis? Oh, everything. The works. But I could sketch it for you, Danny. This way, we could all go home earlier, you and me. All right. Sketch it. <clears throat> A sketch. To wit. On May 22, 1949, at 11 o'clock of the same evening, May 22, 1949, one Maury Brandeis did hold up the jewelry shop of one Charles Gilbert. Mm -hmm. He did, in process of hold up, shoot one Mary Gilbert in the back. Said Mary Gilbert being the daughter of aforesaid Charles Gilbert, jewelry shop proprietor. What says he did all that? What says is two witnesses. One, Phil Alexander, male, and one, Nicky Thomas, female. They saw the killing? Uh, yeah, Danny, yeah. What they seen goes like this. Phil and Nicky was walking home from a dance. They see Brandeis with a gun in the girl's back. The girl has got her hands in the air. They hear the shot, they run to call the police. How did they know it was Brandeis? Oh, they didn't, Danny, they didn't. They had presence of mind to note down the license number of a new Nash car standing on the street in front of the store with its motor running. In this car was found the gun, the loot, the ownership tag of one Mari Brandeis, which was found asleep drunk in his house two hours later by one of our boys. Can I go home now? Uh, yeah, that tag, go home. <laughs> Then it was 10.15. In the night, the city makes a somber, tearing music that seeps through stone and shrieks through your open window. So you slam the window. It's still there. You try to memorize the details that will bring death to a man on Monday morning at 1 o'clock. And finally, when your eyes feel as if they'll crack, you've memorized them. Then it's dawn and you grab some sleep. And you waken and it's something to eat. Then you wait for a man named Charles Gilbert to open his jewelry shop. You watch him move slowly out of the curtain shadows at the rear of his shop. You slowly walk, you slowly unlock the door. And it's nine o'clock Saturday morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Beautiful morning, isn't it? You're Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Charles Gilbert. Yes, that's me. You're early, aren't you? On your way to work? Mr. Gilbert. Oh, I know. You want to buy before the rest will come in, please. You'll find I have some excellent values on sale, sir. You read my ad in the news? Expensive, but worth it if customers come so early. I'm Danny Clover, police department. I want to talk to you, Mr. Gilbert. Is it about the murder of my daughter? Can we go in the back of the store and talk, Mr. Gilbert? Yes, of course. Through the curtains, Mr. Clover. Thank you. You understand, Mr. Clover, that whatever words we will speak over my daughter will bring me great pain. I'll make it as easy as I can. I'm trying to save a man's life, Mr. Gilbert. 
a murderer's life? There's a question in my mind if he is a murderer. There's none in mine, Mr. Clover. I want you to go over the night of a holdup with me, Mr. Gilbert. Everything, the simplest, the most ordinary details. Everything. I have already done that with you, police, Mr. Clover. Is that how you work? To rake through a man's brain? That's how we work. It was a Thursday night. It was late. Someone pounded on the door, kept pounding. My daughter said she'd get up and see what it was. I told her not to bother. They'd go away, I told her. I told her. Go on, Mr. Gilbert. Ruth slipped on her old coat and went to the door. She opened it. I heard her say, what do you want? And then I heard the door close and then whispers and then the shot. That terrible, terrible crashing sound and Ruth's cry to me. Like when she was a little girl. No, no, Mr. Clover. You have customers, Mr. Gilbert. Good morning. Well, you mind if we look around, Dad? My wife and me are in the market for a bubble. <laughs> Nothing's too good for my wife. Is that right, wife? Uh, please go ahead. I'll be in the back of the store. Just call me when you're ready. Yeah, sure thing, Dad. Do you want more, Mr. Clover? All of it. All of it. I picked up my child, Mr. Clover, and put her on the bed. She was still alive then. I took off her coat. Coat. He shot her in the back. I held her like a baby in my arms. And she died. You want to save a murderer's life, Mr. Clover? Save it and my curse on your coat. No coat was mentioned in the transcript. Why wasn't it mentioned, Mr. Gilbert? How would I know, Mr. Clover? Where is that coat? I gave it away. To whom? To a boy who comes in Saturdays and cleans my shop. A boy by the name of Robert Shaw. Do you know where he lives? In Harlem, Mr. Clover, 1229 West 117th Street. I know because I have to send him postcards to reach him. The coat is important? I wouldn't know. I'm sorry, Mr. Gilbert, but I have... I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. <laughs> Saturday afternoon, 2 p.m. Standing there in front of a house in Harlem and trying not to look like a policeman. But somehow the people who lean from the windows and stare at you, the over-the-shoulder glances you get from passers-by, you can't hide it. So you pat a kid on the head and smile and look around, but nobody smiles back at you. Not even the kid. The man you're waiting for acknowledges your greeting with a short nod. Yeah, I'm Robert Shaw. I'm Danny Clover, police. Well? I need some help from you, Shaw. For me? Help? It's about a coat. A woman's coat. Hmm. I've been lucky. I've found an honest job. I don't have to steal. I didn't say anything about stealing. No, no, you didn't. You just said it was about a woman's coat. A coat that belonged to a murdered girl. Mary Gilbert? That's right. Where's that coat? My father gave it to me. I didn't ask him. He said, here, here, Robert, here's a coat. Said maybe I could use it. But a coat for a woman? Yeah, for a woman. For my sister Ethel. I gave it to her. Where does your sister live? 1115 West 138th Street, apartment 3. But you won't find her there. Where is she? Well, try the Harlem Hospital, mister. I got word this morning early that that's where my sister was. In the hospital. Saturday afternoon, 3 p.m. You walk slowly up the worn sandstone steps. Slowly because somehow you never hurry when you can walk into a hospital. And a nun accepts your question quietly and tells you to wait because the girl's asleep. And you wait. And your eyes start through open doorways in the hospital corridor. And you wait. And it's four o'clock. And it's five and still you wait. And the smell of the hospital melts into the furtive sounds and the quiet footsteps in your doors. And then there's a gentle tap on your shoulder and it's eight o'clock. You're shown a ward and a numbered bed. The tired girl who tries not to be frightened. But I've already been questioned by the police, Mr. Grover. I know. This will only take a moment. What do you want to know? About the coat, Ethel. About the coat your brother gave you. I told him. I told him all about it. Tell me. I was walking home, Mr. Clover. 
It was late. When? Last night. It was very late, about midnight. That's when it was. Tell me just what happened, Ethel. As soon as I stepped down from the curb, the alley curb, Mr. Clover, he came out of the alley. It was dark. Then you don't know who he was? I still don't, Mr. Clover. He stood close to me and whispered in my ear. He said he would give me ten dollars for the coat I was wearing. The coat? Yes. Then he hit me. He started to tear the coat. Tried to tear it off of me. But he screamed and the man ran. And a policeman was standing over me. I see. Where's the coat now? It's over there, Mr. Clover. It's in the closet. This one? Yes. Take it, Mr. Clover. Take it. It's a dead girl's coat. I don't want it anymore. Nine o'clock. Pataglia brings the dressmaker's dummy into my office, drapes it with the dead girl's blouse, puts the coat over it. The bullet hole in the blouse matches the sewn-up bullet hole in the coat, right on the same line. Ten o'clock, it still matches. Ten thirty. Pataglia sends out for spud nuts and coffee. Eleven o'clock. We've torn the coat apart. Nothing there. Eleven thirty. We've got a torn-up coat. Nothing else. Twelve o'clock. <laughs> A boy's life. And it's Sunday. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. May as well face it, a lot of your conversation during the course of a week is about the shows on CBS on Sunday nights. Charlie McCarthy, Edgar Bergen, Jack Benny, Red Skelton, Corliss Archer, and Eve Arden as the romantic high school teacher, our Miss Brooks. Drama lovers, next week we'll surely be discussing Irene Dunn's performance in the Barretts of Wimpole Street this Sunday night on the Family Hour. And everybody will be talking about Margaret Whiting's songs on the Contented Hour and Horace Hyde's newest finds on his Youth Opportunity Program. All of these great shows will be heard this Sunday night on most of these same CBS stations, with Jack Benny being heard on them all. you figure it, it still comes out 10 o'clock Sunday morning. It still comes out 15 hours between you and the execution for murder of a boy named Maury Brandeis. And what you've got to save his life is a girl's coat with a bullet hole in it. And it makes no sense. So you make a Sunday call on a man and a woman who saw Maury kill a girl. I was just reading the Sunday funnies to Nikki, Mr. Clover. She likes it when I do that. Don't you, Nikki? Sure. Sure, I like it, Phil. <laughs> I sure you do, honey. <laughs> I have much time, Mr. Alexander. I'm trying... Yeah, sure, I understand. You're trying to save a killer's life. <laughs> this is a twist for a cop, isn't it, Mr. Clover? Phil, please. That's all right, Mickey. Clover well, understands I'm only kidding, don't you, Clover? I want you to tell me exactly what you did and what you saw the night of the holdup. Well, this is on the record. You didn't look it up? I want to hear you tell me. We were at a dance. We were walking home... Uh, Mr. Clover wants me to tell him, honey. <laughs> it's... Still the same, Clover, like on the record. We were to dance, Nicky and me. What dance? Well, I don't like to repeat myself, but the dance was the same dance like I testified. What dance? At the Cruiser Social Club on Grand Street. <laughs> Nicky, I'll tell him. Sorry. The Cruiser Social Club on Grand Street. I was walking Nicky home because that's romantic to walk with your best girl. And then we see through the window Maury holding up the girl in the jewelry store. How could you tell it was a holdup? Ah, such a simple question, Mr. Clover of the police department. The girl had her hands up in the air. How did you know it was Maury? Because we saw a car parked at the curb with a motor running. When we heard the shop, we took the license number and called the police. It was only the next morning we knew it was Maury. <sighs> I marry a girl and 
Now I find out she likes to talk. Oh. Mrs. Alexander, was the girl wearing a coat when she was shot? She... May I? The girl was wearing a coat. Anything else, Clover? No, Phil. That's all, Phil. Now you can go on reading the funny paper, Phil. Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m. On a short run, like the one from New York to Austin, the train draw was on schedule. Then the automobile rides to prison, the warden fight treating, and finally the walk into the prison yard. Maury Brandeis would be there, the warden said. Maury's request, he wanted to be outside on a Sunday afternoon before he died. Request granted. Complete with chaperone, a guard sitting on an orange crate holding a shotgun and sucking on a matchstick. Maury. Maury. I'm Maury. I'm Maury Brandeis. I'm Danny Clover, Maury. Do you remember me? What do you want? What do you want me to say? Did you kill that girl, Maury? They say I killed a girl. They say I shot her. Did you? Yes, I killed her. I believe I did. They told me I did. They keep telling me I did. I believe it. You went into the jewelry shop to rob it. When Mary Gilbert came downstairs, you made her turn around and you shot her in the back. You said what you did, Maury. Maury? Listen to me. Yeah. You're sure of it, then, that you murdered Mary Gilbert? I was drunk. I was at the dance, and I got drunk. Why did you get drunk, Maury? I did it before. I liked it. Maury, I'm trying to help you. I promised your mother I'd help you, and there's not much time. I know, I know, I know that. I'm going to be electrocuted. They, they say it won't hurt. Do you know that? Did you know they, they can electrocute a man, kill him, and it's painless. I can't help you when you talk like that. Think, Maury. Think of something to tell me. Something I can go on. Some place it'll take me. Someone I can talk to. What happened that night when you were drunk? Why did you leave the dance? I was drunk. Did you have the gun when you left the dance? Drunk. Why did you tell her to turn around before you shot her? Almost the way I feel right now. Drunk. And you really don't remember. You don't remember a thing. I killed her. They keep asking me to say so. They say a man always confesses before he's electrocuted. It makes a man feel better. So I'm saying it. I killed her. And I don't feel anything at all. 4.45 on a Sunday afternoon. And all I had was a hat full of dried leaves. And back to the office at headquarters and staring at a headless dressmaker's dummy draped in a blouse and a torn tweed coat. Staring at it until it grew ahead and laughed at me. Laughed at me when I asked him why anyone would want that coat. And not tasting the cigarettes and the coffee. And feeling time run through your fingers like dust in that rotten clock. Why don't you go home now, Danny? Why? Well, because it's getting late. It's almost nine o'clock. You read and reread the records and the reports, the impersonal data, the typewritten words on municipally furnished station. The reason why a man must walk to his death in a few short hours. And the dressmaker's dummy puts her hand on her hip and winks at you. Danny. Danny, I, I brought you some more coffee. Uh, Tagler. Huh? Do you think Maury killed that girl? You want an honest answer or an answer that will make you feel good? Just an answer. Okay, Danny. Yeah, I think Maury Brandeis killed Mary Gilbert. I think no matter what personal reasons you got for going through all this, Maury Brandeis will still die at 1 o'clock tomorrow morning because he killed that Gilbert girl. You through talking? Yeah, Danny, I'm through. Why did someone beat up a girl to get that coat back? I don't know. How did they know about the coat the same time I did? I don't know. How? How? You jostled your coffee, Danny. How did they know about the coat the same time I did? I told you, Danny, I don't know. Call up Gilbert's jewelry shop. Get me Gilbert. Danny, look, it's 11.30 o'clock at night. Let the poor guy alone. Let him sleep. Call him up. Okay, okay, Danny. Here, let me find the number. Now, nah, here it is. Get 
Give me that phone. Okay, Danny. Don't bite my head off for a lousy phone. Here. Come on, come on. Hello. Mr. Gilbert? Yes, this is Mr. Gilbert. Who is this? This is Danny Clover, Mr. Gilbert. Have you no consideration at all, Mr. Clover? One question, Mr. Gilbert. Who was in your shop when I was talking to you? Really, Mr. Clover? Who was in your shop? Let me think. Oh, I, I remember now. It was Bill and Nikki Alexander. Thanks, Mr. Gilbert. Something, Danny? Something. Give me a squad car, Tataglia. Midnight and Sunday was over. And in one hour, Monday would be over for Maury Brandeis. The siren gouges a path through the city swiftly like a wild saw trailing across the dark. And you ride it. Inside of you, you're screaming with it. There's a light in the window of the house you're looking for, and the odds get better. From a million to one to a thousand to one. Just a minute. Come on, come on. We'll be ready in just a... Oh. Going someplace, Nikki? I asked you, going someplace? Not the cab, Nicky? No, no, it's not the... It's not the cab, Phil. It's Danny Clover. Something you want, Clover? Relax, Phil. I'm talking to Nicky. Going someplace, Nicky? While the bag's packed. Right. It's simple. I'm talking to Nicky. Well, Nicky? It's our second honeymoon. Every six months, we take a second honeymoon. When did you get married, Nicky? In May. May 23rd. The date's right here inside my ring. Oh, I'll show you. The day after Mary Gilbert was murdered, wasn't it, Nicky? An impulse. Nicky and me were impetuous. Impetuous? Or a wife can't testify against her husband? Tell me, Nicky. How did Phil kill Mary Gilbert? Are you kidding? Shut up, Phil. I asked Nicky. Phil, what? Was it like this, Nicky? You waited outside while Phil was robbing that store. Then Mary came in and surprised him. He held a gun on her, made her turn around and shot her in cold blood. That's what Maury Brandeis did, remember, Clover? That's why he's going to burn you. both got frightened, Nicky. You saw Maury passed out in his car. Phil planted the gun and whatever he stole in the glove compartment. Was it like that, Nicky? Phil, please, tell me. Keep quiet. Tell me. Come on, Nicky, tell me. I'm tired, Mr. Clover. I'm so tired of... Look at you. Shut up. <laughs> Leave her alone. I said leave her alone. Yeah. Okay, Phil, over there, face the wall and put your hands up. Like I said, over against the wall and keep the hands high. I'm going to book you for something, and it might as well be for wife feeding. Danny Clover, send a wagon over to 1010 West 86. Yeah, Danny, right away. What's up? I got a wife feeder. I got a... Wait a minute. No. No, I know. I got a murderer. Let's well, stay where you are. Hey, what? What did you say, Danny? Hold on to Taglia. You did it, Phil. You killed Mary Gilbert. It's over, Phil. He knows. You don't know nothing. What are you talking about, Claude? The coach you tried to tear off a girl's back in Harlem proves it. You're fishing. You don't know nothing. You heard me talking to Mary Gilbert's father about the coat, so you knew it was important. Now I know why it's important. I'm listening. I'm listening, but all I hear is noise. And listen closer. The bullet hole in the coat was in line with the bullet hole in her blouse. That means her hands weren't in the air like you told us they were. Listen to him, Nicky. Ain't he a kick? Yeah. Yeah. The coat rises when a person holds his hands in the air like yours is doing now, Phil. If I shot you in the back, the bullet hole in your coat would be a couple of inches lower than the one in your shirt. So, so you lied. So you committed murder. So you're both under arrest. Tataglia. Danny, Danny, are you all right? Yeah, get off the phone, Tataglia. i got to put through a call to Sing Sing. Nikki's face as I waited for the call to go through. And it was the face of a woman who was dead, without tears, without bitterness. Only the final, the desperate rejection of life. And then I was talking to the warden. Then I hung up and made another call to Mr. Brandeis to tell him his son was back from a journey into shadows. To tell him he need no longer pray for the dead. <laughs> Pretty and scarlet. 
Scarlet's the color you've known in other places and other times. So you don't rip the mask off because you couldn't stand what you'd see. Because it's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. <laughs> Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Lillian Bayef, David Ellis, Harley Bear, Tony Barrett, Jester Hairston, and Vivian Faber. <laughs> Some people go to the Caribbean, some go to the Klondike. Others who don't care for treasure diving or nugget hunting just stay at home and latch on to sing it again. You don't have to barrel barracuda, you don't have to grow a five-foot beard. With Sing It Again, all you have to do is tell Dan Seymour when he phones who owns the Phantom Voice. It's 53000 in prizes and cold hard cash in that Sing It Again jackpot this week. Sing It Again follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you find Broadway is my beat every Saturday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. glittering center of a glittering universe that's propped against the shadow and its desolation. A gaudy room with a lie in its teeth. And the lie is in gorgeous technicolor and the screaming of trumpets from the dancing on the street. And there's silence, too. So still, so empty, you can hear a teardrop. Whatever it is, it's Broadway. My beat. <laughs> Midnight, Broadway is a place that pulls up safe. Wives lead husbands home to their cages. Bartenders sweep up the sawdust and a few drunken clowns. A tired voice invites you to a side show. And you keep walking. And then a voice calls your name. Hey, Danny! Wait a minute, Danny! Danny! And it's the voice of Maxie Stern, manager of the most colossal, most stupendous, most nothing movie crib on Broadway. Danny, come quick, huh? Real quick. Hi, Max. Hi, Danny. Come quick, please, huh? Well, what's the matter? Somebody doesn't like the picture? Well, it's a mess. He's sitting in the loge and he won't go home, and the picture is long since over. Maybe he's waiting for the prices to change. I don't think so, Danny. No? No, I think the gentleman who was occupying my loge is dead. Come quick, huh, Max? Yeah. The way we discovered him, Danny, is one of my charwomen who sweeps out the dump. A theater. Who is creeping out the loges with this gentleman she can't politely bite, but she calls a private. Huh? A nasher who's at the bottom of the rung of success. The private calls a corporal. The corporal calls a oh, nut. Finally gets the head usher and he calls me. And I verify their opinion that the low city is dead. But this I have to have official, so I called you. Where is he? Up these Persian carpeted stairs, Danny. Thirty dollars a square yard. Wait, Danny. Danny, I'm out of breath. Where is he? In here. Through this Renaissance door that opens out onto a luxurious loge. Hi, Danny. I'm glad Maxie found you. Danny, I took the liberty of first calling our house doctor, Dr. Jeffrey Connor. The house doctor. That's all right, Maxie. Why are you glad Maxie found me, Doc? Because this man's been poisoned. Oh? Dilated pupils, tinge of blue on his lips, all the usual symptoms. Suicide, maybe? Maybe, but I hardly think so. People don't take poison and go to a movie. Not this poison. The pain is excruciating. How long has he been dead? I'd say an hour, maybe two. Oh, he must have cried out. He must have the made... The picture's fun. hilarious. We're picking it. It's a comedy, Danny. Maybe the other schmoes in the low thought he was laughing. Some people laugh in such a way, you know. Yeah. Let's see who he is. Wallace, main stamp in gold. Sherman Gates. Cigarettes. Hotel key. Carnegie Hotel. And his umbrella, Danny. 
lying wet on the carpet. A man commits suicide in a lose, Danny? Suicide or murder, I had to know which. So I had a call to make. The Carnegie Hotel on 2nd Avenue was an institution that had never received an endowment, but its educational possibilities were infinite. The signs walking up the steps from the street made you know that. You could hold a seance with Madame Stark, Seventh Daughter of the Moon. You could buy magic tricks from Professor Novotny. When that was over, you could buy a Swedish massage from a brother and sister team. At the top of the steps was a man seated behind a cage. He was looking down at a glossy magazine. I looked down at him. He kept looking, and I kept looking. I got tired first, so I rang the bell on his desk. I heard you when you hit the third step coming upstairs. That's a loose one. Then why don't you pay attention to me? Paying attention to something else right now, Mac. You want to see? See what? This magazine. Get it every month. Here, look. Hmm? Picture of Phyllis in again this month, wearing a hat. First time I ever saw her wearing a hat. Last month it was stocking. Cute, huh? All I want is some information. About Phyllis? No. Uh, no, I can't do that. I wish you could. But we can both dream, can't we? Information about a guest. Sherman Gates. You got the information. He was a guest. He's dead. People die. Hey, who are you that wants to know what you want to know? I'm Danny Clover, police. Oh, so I'm Lee Crandall, clerk. So? But what about Sherman Gates? He was a guest who guested at room 12 down the hall. He made a couple phone calls early in the day through my switchboard. Went out, didn't come back. Mm -hmm. Putting two and two together, I'd say the latter was because he's dead. Am I helping? What about the two phone calls? I'm being a citizen like all get out. I I got them right here. Right here someplace. Yeah, yeah, here they are. Thanks. Don't mind if I use your phone, citizen. I know you don't. Not for a dime, I don't. Hey, Clover, I want you to check two phone numbers for me, Mr. Tiger. Here are the numbers. Give me the names and addresses to go with them. Yes, Plaza 79970. And Regent, Regent 41098. You got that? Yeah, I got it. Good, I'll call you back. Here's your dime. Thanks. Now I guess you want to look at Mr. Gates' room, huh? Yeah, I want to do that. When you're finished, I've got something to show you. Or art studies, the fillers? Uh-uh. Broken down dentist once left a stack of National Geographic here. Maybe a guy like you gets his kicks from stuff like that. It made him happy to say that. He was being a good citizen, so I let him be happy. The room of Sherman Gates, guest, the feast. Revealed a bed and table, feet up, broken down. Not much else. Mr. Gates saw his suit and a change of underwear. I leafed through the National Geographic to give Cotaglia time to check on the phone numbers. I learned little-known facts about the Pygmy people of Mozambique, then called headquarters. Two phone numbers. One listed to Irene Vincent in the East 60s. The other, a photographer's shop on 10th Avenue. It was midnight, and neither place answered to my call, so I waited till the next morning. Called in person. Something I can do for you? Yeah, there is. I want to ask you a few questions. Oh, good. About a camera? This one takes wonderful pictures of the whole family. I don't have a family. Questions about a photographer. Oh. Well, we've got some wonderful brochures here. The tricks of all great photographers. Ouija, Luke Jacobs, Jr., Stike. Not about them. About Sherman Gates. 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 Uh, don't know him. If he were a photographer of note, I'm sure I'd know him. This photographer was also a customer. Try that. Gates, huh? Gates. Sherman Gates. Sherman Gates. I'll give you a big fat clue. He called you yesterday. Gates. Maybe I'll have to rack your brain for you. Gates, of course. He called me yesterday. Maybe you'll have a better memory if I tell you I'm from the police, Mr. Uh, Quimby. Junius Quimby. There's nothing wrong with my memory. I just told you, Mr. Gates called me yesterday afternoon. What did he call about? About the usual thing, like, were his pictures ready? And were they? Uh, no. What did you tell him? I told him no. I mean, when did you say his pictures would be ready? Today, this morning. Now? Now. Get them. I'm calling for them. It's irregular, you know. I know. Get them. Why does Mr. Gates call for them himself? He's dead. Now, get them. Of course, they're right here. In, uh, in this drawer. Here they are, in this envelope. Yeah, thanks. Hmm. What do you know? Cats. Pictures. 
pictures of cats. Aren't they lifelike? For real. Here, pussy, pussy, pussy. I'd never heard a man say that to a picture of a cat before, so I tiptoed out, pointed myself to East 60th Street, and took off. Irene Vincent's apartment house was fashionable. It had a fashionable doorman accoutred in dawn pink, standing under a fashionable moss green canopy. And his fashionable eyes were the color of dead fish as he took my name, my occupation, my sex. Took him over to a lavender phone, spoke him in a shocked voice, arranged me in an elevator, pushed a button, and washed his hands with me on the damp floor. I lit a cigarette and saw Irene Vincent waiting for me in the doorway. She didn't leave much breath for smoking. Come in, Danny Clover. Yeah, thanks. He is frightful, isn't he? Who? The doorman. I hate snobs, don't you, Danny? Yes, you say so. You hate snobs? And why are you calling on me? man named Sherman Gates. You know him? If you say so. He called you yesterday from the Carnegie Hotel. So he did. He died last night in a movie. So he did. I read it in the paper. They say it might be suicide. What do you say, Miss Simpson? Oh, I don't think so. Sherman wouldn't commit suicide, not that way. Tell me about Sherman, Miss Simpson. Oh, Sherman was 100% Danny. All boy, all star. High school track, new club cheerleader, a devil with a girl. I was in love with Sherman once. Hundred percent. When was that? Too long ago. When I was a little girl in Iowa. When little girls fell in love with little boys like Sherman. And he called you yesterday? Why? He wanted a date. The flame was flickering, he said. That's the way Sherman talked. You gave him a date? Of course. It flatters the girl Danny when an old love comes out of Iowa and asks for a date. Where'd you go? What did you do? In detail. Mm Mm-hmm. In detail, we went to Gino's, had a few drinks, left Gino's, had an argument. Oh, that should interest you, Danny. It does. Well, it was about a cat. A cat rubbed itself against the leg of Sherman's tuxedo, and Sherman kicked the cat in the face. So we argued. And? So I took a cab home, threw my umbrella in the tub to dry off, took my clothes off, got into... Oh, Irene, the drinks are ready. Haven't you finished with the police, my dear? Oh, I think so, Joseph. Danny, this is my fiancé, Joseph Dorcas. Danny Clover. How do you do? Uh, Mr. Dorcas, I'm uh, dropping, Mr. Clover. Uh, you'll want to know if I knew of Irene's going out to Sherman Gate. No, I hadn't thought of it, but it'll do. I knew about it, Mr. Clover. Irene has full personal freedom until we're married. Uh, you've read of our marriage? Uh, I'm afraid not. It's been in all the columns. A bit of romance, they call it. That is, uh, my part of it. <laughs> nice phrase, isn't it? I, I told you, Joseph, they're only little dogs barking. You mustn't let them hurt you. You see why I love her, Mr. Clover. And in two weeks, she'll be mine. And then, Irene, no more jaunts to Iowa to see your mother. No more evenings with callow youths like this gay fellow. No more. Darling, you're embarrassing Danny Clover. They clinched. And I got out of there. I checked in at the headquarters, grabbed a cup of coffee, and then went back to a man named Quimby, who had pictures of cats for a dead man who hated cats. Oh, I see you back. You remember me, huh? Of course. You said you were a policeman. You told me that this morning. Right. I'm a policeman. I'm still working. I got some new questions to ask you, Mr. Quimby. Please ask me in a hurry. I got some pictures in the tank. This won't take long. Those pictures you gave me this morning. Mr. Gates' pictures? Those. Are you sure they were the pictures he left to be developed? Am I sure? What do you mean, am I sure? I mean, are you sure? Of course I am. Now, if you'll pardon now, me. one more thing. Please, those pictures in the tank, they'll spoil. All right, but hurry up back. I'll only be a minute. Just look around. Cloud. Quimby, what happened? Try to tell me what happened, but he couldn't. He'd never be able to. I hurried over to the open door, which led to the alley. Empty. The sound of a car starting off, a car driven by a killer, suddenly made the whole place empty. Empty except for one thing. One single and shining fact. The dead man in the loads wasn't a suicide. He'd been murdered. Now he had company. <laughs> You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. 
a whale of a Christmas present for a few moments brain scratching. Could be there's $54,000 in the Sing It Again jackpot now. 25000 of it in cold hard cash and the rest in wonderful prizes. Sing It Again is heard for a full hour every Saturday night on most of the same CBS stations. <laughs> for homework and headquarters is where I studied. There's a sergeant there who helped me. His name is Tartaglia, and he tries real hard. Or, as he puts it, I try real hard, Danny. Oh, I know you do, Tartaglia. So tell me what you found on Junius Quimby. Oh, that little photographer was a naughty boy, Danny, with a record. Not a long one, but naughty. Pictures, huh? Photographs. Pictures, Danny. Photographs. That all? Yeah. Oh, oh wait a minute. I almost forgot, Danny. There's a guy outside to see you. Uh, Joseph Dawker says he's the fiancé of one Miss Irene Vincent. Oh, show him in, Uh, yeah. Go right in, Mr. Dawker. Thank you, thank you. Hello, Mr. Clover. I hope you're not too busy to see me. Oh, not at all. Sit down, Mr. Dawker. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Clover, I'll, I'll come right to the point. I'm a very rich man. I'm happy for you, Mr. Dawker. If the factor doesn't need a comment, Mr. Clover, I only tell you that because, well, you should know it. I'm in a position to buy off any trouble that Irene may be in. Your fiancé is in trouble? Yes. She just came back from a vacation with her mother in Ireland. And since she's back, she's being blackmailed. Uh-huh. That would fit. I don't know how exactly, but it would fit. I, I can't guess what you have in mind, but I think I can help you. Well, frankly, Mr. Dorgers, I could use a little help. What have you got to offer? Some pertinent facts. Good. What are they? Well, the day before yesterday, a man called her. Said he had some information that he was going to take to me. Mm -hmm. He was going to take it to me unless Irene paid him $20,000. What kind of information? Mr. Clover, Irene swears to me she doesn't know. She got a phone call from a man. The man set up a meeting place, but the man never showed up. Go on. Yesterday, the same thing. Another phone call. Another man. And this man didn't show up either. What else? About an hour ago, one more phone call. Still another voice. This time, the man told Irene to meet him at 1 o'clock tomorrow morning at the 23rd Street Dock, Hudson River. Was that all he said? No, no. He mentioned the names of Junius Quimby and Sherman Gates. Oh? He told Irene that what happened to them would happen to her if she didn't appear with the money. Does that suggest anything to you, Mr. Clover? Yeah, it does. It suggests this third caller is our killer. He's got some piece of information to blackmail your fiancé. Some piece of information that belonged to three men. Mm. Now it belongs to only one, the killer. Well, what shall we do, Mr. Clover? We'll do this. Tell Irene to get the money and meet the man. Yes, Don't worry, I'll be there. Tell her I'll be in the doorway at the port agent's shack. Tell her to walk past me so I'll know she's there. But above all, tell her not to talk to me. Got that? Of course, Mr. Clover. I have it exactly. <laughs> Midnight, the 23rd Street dock is an island torn out of limbo. The mist, the vapors rising out of the dark river, the sharp of distant turbines, the almost silent hiss of the sea. It's all there. And you stand in dark space at the edge of a universe. Wait. And hope you're doing the right thing. Across oil black water, you watch an electric sign in New Jersey arrange itself the numerals of time. And then a sound brings you back. It's a simple sound. The sound of a woman's feel on wood. And all your back, and you remember why you're there. Danny. Danny Clover, are you there? I told you, don't talk to me. Keep walking. But I'm frightened, Danny Clover. 100% frightened. If you're talking to anyone, I might kill you. I could kill the others. Yes, Danny. And remember, talk to them as if you were alone. No outcry, no hysterics, nothing. Understand? Now, keep walking. Yes, Danny Clover. Here goes the pretty girl. Yell. Is that 
Why don't you leave Annie? Yeah, why did you cry out? Why? Because I'm a girl, and girls are unsafe. Yeah. Are you hurt, Danny? Did he shoot you? No. But there's blood on the ground. See Danny Clover? Danny Clover saw the blood on the ground. Danny Clover put an idiot named Irene in a cab. Danny Clover went back to headquarters. By two o'clock, the orders were out for every drugstore, every hospital, every doctor to be on the lookout for a wounded man. Then Danny Clover curled up in his swivel chair and fell asleep. Are you decent, man? Uh, oh, of course I'm decent. What are you talking about? Well, there's a lady out here to see you, Danny, from the Salvation Army, with a drum and a cymbal and a tambourine. What? Yeah, she says she knows you. Has something important to tell you. Oh, sure in, Sergeant. Sergeant, sure in. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Go right in, Miss. Uh, this, uh, man. Good morning, Danny. Oh, it's a glorious, glorious morning, isn't it? <laughs> glorious, Opal. How are you? Glorious. Why don't you put the drum down? I'll take me a help, Opal. Oh, sure, sure. Allow me, Miss Opal. Thank you. The Tiger said you had something important to tell me. Well, it may be. I don't know. It just may be important, and then again, it may not. Strange the way things are one way or another, isn't it, Danny? <laughs> Tell me anyway, Alton. Well, last night at the mission, it was my tour of duty. You know, helping the poor wandering souls. What happened at the mission, Opal? Well, about three o'clock in the morning, this man came in with a terrible wound in his shoulder. Oh, a terrible wound. I dressed... Where is he now? Well, back at his hotel, I suppose. The Carnegie Hotel. You see, Mr. Crandall's one of our steadies. Oh, but, Danny, where are you going? I... <laughs> How are you? Yeah, citizen. It's me. Come to tell me I'm not much of a citizen no more, huh? A real bad one. A wounded one, too. Your shoulder hurts? Some. If I make an effort, it'll still operate. Don't try. I'm booking you. We'll take fine care of your shoulder. I missed everything, didn't I? I missed it all up. Amateurs ought to play that game and make them gun happy. Uh-huh. Yeah. I turned all of Phyllis's pictures to the wall. She isn't proud of me. She looks sad. Even the one in stocking. Tough. You ready? Sure. Get a figure on how long the rap is? Figure on all the time there is left in the world. You won't be disappointed. After all, you killed two men. Killed two men? What are you talking about? German Gates, one man. Junius Quimby, one man. Wait a minute. Two men. Wait a minute. You're talking too fast. Words are going by me. I think I hear, but I don't know what they mean. Let's go, Liz. I'm telling you, all I did was try a blackmail stunt. I lost it, that's all. You're talking for the record now, Liz. Sure I am, and this is the record. A letter comes for guest Sherman Gates after he's deceased. I open it. Pictures in it. Blackmail pictures to a guy with brains. More brains than me. So you called Irene Vincent. Sure, her picture's been all over the paper on account of her marrying that millionaire. Sure, I called her. Where are the pictures? Right in my back pocket. They never left there. I'll take them. Well, there. Thanks. You can't book me for murder. You can't. Here's a dime, citizen. I gotta call headquarters. We're going for a ride. You, me, and the pictures. <laughs> I was just on my way to home. I phoned Mrs. Sartaglia. That's a little early, isn't it, Sergeant? Well, oh, like with the rain and all, by the time I get through the traffic... Well, take off that flicker and stick around a while. I want you to look at a picture. Okay, Danny. Well, there's the picture, huh, Danny? Here. What do you see, Sartaglia? Oh, I see a gorgeous dame in a swimming suit by the name Irene Vincent. I see a guy also in a swimming suit by the name Sherman Gates, deceased. And they're leaning up against the new Nash. Uh, looks like the 1950 model. Did I see everything, Danny? Where are they? It to me looks like Miami. I've never been to Miami, but to me it looks like Miami. Palm trees, ocean, swimming suits. Yeah. Neat piece of blackmail. Is this the blackmail to be in Miami in the winter? You can go home now, the Tiger. Oh, thanks, Danny. Thanks. It's because of the rain I'm leaving now. What do you got there? The umbrella. Umbrella? Yeah, sure. An umbrella, Danny. It's raining outside. Captain Dog. Umbrella. Go home, Sartaglia, and tell Mrs. Sartaglia today you did real good. I want to 
want to apologize for Irene's not being here, Mr. Clover. Oh, that's okay. You're here. After all, Irene and I are engaged. And the fact that you found me in her apartment shouldn't cause you to lift an eyebrow. Mm, not the merest wisp of an eyebrow. Maybe you'll react, Mr. Dorcas. I know why Irene was being blackmailed. Good for you. So you found the blackmailer. Uh, you understand, whatever Irene did before we're married doesn't concern me. Oh? Uh, that was a part of her life that I didn't belong in. It was hers under whatever circumstance she wanted. What if it happened three weeks ago? Oh, impossible. Look at this picture, Mr. Dorcas. Is it tweak you? I... Irene! Irene, come in here! Well, you mean you've been out clavering me. Irene's been listening all the time. I my. I don't have to suggest my fiancé to the police. Now, uh, well, uh, come here, Irene. Yes, what is it? A picture. I want you to look at it. Were you in Iowa three weeks ago, Irene? I told you I was, dear. That means I was. Irene, you're not looking at the picture. I'm looking. It was taken three years ago in Miami before I met Mr. Dorcas. You're lying, dear. You're doing just that, Irene. They didn't have 1950 cars three years ago. They had them just about three weeks ago. Irene. So I went to Miami. So what? So what if I did? Irene, tell us. Tell us what happened the night Sherman Gates died. I've already done that, 100%. The part after you left him. Do it again. All right, I will. I came home in a cab, undressed, went to bed. Happy? The part about the umbrella. What did you do with it? Throw it in the bathtub. Happy? Yeah, but you're not. A guy comes to call for you to take out for an evening. He brings an umbrella, like a 100% gentleman. I know, because it was found with his dead body. Poor him. So? So you carried an umbrella, too. When a gentleman carries an umbrella on a date, a girl never does. But you did. You know why, too. So I'm out of here, dear. No, no, I don't want to do that. Because you knew you were coming home alone, Irene. So you poisoned his drink and left him. That took care of blackmailer number one. You mean Irene killed someone else? Did you, Irene? You're both crazy. Ah, you killed Quimby, too. The nasty little photographer who developed a few extra blackmail pictures for himself and wanted in on the blackmail. Poor right. Irene. You're crazy. But still another man got in on the blackmail. A hotel clerk who opened Sherman Gates' mail and figured you'd been cheating almost up to the altar. Don't listen to him. Don't listen so to him. So you dreamed up a story, Irene, and told it to Mr. Dorcas here. A story that made the hotel clerk look like he murdered the other two. He didn't. You did. Irene. Irene, put down that gun. Get out of the way. I'll kill him. Irene, don't. Irene. You fool, you stupid little fool. I'll take that gun. I'll kill I'll take, you. Give me that gun. Irene, I... She looked at him, then fell suddenly to the floor, took Dawkins' head in her arms and swayed back and forth. Back and forth. Her eyes filled with the terrible fright you sometimes see in a child. And it was hard to believe she was a murderer. But you knew better, so you called headquarters. And they sent an ambulance and a couple of burly cops. She was 100% of them, so they gave her the best seat in the paddy wagon. <laughs> Deeper and deeper and deeper. And finally, there's no pain. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover and is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The musical score was composed by Alexander Courage and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. And the program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The cast tonight included Charles Calvert, Joe Forte, Paul Dubois, Junius Matthews, Mary Jane Croft, Herbert Rawlinson, and Joyce McCluskey. <laughs> One step to curing a disease is recognizing it and treating it. Hate is a disease. It's recognized as such by patriotic citizens who refuse to spread the doctrine of hate by speaking against a fellow American because of his race, color, or religious creed. 
The treatment to cure the disease of hate is to accept or reject people on their individual worth and to speak up wherever you are against prejudice and for understanding. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where you find Broadway is my beat every Saturday night. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Thank you.